section eighteen of jean christophe in paris this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org jean christophe in paris by romain roland translated by gilbert cannon antoinette chapter one part one the jeunes were one of those old french families who have remained stationary for centuries in the same little corner of a province and have kept themselves pure from any infusion of foreign blood there are more of them than one would think in france in spite of all the changes and the social order it would need a great upheaval to uproot them from the soil to which they are held by so many ties the profound nature of which is unknown to them reason counts for nothing in their devotion to the soil and interest for very little and as for sentimental historic memories they only hold good for a few literary men what does bind them irresistibly is the obscure though very strong feeling common to the dull and the intelligent alike of having been for centuries past a parcel of the land of living in its life breathing the same air hearing the heart of it beating against their own like the heart of the beloved feeling its slightest tremor the changing hours and seasons and days bright or dull and hearing the voices and the silence of all things in nature it is not always the most beautiful country nor that which has the greatest charm of life that most strongly grips the affections but rather it is the region where the earth seems simplest and most humble nearest man speaking to him in a familiar friendly tongue such was the country in the centre of france where the jeunes lived a flat damp country an old sleepy little town wearily gazing at its reflection in the dull waters of a still canal round about it were monotonous fields ploughed fields meadows little rivers woods and again monotonous fields no scenery no monuments no memories nothing attractive it is all dull and oppressive in its drowsy torpor is a hidden force the soul tasting it for the first time suffers and revolts against it but those who have lived with it for generations cannot break free it eats into their very bones and the stillness of it the harmonious dullness the monotony have a charm for them and a sweet savour which they cannot analyse which they malign love and can never forget the jeunes had always lived there the family could be traced back to the sixteenth century living in the town or its neighbourhood for of course they had a great uncle who had devoted his life to drawing up the genealogical tree of their obscure line of humble industrious people peasants farmers artisans then clerks country notaries working in the sub-prefecture of the district where augustus jeanon the father of the present head of the house had successfully established himself as a banker he was a clever man with a peasant's cunning and obstinacy but honest as men go not over scrupulous a great worker and a good liver he had made himself respected and feared everywhere by his genial malice his bluntness of speech and his wealth short thick set vigorous with little sharp eyes set in a big red face pitted with smallpox he had been known as a petticoat hunter and he had not altogether lost his days for it he loved a spicy yarn and good eating it was a sight to see to him at meals with his son antoine sitting opposite him with a few old friends of their kidney the district judge the notary archdeacon of the cathedral old jonin loved stuffing the priest but also he could stuff with the priests if the priests were good at it hardy old fellows built on the same rabelaisian lines there was a running fire of terrific stories to the accompaniment of thumps on the table and roars of laughter and the row they made could be heard by the servants in the kitchen and the neighbours in the street then old augustus caught a chill which turned to pneumonia through going down into his cellars one hot summer's day in his shirt sleeves to bottle his wine in less than twenty-four hours he had departed this life for the next world in which he hardly believed properly equipped with all the sacraments of the church 
having like a good voltairean provincial submitted to it at the last moment in order to pacify his women and also because it did not matter one way or the other and then one never knows his son antoine succeeded him in business he was a fat little man rubicund and expansive clean-shaven except for his mutton-chop whiskers and he spoke quickly and with a slight stutter in a loud voice accompanying his remarks with little quick curt gestures he had not his father's grasp of finance but he was quite a good manager he had only to look after the established undertakings which went on developing day by day by the mere fact of their existence he had the advantage of a business reputation in the district although he had very little to do with the success of the firm's ventures he only contributed method and industry for the rest he was absolutely honourable and was everywhere deservedly esteemed his pleasant unctuous manners though perhaps a little too familiar for some people a little too expansive and just a little common had won him a very genuine popularity in the little town and the surrounding country he was more lavish with his sympathy but then with his money tears came readily to his eyes and the sight of poverty so sincerely moved him that the victim of it could not fail to be touched by it like most men living in small towns his thoughts were much occupied with politics he was an ardent moderate republican and intolerant liberal a patriot and like his father extremely anti-clerical he was a member of the municipal council and like the rest of his colleagues he delighted in playing tricks on the cure of the parish or on the lent preacher who roused so much enthusiasm in the ladies of the town it must not be forgotten that the anti-clericalism of the little towns in france is always more or less an episode in domestic warfare and is a subtle form of that silent bitter struggle between husbands and wives which goes on in almost every house antoine Jonin had also some literary pretensions like all provincials of his generation he had been brought up on the latin classics many pages of which he knew by heart and also massed of proverbs and on la fontaine and boileau the boileau of la poétique and above all of lutrin on the author of la pucelle and the poétie minoris of the eighteenth century in whose manner he squeezed out a certain number of poems he was not the only man of his acquaintance possessed by that particular mania and his reputation gained by it his rhyming jests his quatrains couplets acrostics epigrams and songs which were sometimes rather risky though they had a certain coarsely witty quality were often quoted he was wont to sing the mysteries of digestion the muse of the loire districts as fain to blow her trumpet like the famous devil of dante ed egli avia del col fato trombetta this sturdy jovial active little man had taken to wife a woman of a very different character the daughter of a country magistrate lucie de villiers the de villiers or rather devil leers for their name had slid in its passage through time like a stone which cracks into as it goes hurtling down a hillside where magistrates from father to son they were of that old parliamentary race of frenchmen who had a lofty idea of the law and duty the social conventions their personal and especially their professional dignity which was fortified by perfect honesty tempered with a certain conscious uprightness during the preceding century they had been infected by nonconformist jansenism which had given them a grumbling pessimistic quality as well as a contempt for the jesuit attitude of mind they did not see life as beautiful and rather than smooth away life's difficulties they preferred to exaggerate them so as to have good reason to complain lucie de villiers had certain of these characteristics which were so directly opposed to the not very refined optimism of her husband she was tall taller than he by a head slender well made she dressed well and elegantly though in a rather sober fashion which made her seem perhaps designedly older than she was she was of a high moral quality but she was hard on other people she would countenance no fault and hardly even a caprice she was thought cold and disdainful she was very pious and that gave rise to perpetual disputes with her husband for the rest they were very fond of each other and in spite of their frequent disagreements they could not have lived without each other they were both rather unpractical he from want of perception he was always in danger of being taken in by good looks and fine words she from her absolute inexperience of business she knew nothing about it and having always been kept outside it she took no interest in it they had two children a girl antoinette the older by five years and a boy olivier 
antoinette was a pretty dark-haired child with a charming honest face of the french type round with sharp eyes a round forehead a fine chin a little straight nose one of those very pretty fine noble noses as an old french portrait painter says so charmingly in which there was a certain imperceptible play of expression which animated the face and revealed the subtlety of the workings of her mind as she talked or listened she had her father's gaiety and carelessness olivier was a delicate fair boy short like his father but very different in character his health had been undermined by one illness after another when he was a child and although as a result he was petted by his family his physical weakness had made him a melancholy dreamy little boy who was afraid of death and very poorly equipped for life he was shy and preferred to be alone he avoided the society of other children he was ill at ease with them he hated their games and quarrels their brutality filled him with horror he let them strike him not from want of courage but from timidity because he was afraid to defend himself afraid of hurting them they would have bullied the life out of him but for the safeguard of his father's position he was tender-hearted and morbidly sensitive a word a sign of sympathy or reproach were enough to make him burst into tears his sister was much sturdier and laughed at him and called him a little fountain the two children were devoted to each other but they were too different to live together they went their own ways and lived in their own dreams as antoinette grew up she became prettier people told her so and she was well aware of it it made her happy and she wove romances about the future olivier in his sickly melancholy was always rubbed up the wrong way by contact with the outer world and he withdrew into the circle of his own absurd little brain and he told himself stories yet a burning almost feminine longing to love and be loved and living alone away from boys of his own age he had invented two or three imaginary friends one was called jean another etienne another francois he was always with them he never slept well and he was always dreaming in the morning when he was lifted out of bed he would forget himself and sit with his bare legs dangling down or sometimes with two stockings on one leg he would go off into a dream with his hands in the basin he would forget himself at his desk in the middle of writing or learning a lesson he would dream for hours on end and then he would suddenly wake up horrified to find that he had learned nothing at dinner he was abashed if any one spoke to him he would reply two minutes after he had been spoken to he would forget what he was going to say in the middle of a sentence he would doze off to the murmuring of his thoughts and the familiar sensations of the monotonous provincial days that marched so slowly by the great half-empty house only part of which they occupied the vast and dreadful barns and cellars the mysterious closed rooms the fastened shutters the covered furniture veiled mirrors and the chandeliers wrapped up the old family portraits with their haunting smiles the empire engravings with their virtuous suave heroism alcibiades and socrates on the house of the courtesan antiochus and stratonice the story of epimonides belisarius begging outside the sound of the smith's shoeing horses in the smithy opposite the uneven clicking of the hammers on the anvil the snorting of the broken winded horses the smell of the scorched hoofs the slapping of the pats of the washerwomen kneeling by the water the heavy thuds of the butcher's chopper next door the clatter of a horse's hoofs on the stones of the street the creaking of a pump or the drawbridge over the canal the heavy barges laden with blocks of wood slowly passing at the end of the garden drawn along by a rope the little tiled courtyard with a square patch of earth in which two lilac trees grew in the middle of a clump of geraniums and petunias the tubs of laurel and flowering pomegranate on the terrace above the canal sometimes the noise of a fair in the square hard by with peasants in bright blue smocks and grunting pigs and on sunday at church the precentor who sang out of tune and the old priest who went to sleep as he was saying mass the family walk along the station road where all the time he had to take off his hat politely to other wretched beings who were under the same impression of the necessity of going for a walk altogether until at last they reached the sunny fields above which larks soared invisible or long by the still mirror of the canal on both sides of which were poplars rustling in line and then there was the great provincial sunday dinner with they went on and on eating and talking about food learnedly and with gusto for everybody was a connoisseur and in the provinces eating is the chief occupation the first of all the arts and they would talk business and tell spicy yarns and every now and then discuss their neighbours illnesses going into endless detail and the little boy sitting in his corner would make no more noise than a little mouse pick at his food eat hardly anything and listen with all his ears nothing escaped him and when he did not understand his imagination supplied the deficiency 
he had that singular gift which is often to be remarked in the children of old families and an old stock on which the imprint of the ages is too strongly marked of divining thoughts which have never passed through their minds before and are hardly comprehensible to them then there was the kitchen where bloody and succulent mysteries were concocted and the old servant who used to tell him frightful and droll stories at last came evening the silent flitting of the bats the terror of the monstrous creatures that were known to swarm in the dark depths of the old house huge rats enormous hairy spiders and he would say his prayers kneeling at the foot of his bed and hardly know what he was saying the little cracked bell of the convent hard by would sound the bedtime of the nuns and so to bed at the island of dreams the best times of the year were those that they spent in spring and autumn at their country house some miles away from the town there he could dream at his ease he saw nobody like most of the children of their class the little jeanin were kept apart from the common children the children of servants and farmers who inspired them with fear and disgust they inherited from their mother an aristocratic or rather essentially middle-class disdain for all who worked with their hands olivier would spend the day perched up in the branches of an ash reading marvellous stories delightful folklore the tales of messias or madame d'aulnoy or the arabian nights or stories of travel for he had that strange longing for distant lands those oceanic dreams which sometimes possesses the minds of boys and the little provincial towns of france a thicket lay between the house and himself and he could fancy himself very far away but he knew that he was really near home and was quite happy for he did not like straying too far alone he felt lost with nature round him the wind whispered through the trees through the leaves that hid his nest he could see the yellowing vines in the distance and the meadows where the straked cows were at pasture filling the silence of the sleeping countryside with their plaintive long-drawn lowing the strident cocks crowed to each other from farm to farm there came up the irregular beat of the flails in the barns the fevered life of myriads of creatures swelled and flowed through the peace of inanimate nature uneasily olivier would watch the ever hurrying columns of the ants and the bees big with their booty buzzing like organ pipes and the superb and stupid wasps who know not what they want the whole world of busy little creatures all seemingly devoured by the desire to reach their destination where is it they do not know no matter where somewhere olivier was fearful amid that blind and hostile world he would start like a young hare at the sound of a pine cone falling or the breaking of a rotten branch he would find his courage again when he heard the rattling of the chains of the swing at the other end of the garden where antoinette would be madly swinging to and fro she too would dream but in her own fashion she would spend the day prowling round the garden eating watching laughing picking at the grapes on the vines like a thrush secretly plucking a peach from the trellis climbing a plum tree or giving it a little surreptitious shake as she passed to bring down a rain of the golden mirabelles which melt in the mouth like scented honey or she would pick the flowers although that was forbidden quickly she would pluck a rose that she had been coveting all day and run away with it to the arbour at the end of the garden then she would bury her little nose in the delicious scented flower and kiss it and bite it and suck it and then she would conceal her booty and hide it in her bosom between her little breasts at the wonder of whose coming she would gaze in eager fondness and there was an exquisite forbidden joy in taking off her shoes and stockings and walking barefoot on the cool sand of the paths and on the dewy turf and on the stones cold and the shadow burning in the sun and in the little stream ran along the outskirts of the wood and kissing with her feet and legs and knees water earth and light lying in the shadow of the pine she would hold her hands up to the sun and watch the light play through them and she would press her lips upon the soft satin skin of her pretty rounded arms she would make herself crowns and necklets and gowns of ivy leaves and oak leaves and she would deck them with the blue thistles and barberry and little pine branches with their green fruit and then she looked like a little savage princess and she would dance for her own delight round and round the fountain and with arms outstretched she would turn and turn until her head whirled and she would slip down on the lawn and bury her face in the grass and shout with laughter for minutes on end unable to stop herself without knowing why so the days slipped by for the two children with the inhale of each other though neither ever gave a thought to the other except when it would suddenly occur to antoinette to play a prank on her brother and throw a handful of pine needles in his face or shake the tree in which he was sitting threatening to make him fall or frighten him by swinging suddenly out upon him and yelling oh oh sometimes she would be seized by a desire to tease him 
she would make him come down from his tree by pretending that her mother was calling him then when he had climbed down she would take his place and refuse to budge then olivier would whine and threaten to tell but there was no danger of antoinette staying in the tree for long she could not keep still for two minutes when she had done with taunting olivier from the top of his tree when she had thoroughly infuriated him and brought him almost to tears then she would slip down fling her arms round him shake him and laugh and call him a little muff and roll him on the ground and rub his face with handfuls of grass he would try to struggle but he was not strong enough then he would lie still flat on his back like a cockchafer with his thin arms bent to the ground by antoinette's strong little hands and he would look piteous and resigned antoinette could not resist that she would look at her vanquished prisoner and burst out laughing and kiss him suddenly and let him go now without the parting attention of a little gag of fresh grass in his mouth and that he detested most of all because it made him sick and he would spit and wipe his mouth and storm at her while she ran away as hard as she could peeling with laughter she was always laughing even when she was asleep she laughed olivier lying awake in the next room would suddenly start up in the middle of the stories he was telling himself at the sound of the wild laughter and the muttered words which she would speak in the silence of the night outside the trees would creak with the wind and owl would hoot in the distant villages and the farms in the heart of the woods dogs would bark in the dim phosphorescence of the night olivier would see the dark heavy branches of the pines moving like ghosts outside his window and antoinette's laughter would comfort him End of section eighteen section nineteen of jean christophe in paris this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org jean christophe in paris by romain roland translated by gilbert cannon antoinette chapter one part two the two children were very religious especially olivier their father used to scandalize them with his anticlerical professions of faith but he did not interfere with them and at heart like so many men of his class who are unbelievers he was not sorry that his family should believe for him for it is always good to have allies in the opposing camp and one is never sure which way fortune will turn he was a deist and he reserved the right to summon a priest when the time came as his father had done even if it did no good it could do no harm one insures against fire even if one has no reason to believe that the house will be burned down olivier was morbidly inclined towards mysticism there were times when he doubted whether he existed he was credulous and soft-hearted and needed a prop he took a sorrowful delight in confession in the comfort of confiding in the invisible friend whose arms are always open to you to whom you can tell everything who understands and forgives everything he tasted the sweetness of the waters of humility and love from which the soul issues pure cleansed and comforted it was so natural to him to believe that he could not understand how any one could doubt he thought people did so from wickedness and that god would punish them he used to pray secretly that his father might find grace and he was delighted when one day as they went into a little country church he saw his father mechanically make the sign of the cross the stories of the gospel were mixed up in his mind with the marvellous tales of rubezal and gracieux and Persinet and the caliph harun al rashid when he was a little boy he no more doubted the truth of the one than the other and just as he was not sure that he did not know shakabak of the cleft lips and the loquacious barber and the little hunchback of kaskar just as when he was out walking he used to look about for the black woodpecker which bears in its beak the magic root of the treasure seeker so canaan and the promised land became in his childish imagination certain regions in burgundy or Berichon a round hill in the country with a little tree like a shabby old feather at the summit seemed to him to be like the mountain where abraham had built his pyre 
a large dead bush by the edge of a field was the burning bush which the ages had put out even when he was older and his critical faculty had been awakened he loved to feed on the popular legends which enshrined his faith and they gave him so much pleasure though he no longer accepted them implicitly that he would amuse himself by pretending to do so so for a long time on easter saturday he would look out for the return of the easter bells which went away to rome on the thursday before and would come floating through the air with little streamers he did finally admit that it was not true but he did not give up looking skywards when he heard them ringing and once though he knew perfectly well that it could not be he fancied he saw one of them disappearing over the house with blue ribbons it was vitally necessary for him to steep himself in the world of legend and faith he avoided life he avoided himself thin pale puny he suffered from being so and could not bear its being talked about he was naturally pessimistic no doubt inheriting it from his mother and his pessimism was fed by his morbidity he did not know it thought everybody must be like himself and the queer little boy of ten instead of romping in the gardens during his playtime used to shut himself up in his room and carefully picking his words wrote his will he used to write a great deal every evening he used laboriously and secretly to write his diary he did not know why for he had nothing to say and he said nothing worth saying writing was an inherited mania with him the age-old itch of the french provincial the old indestructible stock who every day until the day of his death with an idiotic patience which is almost heroic writes down in detail what he has seen said done heard eaten and drunk for his own pleasure entirely it is not for other eyes no one will ever read it he knows that he never reads it again himself music like religion was for olivier a shelter from the too vivid light of day both brother and sister were born musicians especially olivier who had inherited the gift from his mother their taste as it needed to be was excellent there was no one capable of forming it in the province where no music was ever heard but that of the local band which played nothing but marches or on its good days selections from adolphe adam and the church organist who played romances and the exercises of the young ladies of the town who strummed a few valses and polkas the overture of the caliph of baghdad la chasse du jean henri and two or three sonatas of mozart always the same and always with the same mistakes on instruments that were sadly out of tune these things were invariably included in the evening's program at parties after dinner those with talent were asked to display it at first they would blush and refuse but then they would yield to the entreaties of the assembled company and they would play their stock pieces without their music every one would then admire the artist's memory and her beautiful touch the ceremony was repeated at almost every party and the thought of it would altogether spoil the children's dinner when they had to play the voyage en chine of bazin or their pieces of weber as a duet they gave each other confidence and were not very much afraid but it was torture to them to have to play alone antoinette as usual was the braver of the two although it bored her dreadfully as she knew that there was no way out of it she would go through with it sit at the piano with a determined air and gallop through her rondo at breakneck speed stumbling over certain passages make a dash of others break off turn her head and say with a smile oh i can't remember then she would start up again a few bars farther on and go on to the end and she would make no attempt to conceal her pleasure at having finished and when she returned to her chair amid the general chorus of praise she would laugh and say i made such a lot of mistakes but olivier was not so easy to handle he could not bear making a show of himself in public and being the observed of all observers it was bad enough for him to have to speak in company but to have to play especially for people who did not like music that was obvious to him for people whom music actually bored people who only asked him to play as a matter of habit seemed to him to be neither more nor less than tyranny and he tried vainly to revolt against it he would refuse obstinately sometimes he would escape and go and hide in a dark room in a passage or even in the barn in spite of his horror of spiders his refusal would make the guests only insist the more and they would quiz him and his parents would sternly order him to play and even slap him when he was too impudently rebellious and in the end he always had to play of course unwillingly and sulkily and then he would suffer agonies all night because he had played so badly partly from vanity and partly from his very genuine love for music the taste of the little town had not always been so banal there had been a time when there were quite good chamber concerts at several houses madame chenin 
used often to speak of her grandfather who adored the violoncello and used to sing airs of gluck and de la rac and berton there was a large volume of them in the house and a pile of italian songs for the old gentleman was like monsieur andreo of whom berlioz said he loved gluck and he added bitterly he also loved piccini perhaps of the two he preferred piccini at all events the italian songs were in a large majority in her grandfather's collection they had been olivia's first musical nourishment not a very substantial diet rather like those sweetmeats with which provincial children are stuffed they corrupt the palate destroy the tissues of the stomach and there is always a danger of their killing the appetite for more solid nutriment but olivier could not be accused of greediness he was never offered any more solid food having no bread he was forced to eat cake and so by force of circumstance it came about that kiss morosa pi cielo and rossini fed the mystic melancholy little boy who was more than a little intoxicated by his draughts of the asti spumanti poured out for him instead of milk by these bacchanalian satyrs and the two lively ingeniously lasciviously smiling bacchant of naples and catania Bercolisi and bellini he played a great deal to himself for his own pleasure he was saturated with music he did not try to understand what he was playing but gave himself up to it nobody ever thought of teaching him harmony and it never occurred to him to learn it science and the scientific mind were foreign to the nature of his family especially on his mother's side all the lawyers wits and humanists of the de Villiers were baffled by any sort of problem he was told of a member of the family a distant cousin as a remarkable thing that he had found a post in the bureau des longitudes and he was further told how he had gone mad the old provincial middle classes robust and positive in temper but dull and sleepy as a result of their gigantic meals and the monotony of their lives are very proud of their common sense they have so much faith in it that they boast that there is no difficulty which cannot be resolved by it and they are never very far from considering men of science as artists of a sort more useful than the others but less exalted because at least artists serve no useful purpose and there is a sort of distinction about their lounging existence besides every business man flatters himself that he might have been an artist if he had cared about it while well, scientists are not far from being manual labourers which is degrading just master workmen with more education though they are a little cracked they are mighty fine on paper but outside their arithmetic factories they are nobody they would not be much use without the guidance of common-sense people who have some experience of life and business unfortunately it is not proven that their experience of life and business goes so far as these people like to think it is only a routine ringing the changes on a few easy cases if any unforeseen position arises in which they have to decide quickly and vigorously they are always disgruntled antoine Janin, was that sort of man everything was so nicely adjusted and his business jogged along so comfortably in its place in the life of the province that he had never encountered any serious difficulty he had succeeded to his father's position without having any special aptitude for the business and as everything had gone well he attributed it to his own brilliant talents he loved to say that it was enough to be honest methodical and to have common sense and he intended handing down his business to his son without any more regard for the boy's tastes than his father had had for his own he did not do anything to prepare him for it he let his children grow up as they liked so long as they were good and above all happy for he adored them and so the two children were as little prepared for the struggle of life as possible they were like hothouse flowers but surely they would always live like that in the soft provincial atmosphere in the bosom of their wealthy influential family with a kindly gay jovial father surrounded by friends one of the leading men of the district life was so easy so bright and smiling antoinette was sixteen olivia was about to be confirmed his mind was filled with all kinds of mystic dreams in her heart antoinette heard the sweet song of newborn hope soaring like the lark in april in the springtime of her life it was a joy to her to feel the flowering of her body and soul to know that she was pretty and to be told so her father's immoderate praises were enough to turn her head he was in ecstasies over her he delighted in her little coquetries to see her eyeing herself in her mirror to watch her little innocent tricks he would take her on his knees and tease her about her childish love affairs and the conquests she had made and the suitors that he pretended had come to him a wooing he would tell her their names respectable citizens each more old and ugly than the last and she would cry out in horror and break into rippling laughter and put her arms about her father's neck and press her cheek close to his and he would ask which was the happy man of her choice was it the district 
attorney who in the jejans old maid used to say was as ugly as the seven deadly sins or was it the fat notary and she would slap him playfully to make him cease or hold her hand over his mouth he would kiss her little hands and jump her up and down on his knees and sing the old song what would you pretty maid an ugly husband eh and she would giggle and tie his whiskers under his chin and reply with the refrain a handsome husband i no ugly man madame she would declare her intention of choosing for herself she knew that she was or would be very rich her father used to tell her so at every turn she was a fine catch the sons of the distinguished families of the country were already courting her setting a wide white net of flattery and cunning snares to catch the little silver fish but it looked as though the fish would elude them all for antoinette saw all their tricks and laughed at them she was quite ready to be caught but not against her will she had already made up her mind to marry the noble family of the district there is generally one noble family to every district claiming descent from the ancient lords of the province though generally its origin goes no farther back than some purchaser of the national estates some commissary of the eighteenth century or some napoleonic army contractor the bonnevets who live some few miles away from the town in a castle with tall towers with gleaming slates surrounded by vast woods in which were innumerable fish ponds themselves proposed for the hand of mademoiselle Jeannin young bonnivet was very assiduous in his courtship of antoinette he was a handsome boy rather stout and heavy for his age who did nothing but hunt and eat and drink and sleep he could ride dance had charming manners and was not more stupid than other young men he would ride into the town or drive in his buggy and call on the banker on some business pretext and sometimes he would bring some game or a bouquet of flowers for the ladies he would seize the opportunity to, to pay court to antoinette they would walk in the garden together he would pay her lumbering compliments and pull his moustache and make jokes and make his spurs clatter on the tiles of the terrace antoinette thought him charming her pride and her affections were both tickled she would swim in those first sweet hours of young love olivier detested the young squire because he was strong heavy brutal had a loud laugh and hands that gripped like a vice and a disdainful trick of always calling him boy than pinching his cheeks he detested him above all without knowing it because he dared to love his sister his sister's very own his and she could not belong to any one else End of section nineteen section twenty of jean christophe in paris this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Cannon, Antoinette, Chapter One, Part Three. Disaster came sooner or later there must come a crisis in the lives of the old middle-class families which for centuries have vegetated in the same little corner of the earth and have sucked it dry they sleep in peace and think themselves as eternal as the earth that bears them but the soil beneath them is dry and dead their roots are sapped just the blow of an axe and down they come then they talk of accidents and unforeseen misfortunes there would have been no accident if there had been more strength in the tree or at least would have been no more than a sudden storm wrenching away a few branches but never shaking the tree antoine jeanin was weak trustful and a little vain he loved to throw dust in people's eyes and easily confounded seeming and being he spent recklessly though his extravagance moderated by fits of remorse as the result of the age-old habit of economy he would fling away pounds and haggle over a farthing never seriously impaired his capital he was not very cautious in business either he never refused to lend money to his friends and it was not difficult to be a friend of his he did not always trouble to ask for a receipt he kept a rough account of what was owing to him and never asked for payment before it was offered him 
he believed in the good faith of other men and supposed that they would believe in his own he was much more timid than his jocular easy-going manners led people to suppose he would never have dared to refuse certain importunate borrowers or to let his doubts of their solvency appear that arose from a mixture of kindness and pusillanimity he did not wish to offend anybody and he was afraid of being insulted so he was always giving way and by way of carrying it off he would lend with alacrity as though his debtors were doing him a service by borrowing his money and he was not far from believing it his vanity and optimism had no difficulty in persuading him that every business he touched was good business such ways of dealing were not calculated to alienate the sympathies of his debtors he was adored by the peasants who knew that they could always count on his good nature and never hesitated to resort to him but the gratitude of men even of honest men is a fruit that must be gathered in good season if it is left too long upon the tree it quickly rots after a few months m jeanin's debtors would begin to think that his assistance was their right and they were even inclined to think that as m jeanin had been so glad to help them it must have been to his interest to do so the best of them considered themselves discharged if not of the debt at least of the obligation of gratitude by the present of a hare they had killed or a basket of eggs from their fowl yard which they would come and offer to the banker on the day of the great fair of the year as hitherto only small sums had been lent and m jeanin had only had to do with fairly honest people there were no very awkward consequences the loss of money of which the banker never breathed a word to a soul was very small but it was a very different matter when m jeanin knocked up against a certain company promoter who was launching a great industrial concern and had got wind of the banker's easy-going ways and financial resources this gentleman who wore the ribbon of the legion of honour and pretended to be intimate with two or three ministers an archbishop an assortment of senators and various celebrities of the literary and financial world and to be in touch with an omnipotent newspaper had a very imposing manner and most adroitly assumed the authoritative and familiar tone most calculated to impress his man by way of introduction and recommendation with a clumsiness which would have aroused the suspicions of a quicker man than m jeanin he produced certain ordinary complimentary letters which he had received from the illustrious persons of his acquaintance asking him to dinner or thanking him for some invitation they had received for it is well known that the french are never niggardly with such epistolary small change nor particularly chary of shaking hands with and accepting invitations from an individual whom they have only known for an hour provided only that he amuses them and does not ask them for money and even as regards that there are many who would not refuse to lend their new friend money so long as others did the same and it would be a poor lookout for a clever man bent on relieving his neighbour of his superfluous money if he could not find a sheep who could be induced to jump the fence so that all the rest would follow if other sheep had not taken the fence before him m jeanin would have been the first he was of the woolly tribe which is made to be fleeced he was seduced by his visitors exalted connections his fluency and his trick of flattery and also by the first fine results of his advice he only risked a little at first and won then he risked much finally he risked all not only his own money but that of his clients as well he did not tell them about it he was sure he would win he wanted to overwhelm them with the great thing he had done for them the venture collapsed he heard of it indirectly through one of his parisian correspondents who happened to mention the new crash without ever dreaming that jeanin was one of the victims for the banker had not said a word to anybody with incredible irresponsibility he had not taken the trouble even avoided asking the advice of men who were in a position to give him information he had done the whole thing secretly in the infatuated belief in his infallible common sense and he had been satisfied with the vaguest knowledge of what he was doing there are such moments of aberration in life moments it would seem when a man is marked out 
for ruin when he is fearful lest any one should come to his aid when he avoids all advice that might save him hides away and rushes headlong madly shaking himself free for the fatal plunge m jeanin rushed to the station utterly sick at heart and took train for paris he went to look for his man he flattered himself with the hope that the news might be false or at least exaggerated naturally he did not find the fellow and received further news of the collapse which was as complete as possible he returned distracted and said nothing no one had any idea of it yet he tried to gain a few weeks a few days in his incurable optimism he tried hard to believe that he would find a way to make good if not his own losses at least those of his clients he tried various expedients with a clumsy haste which would have removed any chance of succeeding that he might have had he tried to borrow but was everywhere refused in his despair he staked the little he had left on wildly speculative ventures and lost it all from that moment there was a complete change in his character he relapsed into an alarming state of terror still he said nothing but he was bitter violent harsh horribly sad but still when he was with strangers he affected his old gaiety but no one could fail to see the change in him it was attributed to his health with his family he was less guarded and they saw at once that he was concealing some serious trouble they hardly knew him sometimes he would burst into a room and ransack a desk flinging all the papers higgledy piggledy on to the floor and flying into a frenzy because he could not find what he was looking for or because some one offered to help him then he would stand stock still in the middle of it all and when they asked him what he was looking for he did not know himself he seemed to have lost all interest in his family or he would kiss them with tears in his eyes he could not sleep he could not eat madame jeanin saw that they were on the eve of a catastrophe but she had never taken any part in her husband's affairs and did not understand them she questioned him he repulsed her brutally and hurt in her pride she did not persist but she trembled without knowing why the children could have no suspicion of the impending disaster antoinette no doubt was too intelligent not like her mother to have a presentiment of some misfortune but she was absorbed in the delight of her budding love she refused to think of unpleasant things she persuaded herself that the clouds would pass or that it would be time enough to see them when it was impossible to disregard them of the three the boy olivier was perhaps the nearest to understanding what was going on in his unhappy father's soul he felt that his father was suffering and he suffered with him in secret but he dared not say anything naturally he could do nothing and he was helpless and then he too thrust back the thought of sad things the nature of which he could not grasp like his mother and sister he was superstitiously inclined to believe that perhaps misfortune the approach of which he did not wish to see would not come those poor wretches who feel the imminence of danger do readily play the ostrich they hide their heads behind a stone and pretend that misfortune will not see them disturbing rumours began to fly it was said that the bank's credit was impaired in vain did the banker assure his clients that it was perfectly all right on one pretext or another the more suspicious of them demanded their money m jeanin felt that he was lost he defended himself desperately assuming a tone of indignation and complaining loftily and bitterly of their suspicions of himself he even went so far as to be violent and angry with some of his old clients but that only let him down finally demands for payment came in a rush on his beam ends of bay he completely lost his head he went away for a few days to gamble with his last few banknotes at a neighbouring watering-place was cleaned out in a quarter of an hour and returned home his sudden departure set the little town by the ears and it was said that he had cleared out and madame jeanin had had great difficulty in coping with the wild anxious inquiries of the people she begged them to be patient and swore that her husband would return they did not believe her although they would have been only too glad to do so and so when it was known that he had returned there was a general sigh of relief there were many who almost believed that their fears had been baseless and that the jeanins were much too shrewd not to get out of a hole by admitting that they had fallen into it the banker's attitude confirmed that impression now that he no longer had any doubt as to what he must do he seemed to be weary but quite calm he chatted quietly to a few friends whom he met in the station road on his way home talking about the drought and the country not having had any water for weeks and the superb condition of the vines and the fall of the ministry announced in the evening papers 
when he reached home he pretended not to notice his wife's excitement who had run to meet him when she heard him come in and told him volubly and confusedly what had happened during his absence she scanned his features to try and see whether he had succeeded in averting the unknown danger but from pride she did not ask him anything she was waiting for him to speak first but he did not say a word about the thing that was tormenting them both he silently disregarded her desire to confide in him and to get him to confide in her he spoke of the heat and of how tired he was and complained of a racking headache and they sat down to dinner as usual he talked little and was dull lost in thought and his brows were knit he drummed with his fingers on the table he forced himself to eat knowing that they were watching him and looked with vague unseeing eyes at his children who were intimidated by the silence and at his wife who sat stiffly nursing her injured vanity and without looking at him marking his every movement towards the end of dinner he seemed to wake up he tried to talk to antoinette and olivier and asked them what they had been doing during his absence but he did not listen to their replies and heard only the sound of their voices and although he was staring at them his gaze was elsewhere olivier felt it he stopped in the middle of his prattle and had no desire to go on but after a moment's embarrassment antoinette recovered her gaiety she chattered merrily like a magpie laid her head on her father's shoulder or tugged his sleeve to make him listen to what she was saying monsieur jeanin said nothing his eyes wandered from antoinette to olivier and the crease of his forehead grew deeper and deeper in the middle of one of his daughter's stories he could bear it no longer and got up and went and looked out of the window to conceal his emotion the children folded their napkins and got up too madame jeanin told them to go and play in the garden in a moment or two they could be heard chasing each other down the paths and screaming madame jeanin looked at her husband whose back was turned towards her and she walked round the table as though to arrange something suddenly she went up to him and in a voice hushed by her fear of being overheard by the servants and by the agony that was in her she said tell me antoine what is the matter there is something the matter you are hiding something has something dreadful happened are you ill but once more monsieur jeanin put her off and shrugged his shoulders and said harshly no no i tell you let me be she was angry and went away in her fury she declared that no matter what happened to her husband she would not bother about it any more monsieur jeanin went down into the garden antoinette was still larking about and tugging at her brother to make him run but the boy declared suddenly that he was not going to play any more and he leaned against the wall of the terrace a few yards away from his father antoinette tried to go on teasing him but he drove her away and sulked then she called him names and when she found she could get no more fun out of him she went in and began to play the piano monsieur jeanin and olivier were left alone what's the matter with you boy why won't you play asked the father gently i'm tired father well let us sit here on this seat for a little they sat down it was a lovely september night a dark clear sky the sweet scent of the petunias was mingled with the stale and rather unwholesome smell of the canal sleeping darkly below the terrace wall great moths pale and sphinx-like fluttered about the flowers with a little worrying sound the even voices of the neighbors sitting at their doors on the other side of the canal rang through the silent air in the house antoinette was playing a florid italian cavatina monsieur jean held olivier's hand in his he was smoking through the darkness behind which his father's face was slowly disappearing the boy could see the red glow of the pipe which gleamed died away gleamed again and finally went out neither spoke then olivier asked the names of the stars monsieur jeanin like almost all men of his class knew nothing of the things of nature and could not tell him the names of any save the great constellations which are known to every one but he pretended that the boy was asking their names and told him olivier made no objection it always pleased him to hear their beautiful mysterious names and to repeat them in a whisper besides he was not so much wanting to know their names as instinctively to come closer to his father they said nothing more olivier looked at the stars with his head thrown back and his mouth open he was lost in drowsy thoughts he could feel through all his veins the warmth of his father's hand suddenly the hand began to tremble that seemed funny to olivier and he laughed and said sleepily oh how your hand is trembling father monsieur jeanin removed his hand after a moment olivier still busy with his own thoughts said are you tired too father yes my boy the boy replied affectionately you must not tire yourself out so much father monsieur jeanin drew olivier towards him and held him to his breast and murmured my poor boy but already olivier's thoughts had flown off on another tack the church clock chimed eight o'clock he broke away and said i'm going to read 
on thursdays he was allowed to read for an hour after dinner until bedtime it was his greatest joy and nothing in the world could induce him to sacrifice a minute of it monsieur jonin let him go he walked up and down the terrace for a little in the dark then he too went in in the room his wife and the two children were sitting round the lamp antoinette was sewing a ribbon on to a blouse talking and humming the while to olivier's obvious discomfort for he was stopping his ears with his fists so as not to hear while he pored over his book with knitted brows and his elbows on the table madame Jeanin was mending stocking and talking to the old nurse who was standing by her side and giving an account of her day's expenditure and seizing the opportunity for a little gossip she always had some amusing tale to tell in her extraordinary lingo which used to make them roar with laughter while antoinette would try to imitate her m jeanin watched them silently no one noticed him he wavered for a moment sat down took up a book and opened it at random shut it again got up he could not sit still he lit a candle and said good-night he went up to the children and kissed them fondly they returned his kiss absently without looking up at him antoinette being absorbed in her work and olivia in his book olivia did not even take his hands from his ears and grunted good-night and went on reading when he was reading even if one of his family had fallen into the fire he would not have looked up m jeanin left the room he lingered in the next room for a moment his wife came out soon the old nurse having gone to arrange the linen cupboard she pretended not to see him he hesitated then came up to her and said i beg your pardon i was rather rude just now she longed to say to him my dear my dear that is nothing but tell me what is the matter with you tell me what is hurting you so but she jumped at the opportunity of taking her revenge and said let me be you have been behaving odiously you treat me worse than you would a servant and she went on in that strain setting forth all her grievances volubly shrilly rancorously he raised his hands wearily smiled bitterly and left her end of section twenty section twenty one of jean christophe in paris this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org jean christophe in paris by romain roland translated by gilbert cannon antoinette chapter one part four no one heard the report of the revolver only next day when it was known what had happened a few of the neighbors remembered that in the middle of the night when the streets were quiet they had noticed a sharp noise like the cracking of a whip they did not pay any attention to it the silence of the night fell once more upon the town wrapping both living and dead about with its mystery madame jeannin was asleep but woke up an hour or two later not seeing her husband by her side she got up and went anxiously through all the rooms and downstairs to the offices of the bank which were in an annex of the house and there sitting in his chair in his office she found m jeanin huddled forward on his desk in a pool of blood which was still dripping down on to the floor she gave a scream dropped her candle and fainted she was heard in the house the servants came running picked her up took care of her and laid the body of m jeanin on a bed the door of the children's room was locked antoinette was sleeping happily olivier heard the sound of voices and footsteps he wanted to go and see what it was all about but he was afraid of waking his sister and presently he went to sleep again next morning the news was all over the town before they knew anything their old nurse came sobbing and told them their mother was incapable of thinking of anything her condition was critical the two children were left alone in the presence of death at first they were more fearful than sorrowful and they were not allowed to weep in peace the cruel legal formalities were begun the first thing in the morning antoinette hid away in her room and with all the force of her youthful egoism clung to the only idea which could help her to thrust back the horror of the overwhelming reality the thought of her lover 
all day long she waited for him to come never had he been more ardent than the last time she had seen him and she had no doubt that as soon as he heard of the catastrophe he would hasten to share her grief but nobody came or wrote or gave one sign of sympathy as soon as the news of the suicide was out people who had entrusted their money to the banker rushed to the jeanin's house forced their way in and with merciless cruelty stormed and screamed at the widow and the two children in a few days they were faced with their utter ruin the loss of a dear one the loss of their fortune their position their public esteem and the desertion of their friends a total wreck nothing was left to provide for them they had all three an uncompromising feeling for moral purity which made their suffering all the greater from the dishonour of which they were innocent of the three antoinette was the most distraught by their sorrow because she had never really known suffering madame jeanin and olivier though they were racked by it were more inured to it instinctively pessimistic they were overwhelmed but not surprised the idea of death had always been a refuge to them as it was now more than ever they longed for death it is pitiful to be so resigned but not so terrible as the revolt of a young creature confident and happy loving every moment of her life who suddenly finds herself face to face with such unfathomable irremediable sorrow and death which is horrible to her antoinette discovered the ugliness of the world in a flash her eyes were opened she saw life in human beings as they are she judged her father her mother and her brother while olivier and madame jeanin wept together in her grief she drew into herself desperately she pondered the past the present and the future and she saw that there was nothing left for her no hope nothing to support her she could count on no one the funeral took place grimly shamefully the church refused to receive the body of the suicide the widow and orphans were deserted by the cowardice of their former friends one or two of them came for a moment and their embarrassment was even harder to bear than the absence of the rest they seemed to make a favour of it and their silence was big with reproach and pity and contempt it was even worse with their relations not only did they receive no single word of sympathy but they were visited with bitter reproaches the banker's suicide far from removing ill feeling seemed to be hardly less criminal than his failure respectable people cannot forgive those who kill themselves it seems to them monstrous that a man should prefer death to life with dishonour and they would fain call down all the rigour of the law on him who seems to say there is no misery so great as that of living with you the greatest cowards are not the least ready to accuse him of cowardice and when in addition the suicide by ending his life touches their interests and their revenge they lose all control not for one moment did they think of all that the wretched jeanin must have suffered to come to it they would have had him suffer a thousand times more and as he had escaped them they transferred their fury to his family they did not admit it to themselves for they knew they were unjust but they did it all the same for they needed a victim madame jeanin who seemed to be able to do nothing but weep and moan recovered her energy when her husband was attacked she discovered then how much she had loved him and she and her two children who had no idea what would become of them in the future all agreed to renounce their claim to her dowry and to their own personal estate in order as far as possible to meet m jeanin's debt and since it had become impossible for them to stay in the little town they decided to go to paris their departure was something in the nature of a flight on the evening of the day before a melancholy evening towards the end of september the fields were disappearing behind the white veil of mist out of which as they walked along the road on either side the fantastic shapes of the dripping shivering bushes started forth looking like the plants in an aquarium they went together to say farewell to the grave where he lay they all three knelt on the narrow curbstone which surrounded the freshly turned patch of earth they wept in silence olivier sobbed madame jeanin mopped her eyes mournfully she augmented her grief and tortured herself by saying to herself over and over again the words she had spoken to her husband the last time she had seen him alive olivier thought of that last conversation on the seat on the terrace antoinette wondered dreamily what would become of them none of them ever dreamed of reproaching the wretched man who had dragged them down in his own ruin but antoinette thought ah dear father how we shall suffer 
the mist grew more dense the cold damp pierced through to their bones but madame jeanin could not bring herself to go antoinette saw that olivier was shivering and she said to her brother i am cold they got up just as they were going madame jeanin turned once more towards the grave gazed at it for the last time and said my dear my dear they left the cemetery as night was falling antoinette held olivier's icy hand in hers they went back to the old house it was their last night under the roof-tree where they had always slept where their lives and the lives of their parents had been lived the walls the hearth the little patch of earth were so indissolubly linked with the family's joys and sorrows as almost themselves to be part of the family part of their life which they could only leave to die their boxes were packed they were to take the first train next day before the shops were opened they wanted to escape their neighbours curiosity and malicious remarks they longed to cling to each other and stay together but they went instinctively to their rooms and stayed there there they remained standing never moving not even taking off their hats and cloaks touching the walls the furniture all the things they were going to leave pressing their faces against the window panes trying to take away with them in memory the contact of the things they loved at last they made an effort to shake free from the absorption of their sorrowful thoughts and met in madame jeanin's room the family room with a great recess at the back where in old days they always used to foregather in the evening after dinner when there were no visitors in old days how far off they seemed now they sat silently round the meagre fire then they all knelt by the bed and said their prayers and they went to bed very early for they had to be up before dawn but it was long before they slept about four o'clock in the morning madame jeanin who had looked at her watch every hour or so to see whether it was not time to get ready lit her candle and got up antoinette who had hardly slept at all heard her and got up too olivier was fast asleep madame jeanin gazed at him tenderly and could not bring herself to wake him she stole away on tiptoe and said to antoinette don't make any noise let the poor boy enjoy his last moments here the two women dressed and finished their packing about the house hovered the profound silence of the cold night such a night as makes all living things men and beasts cower away for warmth into the depths of sleep antoinette's teeth were chattering she was frozen body and soul the front door creaked upon the frozen air the old nurse who had the key of the house came for the last time to serve her employers she was short and fat short-winded and slow-moving from her portliness but she was remarkably active for her age she appeared with her jolly face muffled up and her nose was red and her eyes were wet with tears she was heartbroken when she saw that madame jeanin had got up without waiting for her and had herself lit the kitchen fire olivier woke up as she came in his first impulse was to close his eyes turn over and go to sleep again antoinette came and laid her hand gently on her brother's shoulder and she said in a low voice olivier dear it is time to get up he sighed opened his eyes saw his sister's face leaning over him she smiled sadly and caressed his face with her hand she said come he got up they crept out of the house noiselessly like thieves they all had parcels in their hands the old nurse went in front of them trundling their boxes in a wheelbarrow they left behind almost all their possessions and took away so to speak only what they had on their backs and a change of clothes a few things for remembrance were to be sent after them by goods train a few books portraits the old grandfather's clock whose tick-tock seemed to them to be the beating of their hearts the air was keen no one was stirring in the town the shutters were closed and the streets empty they said nothing only the old servant spoke madame jeanin was striving to fix in her memory all the images which told her of all her past life at the station out of vanity madame jeanin took second-class tickets although she had vowed to travel third but she had not the courage to face the humiliation in the presence of the railway clerks who knew her she hurried into an empty compartment with her two children and shut the door hiding behind the curtains they trembled lest they should see any one they knew but no one appeared the town was hardly awake by the time they left the train was empty there were only a few peasants travelling by it and some oxen who hung their heads out of their trucks and bellowed mournfully after a long wait the engine gave a slow whistle and the train moved on through the mist the fugitives drew the curtains and pressed their faces against the windows to take a last long look at the little town with its gothic tower just appearing through the mist and the hill covered with stubby fields and the meadows white and steaming with the frost 
already it was a distant dream landscape fading out of existence and when the train turned a bend and passed into a cutting and they could no longer see it and were sure there was no one to see them they gave way to their emotion with her handkerchief pressed to her lips madame jeanin sobbed olivier flung himself into her arms and with his head on her knees he covered her hands with tears and kisses antoinette sat at the other end of the compartment and looked out of the window and wept in silence they did not all weep for the same reason madame jeanin and olivier were thinking only of what they had left behind them antoinette was thinking rather of what they were going to meet she was angry with herself she too would gladly have been absorbed in her memories she was right to think of the future she had a truer vision of the world than her mother and brother they were weaving dreams about paris antoinette herself had little notion of what awaited them there they had never been there madame jeanin imagined that though their position would be sad enough there would be no reason for anxiety she had a sister in paris the wife of a wealthy magistrate and she counted on her assistance she was convinced also that with the education her children had received in their natural gifts which like all mothers she overestimated they would have no difficulty in earning an honest living their first impressions were gloomy enough as they left the station they were bewildered by the jostling crowd of people in the luggage-room and the confused uproar of the carriages outside it was raining they could not find a cab and had to walk a long way with their arms aching with their heavy parcels so that they had to stop every now and then in the middle of the street at the risk of being run over or splashed by the carriages they could not make a single driver pay any attention to them at last they managed to stop a man who was driving an old and disgustingly dirty barouche as they were handing in the parcels they let a bundle of rugs fall into the mud the porter who carried the trunk and the cabman traded on their ignorance and made them pay double madame jeanin gave the address of one of those second-rate expensive hotels patronized by provincials who go on going to them in spite of their discomfort because their grandfathers went to them thirty years ago they were fleeced there they were told that the hotel was full and they were accommodated with one small room for which they were charged the price of three for dinner they tried to economize by avoiding the table d'hote they ordered a modest meal which cost them just as much and left them famishing their illusions concerning paris had come toppling down as soon as they arrived and during that first night in the hotel when they were squeezed into one little ill-ventilated room they could not sleep they were hot and cold by turns and could not breathe and started at every footstep in the corridor and the banging of the doors and the furious ringing of the electric bells and their heads throbbed with the incessant roar of the carriages and heavy drays and altogether they felt terrified of the monstrous city into which they had plunged to their utter bewilderment next day madame jeanin went to see her sister who lived in a luxurious flat in the boulevard haussmann she hoped though she did not say so that they would be invited to stay there until they had found their feet the welcome she received was enough to undeceive her the poet delorme were furious at their relative's failure especially madame delorme who was afraid that it would be said against her and might injure her husband's career and she thought it shameless of the ruined family to come and cling to them and compromise them even more the magistrate was of the same opinion but he was a kindly man he would have been more inclined to help but for his wife's intervention to which he knuckled under madame poyer delorme received her sister with icy coldness it cut madame jeanin to the heart but she swallowed down her pride she hinted at the difficulty of her position and the assistance she hoped to receive from the poyers her sister pretended not to understand it did not even ask her to stay to dinner they were ceremoniously invited to dine at the end of the week the invitation did not come from madame poyer either but from the magistrate who was a little put out at his wife's treatment of her sister and tried to make amends for her curtness he posed as the good-natured man but it was obvious that it did not come easily to him and that he was really very selfish the unhappy jeanin returned to their hotel without daring to say what they thought of their first visit they spent the following days in wandering about paris looking for a flat they were worn out with going upstairs and disheartened by the sight of the great barracks crammed full of people and the dirty stairs and the dark rooms that seemed so depressing to them after their own big house in the country they grew more and more depressed and they were always shy and timid in the streets and shops and restaurants so that they were cheated at every turn everything they asked for cost an exorbitant sum it was as though they had the faculty of turning everything they touched into gold only it was they who had to pay out the gold they were incredibly simple and absolutely incapable of looking after themselves 
though there was little left to hope for from madame jonin's sister the poor lady wove illusions about the dinner to which they were invited they dressed for it with fluttering hearts they were received as guests and not as relations though nothing more was expended on the dinner than the ceremonious manner the children met their cousins who were almost the same age as themselves but they were not much more cordial than their father and mother the girl was very smart and coquettish and spoke to them with a lisp and a politely superior air with affectedly honeyed manners which disconcerted them the boy was bored by this duty dinner with their poor relations and he was as surly as could be madame poyer de lorme sat up stiffly in her chair and even when she handed her a dish seemed to be reading her sister a lesson madame poyer de lorme talked trivialities to keep the conversation from becoming serious they never got beyond talking of what they were eating for fear of touching upon any intimate and dangerous topic madame jonin made an effort to bring them round to the subject next her heart madame boyer de lorme cut her short with some pointless remark and she had not the courage to try again after dinner she made her daughter play the piano by way of showing off her talents the poor girl was embarrassed and unhappy and played execrably the poyers were bored and anxious for her to finish madame poyer exchanged glances with her daughter with an ironic curl of her lips and as the music went on too long she began to talk to madame jonin about nothing in particular at last antoinette who had quite lost her place and saw to her horror that instead of going on she had begun again at the beginning and that there was no reason why she should ever stop broke off suddenly and ended with two inaccurate chords and a third which was absolutely dissonant monsieur poyer said bravo and he asked for coffee madame poyer said that her daughter was taking lessons with pignot and the young lady who was taking lessons with pignot said charming my dear and asked where antoinette had studied the conversation dropped they had exhausted the knick-knacks in the drawing-room and the dresses of madame and mademoiselle poyer madame jonin said to herself i must speak now i must and she fidgeted just as she had pulled herself together to begin madame poyer mentioned casually without any attempt at an apology that they were very sorry but they had to go out at half-past nine they had an invitation which they had been unable to decline the jonin were at a loss and got up at once to go the poyers made some show of detaining them but a quarter of an hour later there was a ring at the door the footman announced some friends of the poyers neighbours of theirs who lived in the flat below poyer and his wife exchanged glances and there were hurried whisperings with the servants poyer stammered some excuse and hurried the jonin into the next room he was trying to hide from his friends the existence and the presence in his house of the compromising family the jonin were left alone in a room without a fire the children were furious at the affront antoinette had tears in her eyes and insisted on their going her mother resisted for a little but then after they had waited for some time she agreed they went out in the hall they were caught by poyer who had been told by a servant and he muttered excuses he pretended that he wanted them to stay but it was obvious that he was only eager for them to go he helped them on with their cloaks and hurried them to the door with smiles and handshakes and whispered pleasantries and closed the door on them when they reached their hotel the children burst into angry tears antoinette stamped her foot and swore that she would never enter their house again madame jonin took a flat on the fourth floor near the jardin des plans the bedrooms looked on to the filthy walls of a gloomy courtyard the dining-room and the drawing-room for madame jonin insisted on having a drawing-room on to a busy street all day long steam trams went by and hearses crawling along to the ivry cemetery filthy italians with a horde of children loafed about on the seats or spent their time in shrill argument the noise made it impossible to have the windows open and in the evening on their way home they had to force their way through crowds of bustling evil-smelling people cross the thronged and muddy streets past a horrible pot-house that was on the ground floor of the next house in the door of which there were always fat frowsy women with yellow hair and painted faces eyeing the passers-by their small supply of money soon gave out every evening with sinking hearts they took stock of the widening hole in their purse they tried to stint themselves but they did not know how to set about it that is a science which can only be learned by years of experimenting unless it has been practised from childhood those who are not naturally economical merely waste their time in trying to be so as soon as a fresh opportunity of spending money crops up they succumb to the temptation they are always going to economize next time and when they do happen to make a little money or to think they have made it they rush out and spend ten times the amount on the strength of it 
at the end of a few weeks the jeunin resources were exhausted madame jeunin had to gulp down what was left of her pride and unknown to her children she went and asked poyer for money she contrived to see him alone at his office and begged him to advance her a small sum until they had found work to keep them alive poyer who was weak and human enough tried at first to postpone the matter but finally acceded to her request he gave her two hundred francs in a moment of emotion which mastered him and he repented of it immediately afterwards when he had to make his peace with madame poyer who was furious with her husband's weakness and her sister's slyness End of section twenty one section twenty two of jean christophe in paris this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org jean christophe in paris by romain roland translated by gilbert canaan antoinette chapter one part five all day and every day the jeunins were out and about in paris looking for work madame jeunin true to the prejudices of her class would not hear of their engaging in any other profession than those which are called liberal no doubt because they leave their devotees free to starve she would even have gone so far as to forbid her daughter to take a post as a family governess only the official professions in the service of the state were not degrading in her eyes they had to discover a means of letting olivier finish his education so that he might become a teacher as for antoinette madame jeunin's idea was that she should go to school to teach or to the conservatoire to win the prize for piano playing but the schools at which she applied already had teachers enough who were much better qualified than her daughter with her poor little elementary certificate and as for music she had to recognize that antoinette's talent was quite ordinary compared with that of so many others who did not get on at all they came face to face with the terrible struggle for life and the blind waste of talent great and small for which paris can find no use the two children lost heart and exaggerated their uselessness they believed that they were mediocre and did their best to convince themselves and their mother that it was so olivier who had had no difficulty in shining at his provincial school was crushed by his various rebuffs he seemed to have lost possession of all his gifts at the school for which he won a scholarship the results of his first examinations were so disastrous that his scholarship was taken away from him he thought himself utterly stupid at the same time he had a horror of paris and its swarming inhabitants and the disgusting immorality of his schoolfellows and their shameful conversation and the bestiality of a few of them who did not spare him from their abominable proposals he was not even strong enough to show his contempt for them he felt degraded by the mere thought of their degradation with his mother and sister he took refuge in the heartfelt prayers which they used to say every evening after the day of deceptions and private humiliations which to their innocence seemed to be a taint of which they dared not tell each other but in contact with the latent spirit of atheism which is in the air of paris olivier's faith was beginning to crumble away without his knowledge like whitewash trickling down a wall under the beating of the rain he went on believing but all about him god was dying his mother and sister pursued their futile quest madame jeunin turned once more to the poyers who were anxious to be quit of them and offered them work madame jeunin was to go as reader to an old lady who was spending the winter in the south of france a post was found for antoinette as governess in a family in the west who lived all the year round in the country 
the terms were not bad but madame genin refused it was not so much for herself that she objected to a menial position but she was determined that antoinette should not be reduced to it and unwilling to part with her however unhappy they might be just because they were unhappy they wished to be together madame poyer took it very badly she said that people who had no means of living had no business to be proud madame jeannin could not refrain from crying out upon her heartlessness madame poyer spoke bitterly of the bankruptcy and of the money that madame jeannin owed her they parted and the breach between them was final all relationship between them was broken off madame jeannin had only one desire left to pay back the money she had borrowed but she was unable to do that they resumed their vain search for work madame jeannin went to see the deputy and the senator of her department men whom m jeannin had often helped everywhere she was brought face to face with ingratitude and selfishness the deputy did not even answer her letters and when she called on him he sent down word that he was out the senator commiserated her ponderously on her unhappy position which he attributed to the wretched jeannin whose suicide he stigmatized harshly madame jeannin defended her husband the senator said that of course he knew that the banker had acted not from dishonesty but from stupidity and that he was a fool a poor gull who knew nothing and would go his own way without asking anybody's advice or taking a warning from any one if he had only ruined himself there would have been nothing to say that would have been his own affair but not to mention the ruin that he had brought on others that he should have reduced his wife and children to poverty and deserted them and left them to get out of it as best they could it was madame jeannin's own business if she chose to forgive him if she were a saint but for his part he the senator not being a saint s a i n t but he flattered himself just a plain man s a i n a plain sensible reasonable human being he could find no reason for forgiveness a man who in such circumstances could kill himself was a wretch the only extenuating circumstance he could find in jeannin's case was that he was not responsible for his actions with that he begged madame jeannin's pardon for having expressed himself a little emphatically about her husband he pleaded the sympathy that he felt for her and he opened his drawer and offered her a fifty-franc note charity which she refused she applied for a post in the offices of a great government department she set about it clumsily and inconsequently and all her courage oozed out at the first attempt she returned home so demoralized that for several days she could not stir and when she resumed her efforts it was too late she did not find help either with the church people either because they saw there was nothing to gain by it or because they took no interest in a ruined family the head of which had been notoriously anti-clerical after days and days of hunting for work madame jeannin could find nothing better than a post as music-teacher in a convent an ungrateful task ridiculously ill-paid to eke out her earnings she copied music in the evenings for an agency they were very hard on her she was severely called to task for omitting words and whole lines as she did in spite of her application for she was always thinking of so many other things and her wits were wool-gathering and so after she had stayed up through the night till her eyes and her back ached her copy was rejected she would return home utterly downcast she would spend days together moaning unable to stir a finger for a long time she had been suffering from heart trouble which had been aggravated by her hard struggles and filled her with dark forebodings sometimes she would have pains and difficulty in breathing as though she were on the point of death she never went out without her name and address written on a piece of paper in her pocket in case she should collapse in the street what would happen if she were to disappear antoinette comforted her as best she could by affecting a confidence which she did not possess she begged her to be careful and to let her work go and work in her stead but the little that was left of madame jeannin's pride stirred in her and she vowed that at least her daughter should not know the humiliation she had to undergo in vain did she wear herself out and cut down their expenses what she earned was not enough to keep them alive they had to sell the few jewels which they had kept and the worst blow of all came when the money of which they were in such sore need was stolen from madame 
jonin the very day it came into her hands the poor flustered creature took it into her head while she was out to go into the bon marche which was on her way it was antoinette's birthday next day and she wanted to give her a little present she was carrying her purse in her hands so as not to lose it she put it down mechanically on the counter for a moment while she looked at something when she put out her hand for it the purse was gone it was the last blow for her a few days later on a stifling evening at the end of august a hot steaming mist hung over the town madame jonin came in from her copying agency whither she had been to deliver a piece of work that was wanted in a hurry she was late for dinner and had saved her three sous bus fare by hurrying home on foot to prevent her children being anxious when she reached the fourth floor she could neither speak nor breathe it was not the first time she had returned home in that condition the children took no notice of it she forced herself to sit down at table with them they were both suffering from the heat and did not eat anything they had to make an effort to gulp down a few morsels of food and a sip or two of stale water to give their mother time to recover they did not talk they had no desire to talk and looked out of the window suddenly madame jonin waved her hands in the air clutched at the table looked at her children moaned and collapsed antoinette and olivier sprang to their feet just in time to catch her in their arms they were beside themselves and screamed and cried to her mother mother dear dear mother but she made no sound they were at their wit's end antoinette clung wildly to her mother's body kissed her called to her olivier ran to the door of the flat and yelled help help the housekeeper came running upstairs and when she saw what had happened she ran for a doctor but when the doctor arrived he could only say that the end had come death had been instantaneous happily for madame jonin although it was impossible to know what thoughts might have been hers during the last moments when she knew that she was dying and leaving her children alone in such misery they were alone to bear the horror of the catastrophe alone to weep alone to perform the dreadful duties that follow upon death the porter's wife a kindly soul helped them a little and people came from the convent where madame jonin had taught but they were given no real sympathy the first moments brought inexpressible despair the only thing that saved them was the very excess of that despair which made olivier really ill antoinette's thoughts were distracted from her own suffering and her one idea was to save her brother and her great deep love filled olivier and plucked him back from the violent torment of his grief locked in her arms near the bed where their mother was lying in the glimmer of a candle olivier said over and over again that they must die that they must both die at once and he pointed to the window in antoinette too there was the dark desire but she fought it down she wished to live why why for her sake said antoinette she pointed to her mother she is still with us think after all that she has suffered for our sake we must spare her the crowning sorrow that of seeing us die in misery ah she went on emphatically and then we must not give way i will not i refuse to give in you must you shall be happy some day never yes you shall be happy we have had too much unhappiness a change will come it must you shall live your life you shall have children you shall be happy you shall you shall how are we to live we cannot do it we can what is it after all we have to live somehow until you can earn your living i will see to that you will see i'll do it ah if only mother had let me do it as i could have done what will you do i would not have you degrading yourself you could not do it i can and there is nothing humiliating in working for one's living provided it be honest work don't you worry about it please you will see everything will come right you shall be happy we shall be happy dear olivier she will be happy through us the two children were the only mourners at their mother's grave by common consent they agreed not to tell the poyers the poyers had ceased to exist for them they had been too cruel to their mother they had helped her to her death and when the housekeeper asked them if they had no other relations they replied no nobody by the bare grave they prayed hand in hand they set their teeth in desperate resolve and pride and preferred their solitude to the presence of their callous and hypocritical relations they returned on foot through the throng of people who were strangers to their grief strangers to their thoughts strangers to their lives and shared nothing with them but their common language antoinette had to support olivier they took a tiny flat in the same house on the top floor two little attics a narrow hall 
which had to serve as a dining-room and a kitchen that was more like a cupboard they could have found better rooms in another neighbourhood but it seemed to them that they were still with their mother in that house the housekeeper took an interest in them for a time but she was soon absorbed in her own affairs and nobody bothered about them they did not know a single one of their other tenants and they did not even know who lived next door antoinette obtained her mother's post as music teacher at the convent she procured other pupils she had only one idea to educate her brother until he was ready for the ecole normale it was her own idea and she had decided upon it after mature reflection she had studied the syllabus and asked about it and had also tried to find out what olivier thought but he had no ideas and she chose for him once at the ecole normale he would be sure of a living for the rest of his life and his future would be assured he must get in somehow whatever it cost they would have to keep alive till then it meant five or six terrible years they would win through the idea of possessed antoinette absorbed her whole life the poor solitary existence which she must lead which she saw clearly mapped out in front of her was only made bearable through the passionate exultation which filled her her determination by all means in her power to save her brother and make him happy the light-hearted gentle girl of seventeen or eighteen was transfigured by her heroic resolution there was in her an ardent quality of devotion a pride of battle which no one had suspected herself least of all in that critical period of a woman's life during the first fevered days of spring when love fills all her being and like a hidden stream murmuring beneath the earth laves her soul envelops it floods it with tenderness and fills it with sweet obsessions love appears in divers shapes demanding that she should give herself and yield herself up to be its prey for love at least excuse is enough and for its profound yet innocent sensuality any sacrifice is easy love made antoinette the prey of sisterly devotion ocean her brother was less passionate and had no such stay besides the sacrifice was made for him it was not he who was sacrificed which is so much easier and sweeter when one loves he was weighed down with remorse at seeing her sister wearing herself out for him he would tell her so and she would reply ah my dear but don't you see that that is what keeps me going without you to trouble me what should i have to live for he understood he too in antoinette's position would have been jealous of the trouble he caused her but to be the cause of it that hurt his pride and his affection and what a burden it was for so weak a creature to bear such a responsibility to be bound to succeed since on his success his sister had staked her whole life the thought of it was intolerable to him and instead of spurring him on there were times when it robbed him of all energy and yet she forced him to struggle on to work to live as he never would have done without her aid and insistence he had a natural predisposition towards depression perhaps even towards suicide perhaps he would have succumbed to it had not his sister wished him to be ambitious and happy he suffered from the contradiction of his nature and yet it worked his salvation he too was passing through a critical age that fearful period when thousands of young men succumb and give themselves up to the aberrations of their minds and senses and for two or three years folly spoil their lives beyond repair if he had had time to yield to his thoughts he would have fallen into discouragement or perhaps taken to dissipation always when he turned in upon himself he became a prey to his morbid dreams and disgust with life in paris and the impure fermentation of all those millions of human beings mingling and rotting together but the sight of his sister's face was enough to dispel the nightmare and since she was living only that he might live he would live yes he would be happy in spite of himself so their lives were built on an ardent faith fashioned of stoicism religion and noble ambition all their endeavour was directed towards the one end olivier's success antoinette accepted every kind of work every humiliation that was offered her she went as a governess to houses where she was treated almost as a servant she had to take her pupils out for walks like a nurse wandering about the streets with them for hours together under pretext of teaching them german in her love for her brother and her pride she found pleasure even in such moral suffering and weariness 
she would return home worn out to look after olivier who was a day boarder at his school and only came home in the evening she would cook their dinner a wretched dinner on the gas stove or over a spirit lamp olivier had never any appetite and everything disgusted him and his gorge would rise at the food and she would have to force him to eat or cudgel her brains to invent some dish that would catch his fancy and poor antoinette was by no means a good cook and when she had taken a great deal of trouble she would have the mortification of hearing him declare that her cooking was uneatable it was only after moments of despair at her cooking stove those moments of silent despair which come to inexperienced young housekeepers and poison their lives and sometimes their sleep unknown to everybody that she began to understand it a little after dinner when she had washed up the dishes he would offer to help her but she would never let him she would take a motherly interest in her brother's work she would hear him his lessons read his exercises and even look up certain words in the dictionary for him always taking care not to ruffle up his sensitive little soul they would spend the evening at their one table at which they had both to eat and write he would do his homework she would sew or do some copying when he had gone to bed she would sit mending his clothes or doing some work of her own although they had difficulty in making both ends meet they were both agreed that every penny they could put by should be used in the first place to settle the debt which their mother owed to the poyers it was not that the poyers were importunate creditors they had given no sign of life they never gave a thought to the money which they counted as lost they thought themselves very lucky to have got rid of their undesirable relatives so cheaply but it hurt the pride and filial piety of the young jeunins to think that their mother should have owed anything to these people whom they despised they pinched and scraped they economized on their amusements on their clothes on their food in order to amass the two hundred francs an enormous sum for them antoinette would have liked to have done the saving by herself but when her brother found out what she was up to nothing could keep him from doing likewise they wore themselves out in the effort and were delighted when they could set aside a few sous a day in three years by screwing and scraping sou by sou they had succeeded in getting the sum together it was a great joy to them antoinette went to the poyers one evening she was coldly received for they thought she had come to ask for help they thought it advisable to take the initiative and reproached her for not letting them have any news of them and not having even told them of the death of her mother and not coming to them when she wanted help she cut them short calmly by telling them that she had no intention of incommoding them she had come merely to return the money which had been borrowed from them and she laid two banknotes on the table and asked for a receipt they changed their tone at once and pretended to be unwilling to accept it they were feeling for her that sudden affection which comes to the creditor for the debtor who after many years returns the loan which he had ceased to reckon upon they inquired where she was living with her brother and how they lived she did not reply asked once more for the receipt said that she was in a hurry bowed coldly and went away the poyers were horrified at the girl's ingratitude then when she was rid of that obsession antoinette went on with the same sparing existence but now it was entirely for her brother's sake only she concealed it more to prevent his knowing it she economized on her clothes and sometimes on her food to keep her brother well dressed and amused and to make his life pleasanter and gayer and to let him go every now and then to a concert or to the opera which was olivier's greatest joy he was unwilling to go without her but she would always make excuses for not going so that he should feel no remorse she would pretend that she was too tired and did not want to go out she would even go so far as to say that music bored her her fond quibbles would not deceive him but his boyish selfishness would be too strong for him he would go to the theatre once inside he would be filled with remorse and it would haunt him all through the piece and spoil his pleasure one sunday when she had packed him off to the chatelet concert he returned half an hour later and told antoinette that when he reached the st michel bridge he had not the heart to go any farther the concert did not interest him it hurt him too much to have any pleasure without her nothing was sweeter to antoinette although she was sorry that her brother should be deprived of his sunday entertainment because of her but olivier never regretted it when he saw the joy that lit up his sister's face as he came in a joy that she tried in vain to conceal he felt happier than the most lovely music in the world could ever have made him 
they spent the afternoon sitting together by the window he with a book in his hand she with her work hardly reading at all hardly sewing at all talking idly of things that interested neither of them never had they had so delightful a sunday they agreed that they would never go alone to a concert again they could never enjoy anything alone she managed secretly to save enough money to surprise and delight olivier with a hired piano which on the hire purchase system became their property at the end of a certain number of months the payments for it were a heavy burden for her to shoulder it often haunted her dreams and she ruined her health in screwing together the necessary money the folly as it was it did assure them both so much happiness music was their paradise in their hard life it filled an enormous place in their existence they steeped themselves in music so as to forget the rest of the world there was danger in it too music is one of the great modern dissolvents its languorous warmth like the heat of a stove or the enervating air of autumn excites the senses and destroys the will but it was a relaxation for a creature forced into excessive joyless activity as was antoinette the sunday concert was the only ray of light that shone through the week of unceasing toil they lived in the memory of the last concert in the eager anticipation of the next in those few hours spent outside paris and out of the vile weather after a long wait outside in the rain or the snow or the wind and the cold clinging together and trembling lest all the places should be taken they would pass into the theatre where they were lost in the throng and sit on dark uncomfortable benches they were crushed and suffering and often on the point of fainting from the heat and discomfort of it all but they were happy happy in their own and in each other's pleasure happy to feel coursing through their veins the flood of kindness light and strength that surged forth from the great souls of beethoven and wagner happy each of them to see the dear dear face light up the poor pale face worn by suffering and premature anxieties antoinette would feel so tired and as, as though loving arms were about her holding her to a motherly breast she would nestle in its softness and warmth and she would weep quietly olivier would press her hand no one noticed them in the dimness of the vast hall where they were not the only suffering souls taking refuge under the motherly wing of music antoinette had her religion to support her she was very pious and every day never missed saying her prayers fervently and at length and every sunday she never missed going to mass even in the injustice of her wretched life she could not help believing in the love of the divine friend who suffers with you and some day will console you even more than with god she was in close communion with the beloved dead and she used secretly to share all her trials with them but she was of an independent spirit and a clear intelligence she stood apart from her other catholics who did not regard her altogether favourably they thought her possessed of an evil spirit they were not far from regarding her as a freethinker or on the way to it because like the honest little french woman she was she had no intention of renouncing her own independent judgment she believed not from obedience like the base rabble but from love olivier no longer believed the slow disintegration of his faith which had set in during his first months in paris had ended in its complete destruction he had suffered cruelly for he was not of those who are strong enough or commonplace enough to dispense with faith and so he had passed through crises of mental agony but he was at heart a mystic and though he had lost his belief yet no ideas could be closer to his own than those of his sister they both lived in a religious atmosphere when they came home in the evening after the day's parting their little flat was to them a haven an inviolable refuge poor bitterly cold but pure how far removed they felt there from the noise and the corrupt thoughts of paris they never talked much of their doings for when one comes home tired one has hardly the heart to revive the memory of a painful day by the tale of its happenings instinctively they set themselves to forget it especially during the first hour when they met again for dinner they avoided questions of all kinds they would greet each other with their eyes and sometimes they would not speak a word all through the meal antoinette would look at her brother as he sat dreaming just as he used to do when he was a little boy she would gently touch his hand come she would say with a smile courage he would smile too and go on eating so dinner would pass without their trying to talk they were hungry for silence only when they had done would their tongues be loosed a little when they felt rested and when each of them in the comfort of the understanding love of the other had wiped out the impure traces of the day olivier would sit 
down at the piano antoinette was out of practice from letting him play always for it was the only relaxation that he had and he would give himself up to it wholeheartedly he had a fine temperament for music his feminine nature more suited to love than to action with loving sympathy could catch the thoughts of the musicians whose works he played and merge itself in them and with passion of fidelity render the finest shades at least within the limitations of his physical strength which gave out before the titanic effort of tristan or the later sonatas of beethoven he loved best to take refuge in mozart or gluck and theirs was the music that antoinette preferred sometimes she would sing too but only very simple songs old melodies she had a light mezzo voice plaintive and delicate she was so shy that she could never sing in company and hardly even before olivier her throat used to contract there was an air of beethoven set to some scotch words of which she was particularly fond faithful johnny it was calm so calm and with what a depth of tenderness it was like herself olivier could never hear her sing it without the tears coming into his eyes but she preferred listening to her brother she would hurry through her housework and leave the door of the kitchen open the better to hear olivier but in spite of all her care he would complain impatiently of the noise she made with her pots and pans then she would close the door and when she had finished she would come and sit in a low chair not near the piano for he could not bear any one near him when he was playing but near the fireplace and there she would sit curled up like a cat with her back to the piano and her eyes fixed on the golden eyes of the fire in which a lump of coal was smouldering and muse over her memories of the past when nine o'clock rang she would have to pull herself together to remind olivier that it was time to stop it would be hard to drag him and to drag herself away from dreams but olivier would still have some work to do and he must not go to bed too late he would not obey her at once he always needed a certain time in which to shake free of the music before he could apply himself seriously to his work his thoughts would be off wandering often it would be half-past nine before he could shake free of his misty dreams and toinette bending over her work at the other side of the table would know that he was doing nothing but she dared not look in his direction too often for fear of irritating him by seeming to be watching him he was at the ungrateful age the happy age when a boy saunters dreamily through his days he had a clear forehead girlish eyes deep and trustful often with dark circles round them a wide mouth with rather thick pouting lips a rather crooked smile vague absent taking he wore his hair long so that it hung down almost to his eyes and made a great bunch at the back of his neck while one rebellious lock stuck up at the back a neckerchief loosely tied round his neck his sister used to tie it carefully in a bow every morning a waistcoat which was always buttonless although she was forever sewing them on no cuffs large hands with bony wrists he had a heavy sleepy bantering expression and he was always wool gathering his eyes would blink and wander round antoinette's room his work-table was in her room they would light on the little iron bed above which hung an ivory crucifix with a sprig of box on the portraits of his father and mother on an old photograph of the little provincial town with its tower mirrored in its waters and when they reached his sister's pallid face bending in silence over her work he would be filled with an immense pity for her and his own indolence and he would work furiously to make up for lost time he spent his holidays in reading they would read together each with a separate book in spite of their love for each other they could not read aloud that hurt them as an offence against modesty a fine book was to them as a secret which should only be murmured in the silence of the heart when a passage delighted them instead of reading it aloud they would hand the book over with a finger marking the place and they would say read that then while the other was reading the one who had already read would with shining eyes gaze into the dear face to see what emotions were roused and to share the enjoyment of it but often with their books open in front of them they would not read they would talk especially towards the end of the evening they would feel the need of opening their hearts and they would have less difficulty in talking olivier had sad thoughts and in his weakness he had to rid himself of all that tortured him by pouring out his troubles to some one else he was a prey to doubt antoinette had to give him courage to defend him against himself it was an unceasing struggle which began anew each day olivier would say bitter gloomy things and when he had said them he would be relieved but he never troubled to think how they might hurt his sister only very late in the day did he see how he was exhausting her he was sapping her strength and infecting her with his own doubts antoinette never let it appear 
how she suffered she was by nature valiant and gay and she forced herself to maintain a show of gaiety even when that gracious quality was long since dead in her she had moments of utter weariness and revolt against the life of perpetual sacrifice to which she had pledged herself but she condemned such thoughts and would not analyze them they came to her in spite of herself and she would not accept them she found help in prayer except when her heart could not pray as sometimes happens when it was as it were withered and dry then she could only wait in silence feverish and ashamed for the return of grace olivier never had the least suspicion of the agony she suffered at such times antoinette would make some excuse and go away and lock herself in her room and she would not appear again until the crisis was over then she would be smiling sorrowful more tender than ever and as it were remorseful for having suffered their rooms were adjoining their beds were placed on either side of the same wall they could talk to each other through it in whispers and when they could not sleep they would tap gently on the wall to say are you asleep i can't sleep the partition was so thin that it was almost as though they shared the same room but the door between their rooms was always locked at night in obedience to an instinctive and profound modesty a sacred feeling it was only left open when olivier was ill as too often happened he did not gain in health rather he seemed to grow weaker he was always ailing throat chest head or heart if he caught the slightest cold there was always the danger of its turning to bronchitis he caught scarlatina and almost died of it but even when he was not ill he would betray strange symptoms of serious illnesses which fortunately did not come to anything he would have pains in his lungs or his heart one day the doctor who examined him diagnosed pericarditis or paranumonia and the great specialist who was then consulted confirmed his fears but it came to nothing it was his nerves that were wrong and it is common knowledge that disorders of the nerves take the most unaccountable shapes they are got rid of at the cost of days of anxiety but such days were terrible for antoinette and they gave her sleepless nights she would lie in a state of terror in her bed getting up every now and then to listen to her brother's breathing she would think that perhaps he was dying she would feel sure convinced of it she would get up trembling and clasp her hands and hold them fast against her lips to keep herself from crying out o oh god o oh god she would moan take him not from me not that not that you have no right not that o oh god i beg o oh mother mother come to my aid save him let him live she would lie at full stretch ah to die by the way when so much has been done when we were nearly there when he was going to be happy no that could not be it would be too cruel End of section twenty two Section twenty three of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canaan. Antoinette, Chapter One, Part Six it was not long before olivier gave her other reasons for anxiety he was profoundly honest like herself but he was weak of will and too open-minded and too complex not to be uneasy sceptical indulgent towards what he knew to be evil and attracted by pleasure antoinette was so pure that it was some time before she understood what was going on in her brother's mind she discovered it suddenly one day olivier thought she was out she usually had a lesson at that hour but at the last moment she had received word from her pupil telling her that she could not have her that day she was secretly pleased although it meant a few francs less than that week's earnings but she was very tired and she lay down on her bed she was very glad to be able to rest for once without reproaching herself olivier came in from school bringing another boy with him they sat down in the next room and began to talk she could hear everything they said they thought they were alone and did not restrain themselves antoinette smiled as she heard her brother's merry voice but soon she ceased to smile and her blood ran cold they were talking of dirty things with an abominable crudity of expression they seemed to revel in it she heard olivier her boy olivier laughing and from his lips which she had thought so innocent there came words so obscene that the horror of it chilled her keen anguish 
stabbed her to the heart it went on and on they could not stop talking and she could not help listening at last they went out and antoinette was left alone then she wept something had died in her the ideal image that she had fashioned of her brother of her boy was plastered with mud it was a mortal agony to her she did not say anything to him when they met again in the evening he saw that she had been weeping and he could not think why he could not understand why she had changed her manner towards him it was some time before she was able to recover herself but the worst blow of all for her was one evening when he did not come home she did not go to bed but sat up waiting for him it was not only her moral purity that was hurt her suffering went down to the most mysterious inner depths of her heart those same depths where there lurked the most awful feelings of the human heart feelings over which she cast a veil to hide them from her sight olivier's first aim had been the declaration of his independence he returned in the morning casting about for the proper attitude and quite prepared to fling some insolent remark at his sister if she had said anything to him he stole into the flat on tiptoe so as not to waken her but when he saw her standing there waiting for him pale red-eyed from weeping when he saw that instead of making any effort to reproach him she only set about silently cooking his breakfast before he left for school and that she had nothing to say to him but was overwhelmed so that she was in herself a living reproach he could hold out no longer he flung himself down before her buried his face in her lap and they both wept he was ashamed of himself sick at the thought of what he had done he felt degraded he tried to speak but she would not let him and laid her hand on his lips and he kissed her hand they said no more they understood each other olivier vowed that he would never again do anything to hurt antoinette and that he would be in all things what she wanted him to be but though she tried bravely she could not so easily forget so sharp a wound she recovered from it slowly there was a certain awkwardness between them her love for him was just the same but in her brother's soul she had seen something that was foreign to herself and she was fearful of it she was the more overwhelmed by the glimpse she had had into olivier's inmost heart in that about the same time she had to put up with the unwelcome attentions of certain men when she came home in the evening at nightfall and especially when she had to go out after dinner to take or fetch her copying she suffered agonies from her fear of being accosted and followed as sometimes happened and forced to listen to insulting advances she took her brother with her whenever she could under pretext of making him take a walk but he only consented grudgingly and she dared not insist she did not like to interrupt his work she was so provincial and so pure that she could not get used to such ways paris at night was to her like a dark forest in which she felt that she was being tracked by dreadful savage beasts and she was afraid to leave the house but she had to go out she would put off going out as long as possible she was always fearful and when she thought that her olivier would be was perhaps like one of those men who pursued her she could hardly hold out her hand to him when she came in he could not think what he had done to change her so and she was angry with herself she was not very pretty but she had charm and attracted attention though she did nothing to do so she was always very simply dressed almost always in black she was not very tall graceful frail-looking she rarely spoke she tripped quietly through the crowded streets avoiding attention which however she attracted in spite of herself by the sweetness of the expression of her tired eyes and her pure young lips sometimes she saw that she had attracted notice and though it put her to confusion she was pleased all the same who can say what gentle and chaste pleasure in itself there may be in so innocent a creature at feeling herself in sympathy with others all that she felt was shown in a slight awkwardness in her movements a timid sidelong glance and it was sweet to see and very touching and her uneasiness added to her attraction she excited interest and as she was a poor girl with none to protect her men did not hesitate to tell her so sometimes she used to go to the house of some rich jews the nathans who took an interest in her because they had met her at the house of some friends of theirs where she gave lessons and in spite of her shyness she had not been able to avoid accepting invitations to their parties monsieur alfred nathan was a well-known professor in paris a distinguished scientist and at the same time he was very fond of society with that strange mixture of learning and frivolity which is so common among the jews madame nathan was a mixture in equal proportions of real kindliness and excessive worldliness 
they were both generous with loud-voiced sincere but intermittent sympathy for antoinette generally speaking antoinette had found more kindness among the jews than among the members of her own sect they have many faults but they have one great quality perhaps the greatest of all they are alive and human nothing human is foreign to them they are interested in every living being even when they lack real warm sympathy they feel a perpetual curiosity which makes them seek out men and ideas that are of worth however different from themselves they may be not that generally speaking they do anything much to help them for they are interested in too many things at once and much more prey to the vanities of the world than other people while they pretend to be immune from them but at least they do something and that is saying a great deal in the present apathetic condition of society they are an active balm in society the very leaven of life antoinette who among the catholics had been brought sharp up against a wall of icy indifference was keenly alive to the worth of the interest however superficial it might be which the nathans took in her madame nathan had marked antoinette's life of devoted sacrifice she was sensible of her physical and moral charm and she made a show of taking her under her protection she had no children but she loved young people and often had gatherings of them in her house and she insisted on antoinette's coming also and breaking away from her solitude and having some amusement in her life and as she had no difficulty in guessing that antoinette's shyness was in part the result of her poverty she even went so far as to offer to give her a pretty frock or two which antoinette refused proudly but her kindly patron has found a way of forcing her to accept a few of those little presents which are so dear to a woman's innocent vanity antoinette was both grateful and embarrassed she forced herself to go to madame nathan's parties from time to time and being young she managed to enjoy herself in spite of everything but in that rather mixed society of all sorts of young people madame nathan's protege being poor and pretty became at once the mark of two or three young gentlemen who with perfect confidence in themselves picked her out for their attentions they calculated how far her timidity would go they even made bets about her one day she received certain anonymous letters or rather letters signed with a noble pseudonym which conveyed a declaration of love at first they were love letters flattering ardent appointing a rendezvous then they quickly became bolder threatening and soon insulting and basely slanderous they stripped her exposed her besmirched her with their coarse expressions of desire they tried to play upon antoinette's simplicity by making her fearful of a public insult if she did not go to the appointed rendezvous she wept bitterly at the thought of having called down on herself such base proposals and these insults scorched her pride she did not know what to do she did not like to speak to her brother about it she knew that he would feel it too keenly and that he would make the affair even more serious than it was she had no friends the police she would not do that for fear of scandal but somehow she had to make an end of it she felt that her silence would not sufficiently defend her that the blackguard who was pursuing her would hold to the chase and that he would go on until to go farther would be dangerous he had just sent her a sort of ultimatum commanding her to meet him next day at the luxembourg she went by racking her brain she had come to the conclusion that her persecutor must have met her at madame nathan's in one of his letters he had alluded to something which could only have happened there she begged madame nathan to do her a great favor and to drive her to the door of the gallery to wait for her outside she went in in front of the appointed picture her tormentor accosted her triumphantly and began to talk to her with affected politeness she stared straight at him without a word when he had finished his remark he asked her jokingly why she was staring at him she replied you are a coward he was not put out by such a trifle as that and became familiar in his manner she said you have tried to threaten me with a scandal very well i have come to give you your scandal you have asked for it she was trembling all over and she spoke in a loud voice to show him that she was quite equal to attracting attention to themselves people had already begun to watch them he felt that she would stick at nothing he lowered his voice she said once more for the last time you are a coward and turned her back on him not wishing to seem to have given in he followed her she left the gallery with the fellow following hard on her heels she walked straight to the carriage waiting there wrenched the door open and her pursuer found himself face to face with madame nathan who recognized him and greeted him by name his face fell and he bolted 
antoinette had to tell the whole story to her companion she was unwilling to do so and only hinted roughly at the facts it was painful to her to reveal to a stranger the intimate secrets of her life and the sufferings of her injured modesty madame nathan scolded her for not having told her before antoinette begged her not to tell anybody that was the end of it madame nathan did not even need to strike the fellow off her visiting list for he was careful not to appear again about the same time another sorrow of a very different kind came to antoinette at the nathan's she met a man of forty a very good fellow who was in the consular service in the far east and had come home on a few months leave he fell in love with her the meeting had been planned unknown to antoinette by madame nathan who had taken it into her head that she must find a husband for her little friend he was a jew he was not good-looking and he was no longer young he was rather bald and round-shouldered but he had kind eyes and affectionate way with him and he could feel for and understand suffering for he had suffered himself antoinette was no longer the romantic girl the spoiled child dreaming of life as a lovely day's walk on her lover's arm now she saw the hard struggle of life which began again every day allowing no time for rest or if rest were taken it might be to lose in one moment all the ground that had been gained inch by inch through years of striving and she thought it would be very sweet to be able to lean on the arm of a friend and share his sorrows with him and be able to close her eyes for a little while he watched over her she knew that it was a dream but she had not the courage to renounce her dream altogether in her heart she knew quite well that a dowerless girl had nothing to hope for in the world in which she lived the old french middle classes are known throughout the world for the spirit of sordid interest in which they conduct their marriages the jews are far less grasping with money among the jews it is no uncommon thing for a rich young man to choose a poor girl or a young woman of fortune to set herself passionately to win a man of intellect but in the french middle classes catholic and provincial in their outlook almost always money woos money and to what end poor wretches they have none but dull commonplace desires they can do nothing but eat yawn sleep save antoinette knew them she had observed their ways from her childhood on she had seen them with the eyes of wealth and the eyes of poverty she had no illusions left about them nor about the treatment she had to expect from them and so the attentions of this man who had asked her to marry him came as an unhoped-for treasure in her life at first she did not think of him as a lover but gradually she was filled with gratitude and tenderness towards him she would have accepted his proposal if it had not meant following him to the colonies and consequently leaving her brother she refused and though her lover understood the magnanimity of her reason for doing so he could not forgive her love is so selfish that the lover will not hear of being sacrificed even to those virtues which are dearest to him in the beloved he gave up seeing her when he went away he never wrote she had no news of him at all until five or six months later she received a printed intimation addressed in his hand that he had married another woman antoinette felt it deeply she was broken-hearted and she offered up her suffering to god she tried to persuade herself that she was justly punished for having for one moment lost sight of her one duty to devote herself to her brother and she grew more and more wrapped up in it she withdrew from the world altogether she even dropped going to the nathans for they were a little cold towards her after she refused the marriage which they had arranged for her they too refused to see any justification for her madame nathan had decided that the marriage should take place and her vanity was hurt at its missing fire through antoinette's fault she thought her scruples certainly quite praiseworthy but exaggerated and sentimental and thereafter she lost interest in the silly little goose it was necessary for her always to be helping people with or without their consent and she quickly found another protege to absorb for the time being all the interest and devotion which she had to expend olivier knew nothing of his sister's sad little romance he was a sentimental irresponsible boy living in his dreams and fancies it was impossible to depend on him in spite of his intelligence and charm and his very real tender-heartedness often he would fling away the results of months of work by his irresponsibility or in a fit of discouragement or by some boyish freak or some fancied love affair in which he would waste all his time and energy he would fall in love with a pretty face that he had seen once with coquettish little girls whom perhaps he once met out somewhere though they never paid any attention to him he would be infatuated with something he had read a poet or a musician he would steep himself in their works for months together to the exclusion of everything else and the detriment of his studies he had to be watched always though great care had to be taken that he did not know it for he was easily wounded 
there was always a danger of a seizure he had the feverish excitement the want of balance the uneasy trepidation that are often found in those who have a consumptive tendency the doctor had not concealed the danger from antoinette the sickly plant transplanted from the provinces to paris needed fresh air and light antoinette could not provide them they had not enough money to be able to go away from paris during the holidays all the rest of their year every day in the week was full and on sundays they were so tired that they never wanted to go out except to a concert there were sundays in the summer when antoinette would make an effort and drag olivier off to the woods outside paris near chaville or st cloud but the woods were full of noisy couples singing music-hall songs and littering the place with greasy bits of paper they did not find the divine solitude which purifies and gives rest and in the evening when they turned homewards they had to suffer the roar and clatter of the trains the dirty crowded low narrow dark carriages of the suburban lines the coarseness of certain things they saw the noisy singing shouting smelly people and the reek of tobacco smoke neither antoinette nor olivier could understand the people and they would return home disgusted and demoralized olivier would beg antoinette not to go for sunday walks again and for some time antoinette would not have the heart to go again and then she would insist though it was even more disagreeable to her than to olivier but she thought it necessary for her brother's health she would force him to go out once more but their new experience would be no better than the last and olivier would protest bitterly so they stayed shut up in the stifling town and in their prison yard they sighed for the open fields end of section twenty three section twenty four of jean christophe in paris this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org jean christophe in paris by romain roland translated by gilbert cannon antoinette chapter one part seven olivier had reached the end of his school days the examinations for the ecole normale were over it was quite time antoinette was very tired she was counting on his success her brother had everything in his favour at school he was regarded as one of the best pupils and all his masters were agreed in praising his industry and intelligence except for a certain want of mental discipline which made it difficult for him to bend to any sort of plan but the responsibility of it weighed on olivier so heavily that he lost his head as the examination came near he was worn out and paralyzed by the fear of failure and a morbid shyness that crept over him he trembled at the thought of appearing before the examiners in public he had always suffered from shyness in class he would blush and choke when he had to speak at first he could hardly do more than answer his name and it was much more easy for him to reply impromptu than when he knew that he was going to be questioned the thought of it made him ill his mind rushed ahead picturing every detail of the ordeal as it would happen and the longer he had to wait the more he was obsessed by it it might be said that he passed every examination at least twice for he passed it in his dreams on the night before and expended all his energy so that he had none left for the real examination but he did not even reach the viva voce the very thought of which had sent him into a cold sweat the night before in the written examination on a philosophical subject which at any ordinary time would have sent him flying off he could not even manage to squeeze out a couple of pages in six hours for the first few hours his brain was empty he could think of nothing nothing it was like a blank wall against which he hurled himself in vain then an hour before the end the wall was rent and a few rays of light shone through the crevices he wrote an excellent short essay but it was not enough to place him when antoinette saw the despair on his face as he came out she foresaw the inevitable blow and she was as despairing as he but she did not show it even in the most desperate situation she had always an inexhaustible capacity for hope 
olivier was rejected he was crushed by it antoinette pretended to smile as though it were nothing of any importance but her lips trembled she consoled her brother and told him that it was an easily remedied misfortune and that he would be certain to pass next year and win a better place she did not tell him how vital it was to her that he should have passed that year or how utterly worn out she felt in soul and body or how uneasy she felt about fighting through another year like that but she had to go on if she were to go away before olivier had passed he would never have the courage to go on fighting alone he would succumb she concealed her weariness from him and even redoubled her efforts she wore herself to skin and bone to let him have amusement and change during the holidays so that he might resume work with greater energy and confidence but at the very outset her small savings had to be broken into and to make matters worse she lost some of her most profitable pupils another year within sight of the final ordeal they were almost at breaking point above all they had to live and discover some other means of scraping along antoinette accepted a situation as a governess in germany which had been offered her through the nathans it was the very last thing she would have thought of but nothing else offered at the time and she could not wait she had never left her brother for a single day during the last six years and she could not imagine what life would be like without seeing and hearing him from day to day olivier was terrified when he thought of it but he dared not say anything it was he who had brought it about if he had passed antoinette would not have been reduced to such an extremity he had no right to say anything or to take into account his own grief at the parting it was for her to decide they spent the last days together in dumb anguish as though one of them were about to die they hid away from each other when their sorrow was too much for them antoinette gazed into olivier's eyes for counsel if he had said it to her don't go she would have stayed although she had to go up to the very last moment in the cab in which they drove to the station she was prepared to break her resolution she felt that she could never go through with it at a word from him one word but he said nothing like her he set his teeth and would not budge she made a promise to write to her every day and to conceal nothing from her and to send for her if he were ever in the least danger they parted while olivier returned with a heavy heart to his school where it had been agreed that he should board the train carried antoinette crushed and sorrowful towards germany lying awake and staring through the night they felt the minutes dragging them farther and farther apart and they called to each other in whispering voices antoinette was fearful of the new world to which she was going she had changed much in six years she had once been so bold and afraid of nothing had grown so used to silence and isolation that it hurt her to go out into the world again the laughing gay chattering antoinette of the old happy times had passed away with them unhappiness had made her sensitive and shy no doubt living with olivier had infected her with this timidity she had had hardly anybody to talk to except her brother she was scared by the least little thing and was really in a panic when she had to pay a call and so it was a nervous torture to her to think that she was now going to live among strangers and to have to talk to them to be always with them the poor girl had no more real vocation for teaching than her brother she did her work conscientiously but her heart was not in it and she had not the support of feeling that there was any use in it she was made to love and not to teach and no one cared for her love nowhere was her capacity for love less in demand than in her new situation in germany the gruner bombs whose children she was engaged to teach french took not the slightest interest in her they were haughty and familiar indifferent and indiscreet they paid fairly well and as a result they regarded everybody in their payment as being under an obligation to them and thought they could do just as they liked they treated antoinette as a superior sort of servant and allowed her hardly any liberty she did not even have a room to herself she slept in a room adjoining that of the children and had to leave the door open all night she was never alone they had no respect for her need of taking refuge every now and then within herself the sacred right of every human being to preserve an inner sanctuary of solitude the only happiness she had lay in correspondence and communion with her brother she made use of every moment of liberty she could snatch but even that was encroached upon as soon as she began to write they would prowl about in her room and ask her what she was writing when she was reading a letter they would ask her what was in it by their persistent impertinent curiosity they found out about her little brother she had to hide from them too shameful sometimes were the expedients to which she had to resort and the holes and crannies in which she had to hide in order to be able to read olivier's letters unobserved 
if she left a letter lying in her room she was sure it would be read and as she had nothing she could lock except her box she had to carry any papers she did not want to have read about with her they were always prying into her business and her intimate affairs and they were always fishing for her secret thoughts it was not that the grunebaums were really interested in her only they thought that as they paid her she was their property they were not malicious about it indiscretion was with them an incurable habit they were never offended with each other nothing could have been more intolerable to antoinette than such espionage such a lack of moral modesty which made it impossible for her to escape even for an hour a day from their curiosity the grunenbaums were hurt by the haughty reserve with which she treated them naturally they found highly moral reasons to justify their vulgar curiosity and to condemn antoinette's desire to be immune from it it was their duty they thought to know the private life of a girl living under their roof as a member of their household to whom they had entrusted the education of their children they were responsible for her that is the sort of thing that so many mistresses say of their servants mistresses whose responsibility does not go so far as to spare the unhappy girls any fatigue or work that must revolt them but is entirely limited to denying them every sort of pleasure and that antoinette should refuse to acknowledge that duty imposed on them by conscience could only show they concluded that she was conscious of being not altogether beyond reproach an honest girl has nothing to conceal so antoinette lived under a perpetual persecution against which she was always on her guard so that it made her seem even more cold and reserved than she was every day her brother wrote her a twelve-page letter and she contrived to write to him every day even if it were only a few lines olivier tried hard to be brave and not to show his grief too clearly but he was bored and dull his life had always been so bound up with his sisters that now that she was torn from him he seemed to have lost part of himself he could not use his arms or his legs or his brains he could not walk or play the piano or work or do anything not even dream except through her he slaved away at his books from morning to night but it was no good his thoughts were elsewhere he would be suffering or thinking of her or of the morrow's letter he would sit staring at the clock waiting for the day's letter and when it arrived his fingers would tremble with joy with fear too as he tore open the envelope never did lover tremble with more tenderness and anxiety at a letter from his mistress he would hide away like antoinette to read his letters he would carry them about with him and at night he always had the last letter under his pillow and he would touch it from time to time to make sure that it was still there during the long sleepless nights when he lay awake dreaming of his dear sister how far removed from her he felt he felt that most dreadfully when antoinette's letters were delayed by the post and came a day late two days two nights between them he exaggerated the time and the distance because he had never travelled his imagination would take fire heavens if she were to fall ill there would be time for her to die before he could see her why had she not written to him just a line or two the day before was she ill yes she was surely ill he would choke more often still he would be terrified of dying away from her dying alone among people who did not care in the horrible school in grim grey paris he would make himself ill with the thought of it should he write and tell her to come back but then he would be ashamed of his cowardice besides as soon as he began to write to her it gave him such joy to be in communion with her that for a moment he would forget his suffering it seemed to him that he could see her hear her voice he would tell her everything never had he spoken to her so intimately so passionately when they had been together he would call her my true brave dear kind beloved little sister and say i love you so indeed they were real love letters their tenderness was sweet and comforting to antoinette they were all the air she had to breathe if they did not come in the morning at the usual time she would be miserable once or twice it happened that the gruna bounds from carelessness or who knows from a wicked desire to tease forgot to give them to her until the evening and once even until the next morning and she worked herself into a fever on new year's day they had the same idea without telling each other they planned a surprise and each sent a long telegram at vast expense and their messages arrived at the same time olivier always consulted antoinette about his work and his troubles antoinette gave him advice and encouragement and fortified him with her strength though indeed she had not really enough for herself she was stifled in the foreign country where she knew nobody and nobody was interested in her except the wife of a professor lately come to the town who also felt out of her element the good creature was kind and motherly and sympathetic with the brother and sister who loved each other so and had to live apart 
for she had dragged part of her story out of antoinette but she was so noisy so commonplace she was so lacking though quite innocently intact in discretion that aristocratic little antoinette was irritated and drew back she had no one in whom she could confide and so all her troubles were pent up and weighed heavily upon her sometimes she thought she must give way under them but she set her teeth and struggled on her health suffered she grew very thin her brother's letters became more and more downhearted in a fit of depression he wrote come back come back come back we had hurriedly sent the letter off then he was ashamed of it and wrote another begging antoinette to tear up the first and give no further thought to it he even pretended to be in good spirits and not to be wanting his sister it hurt his umbrageous vanity to think that he might seem incapable of doing without her antoinette was not deceived she read his every thought but she did not know what to do one day she almost went to him she went to the station to find out what time the train left for paris and then she said to herself that it was madness the money she was earning was enough to pay for olivier's board they must hold on as long as they could she was not strong enough to make up her mind in the morning her courage would spring forth again but as the day dragged towards evening her strength would fail her and she would think of flying to him she was homesick longing for the country that had treated her so hardly the country that enshrined all the relics of her past life and she was aching to hear the language that her brother spoke the language in which she told her love for him then it was that a company of french actors passed through the little german town antoinette who rarely visited the theatre she had neither time nor taste for it was seized with an irresistible longing to hear her own language spoken to take refuge in france the rest is known there were no seats left in the theatre she met the young musician jean christophe whom she did not know and he seeing her disappointment offered to share with her a box which she had to give away in her confusion she accepted her presence with christophe set tongues wagging in the little town and the malicious rumours came at once to the ears of the grunebaums who being already inclined to believe anything ill of the young frenchwoman and furious with christophe as a result of certain events which have been narrated elsewhere dismissed antoinette without more ado she who was so chaste and modest she whose whole life had been absorbed by her love for her brother and never yet had been besmirched with one thought of evil nearly died of shame when she understood the nature of the charge against her not for one moment was she resentful against christophe she knew that he was as innocent as she and that if he had injured her he had meant only to be kind she was grateful to him she knew nothing of him save that he was a musician and that he was much maligned but in her ignorance of life and men she had a natural intuition about people which unhappiness had sharpened and in her queer boorish companion she had recognized a quality of candour equal to her own and a sturdy kindness the mere memory of which was comforting and good to think on the evil she had heard of him did not at all affect the confidence which christophe had inspired in her being herself a victim she had no doubt that he was in the same plight suffering as she did though for a longer time from the malevolence of the townspeople who insulted him and as she always forgot herself in the thought of others the idea of what christophe must have suffered distracted her mind a little from her own torment nothing in the world could have induced her to try to see him again or to write to him her modesty and pride forbade it she told herself that he did not know the harm he had done and in her gentleness she hoped that he would never know it she left germany an hour away from the town it chanced that the train in which she was travelling passed the train by which christophe was returning from a neighbouring town where he had been spending the day for a few minutes their carriages stopped opposite each other and in the silence of the night they saw each other but did not speak what could they have said save a few trivial words that would have been a profanation of the indefinable feeling of common pity and mysterious sympathy which had sprung up in them and was based on nothing save the sureness of their inward vision during those last moments when still strangers they gazed into each other's eyes they saw in each other things which never had appeared to any other soul among the people with whom they lived everything must pass the memory of words kisses passionate embraces but the contact of souls which have once met and hailed each other and the throng of passing shapes that never can be blotted out antoinette bore it with her in the innermost recesses of her heart that poor heart so swathed about with sorrow and sad thoughts from out the midst of which there smiled a misty light which seemed to steal sweetly from the earth a pale and tender light like that which floods the elysian shades of gluck end of section twenty four section twenty five of jean christophe in paris this is a 
librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org jean christophe in paris by romain roland translated by gilbert cannon antoinette chapter one part eight she returned to olivier it was high time she returned to him he had just fallen ill and the poor nervous unhappy little creature who trembled at the thought of illness before it came now that he was really ill refused to write to his sister for fear of upsetting her but he called to her prayed for her coming as for a miracle when the miracle happened he was lying in the school infirmary feverish and wandering when he saw her he made no sound how often had he seen her enter in his fevered fancy he sat up in bed gaping and trembling lest it should be once more only an illusion and when she sat down on the bed by his side when she took him in her arms and he had taken her in his when he felt her soft cheek against his lips and her hands still cold from travelling by night in his when he was quite quite sure that it was his dear sister who began to weep he could do nothing else he was still the little crybaby that he had been when he was a child he clung to her and held her close for fear she should go away from him again how changed they were how sad they looked no matter they were together once more everything was lit up the infirmary the school the gloomy day they clung to each other they would never let each other go before she had said a word he made her swear that she would not go away again he had no need to make her swear no she would never go away again they had been too unhappy away from each other their mother was right anything was better than being parted even poverty even death so only they were together they took rooms they wanted to take their old little flat horrible though it was but it was occupied their new rooms also looked out on to a yard but above a wall they could see the top of a little acacia and grew fond of it at once as a friend from the country a prisoner like themselves in the paved wilderness of the city olivier quickly recovered his health or rather what he was pleased to call his health for what was health to him would have been illness to a stronger boy antoinette's unhappy stay in germany had helped her to save a little money and she made some more by the translation of a german book which a publisher accepted for a time then they were free of financial anxiety and all would be well if olivier passed his examination at the end of the year but if he did not pass no sooner had they settled down to the happiness of being together again than they were once more obsessed by the prospect of the examination they tried hard not to think about it but in vain they were always coming back to it the fixed idea haunted them even when they were seeking distraction from their thoughts at concerts it would suddenly leap out at them in the middle of the performance at night when they woke up it would lie there like a yawning gulf before them in addition to his eagerness to please his sister and repay her for the sacrifice of her youth that she had made for his sake olivier lived in terror of his military service which he could not escape if he were rejected at that time admission to the great schools was still admitted as an exemption from service he had an invincible disgust for the physical and moral promiscuity the kind of intellectual degradation which rightly or wrongly he saw in barrack life every pure and aristocratic quality in him revolted from such compulsion and it seemed to him that death would be preferable in these days it is permitted to make light of such feelings and even to decry them in the name of a social morality which for the moment has become a religion but they are blind who deny it there is no more profound suffering than that of the violation of moral solitude by the coarse liberal communism of the present day the examinations began olivier was almost incapable of going in he was unwell and he was so fearful of the torment he would have to undergo whether he passed or not that he almost 
longed to be taken seriously ill he did quite well in the written examination but he had a cruel time waiting to hear the results following the immemorial custom of the country of revolutions which is the worst country in the world for red tape and routine the examinations were held in july during the hottest days of the year as though it were deliberately intended to finish off the luckless candidates who were already staggering under the weight of cramming a monstrance list of subjects of which even the examiners did not know a tenth part the written examinations were held on the day after the holiday of the fourteenth july when the whole city was upside down and making merry to the undoing of the young men who were by no means inclined to be merry and asked for nothing but silence in the square outside the house booths were set up rifles cracked at the miniature ranges merry-go-rounds creaked and grunted and hideous steam organs roared from morning till night the idiotic noise went on for a week then a president of the republic by way of maintaining his popularity granted the rowdy merrymakers another three days holiday it cost him nothing he did not hear the row but olivier and antoinette were distracted and appalled by the noise and had to keep their windows shut so that their rooms were stifling and stopped their ears trying vainly to escape the shrill insistent idiotic tunes which were ground out from morning till night and stabbed through their brains like daggers so that they were reduced to a pitiful condition the viva voce examination began immediately after the publication of the first results olivier begged antoinette not to go she waited at the door much more anxious than he of course he never told her what he thought of his performance he tormented her by telling her what he had said and what he had not said at last the final results were published the names of the candidates were posted in the courtyard of the sorbonne antoinette would not let olivier go alone as they left the house they thought though they did not say it that when they came back they would know and perhaps they would regret their present fears when at least there was still hope when they came in sight of the sorbonne they felt their legs give way under them brave little antoinette said to her brother please not so fast olivier looked at his sister and she forced a smile he said shall we sit down for a moment on the seat here he would gladly have gone no further but after a moment she pressed his hand and said it's nothing dear let us go on they could not find the list at first they read several others in which the name of jeannin did not appear when at last they saw it they did not take it in at first they read it several times and could not believe it then when they were quite sure that it was true that jeannin was olivier that jeannin had passed they could say nothing they hurried home she took his arm and held his wrist and leaned her weight on him they almost ran and saw nothing of what was going on about them as they crossed the boulevard they were almost run over they said over and over again dear darling dear dear they tore upstairs to their rooms and then they flung their arms round each other antoinette took her brother's hand and led him to the photographs of their father and mother which hung on the wall near her bed in a corner of her room which was a sort of sanctuary to her they knelt down before them and with tears in their eyes they prayed antoinette ordered a jolly little dinner but they could not eat a morsel they were not hungry they spent the evening olivier kneeling by his sister's side while she petted him like a child they hardly spoke at all they could not even be happy for they were too worn out they went to bed before nine o'clock and slept the sleep of the just next day antoinette had a frightful headache but there was such a load taken from her heart olivier felt for the first time in his life that he could breathe freely he was saved she was saved she had accomplished her task and he had shown himself to be not unworthy of his sister's expectations for the first time for years and years they allowed themselves a little laziness they stayed in bed till twelve talking through the wall with the door between their rooms open when they looked in the mirror they saw their faces happy and tired looking they smiled and threw kisses to each other and dozed off again and watched each other sleep and lay weary and worn with hardly the strength to do more than mutter tender little scraps of words antoinette had always put by a little money sou by sou so as to have some small reserve in case of illness she did not tell her brother the surprise she had in store for him the day after his success she told him that they were going to spend a month in switzerland to make up for all their years of trouble and hardship 
now that olivier was assured of three years at the ecole normale at the expense of the state and then when he left the ecole of finding a post they could be extravagant and spend all their savings olivier shouted for joy when she told him antoinette was even more happy than he happy in her brother's happiness happy to think that she was going to see the country once more she had so longed for it it took them some time to get ready for the journey but the work of preparation was an unending joy it was well on in august when they set out they were not used to travelling olivier did not sleep the night before and he did not sleep in the train the whole day they had been fearful of missing the train they were in a feverish hurry they had been jostled about at the station and finally huddled into a second-class carriage where they could not even lean back to go to sleep that is one of the privileges of which the eminently democratic french companies deprive poor travellers so that rich travellers may have the pleasure of thinking that they have a monopoly of it olivier did not sleep a wink he was not sure that they were in the right train and he looked out for the name of every station antoinette slept lightly and woke up very frequently the jolting of the train made her head bob olivier watched her by the light of the funereal lamp which shone at the top of the moving sarcophagus and he was suddenly struck by the change in her face her eyes were hollow her childish lips were half open from sheer weariness her skin was sallow and there were little wrinkles on her cheeks the marks of the sad years of sorrow and disillusion she looked old and ill and indeed she was so tired if she had dared she would have postponed their journey but she did not like to spoil her brother's pleasure she tried to persuade herself that she was only tired and that the country would make her well again she was fearful lest she should fall ill on the way she felt that he was looking at her and she suddenly flung off the drowsiness that was creeping over her and opened her eyes eyes still young still clear and limpid across which from time to time there passed an involuntary look of pain like shadows on a little lake he asked her in a whisper anxiously and tenderly how she was she pressed his hand and assured him that she was well a word of love revived her then when the rosy dawn tinged the pale country between dole and pontalier the sight of the waking fields and the gay sun rising from the earth the sun who like themselves had escaped from the prison of the streets and the grimy houses and the thick smoke of paris the waving fields wrapped in the light mist of their milk-white breath the little things they passed a little village belfry a glimpse of a winding stream a blue line of hills hovering on the far horizon the tinkling moving sound of the angelus borne from afar on the wind when the train stopped in the midst of the sleeping country the solemn shapes of a herd of cows browsing on a slope above the railway all absorbed antoinette and her brother to whom it all seemed new they were like parched trees drinking in ecstasy the rain from heaven then in the early morning they reached the swiss customs where they had to get out a little station in a bare countryside they were almost worn out by their sleepless night in the cold dewy freshness of the dawn made them shiver but it was calm and the sky was clear and the fragrant air of the fields was about them upon their lips on their tongues down their throats flowing down into their lungs like a cooling stream and they stood by a table out in the open air and drank comforting hot coffee with creamy milk heavenly sweet and tasting of the grass and the flowers of the fields they climbed up into the swiss carriage the novel arrangement of which gave them a childish pleasure but antoinette was so tired she could not understand why she should feel so ill why was everything about her so beautiful so absorbing when she could take so little pleasure in it was it not all just what she had been dreaming for years a journey with her brother with all anxiety for the future left behind dear mother nature what was the matter with her she was annoyed with herself and forced herself to admire and share her brother's naive delight they stopped at tun they were to go up into the mountains next day but that night in the hotel antoinette was stricken with a fever and violent illness and pains in her head olivia was at his wit's ends and spent a night of frightful anxiety he had to send for a doctor in the morning an unforeseen expense which was no light tax on their slender purse the doctor could find nothing immediately serious but said that she was run down and that her constitution was undermined there could be no question of their going on the doctor forbade antoinette to get up all day and he thought they would perhaps have to stay at tun for some time 
they were very downcast though very glad to have got off so cheaply after all their fears but it was hard to have come so far to be shut up in a nasty hotel room into which the sunlight poured so that it was like a hot-house antoinette insisted on her brother going out he went a few yards from the hotel saw the beautiful green a r and hovering in the distance against the sky a white peak he bubbled over with joy but he could not keep it to himself he rushed back to his sister's room and told her excitedly what he had just seen and when she expressed her surprise at his coming back so soon and made him promise to go out again he said as once before he had said when he came back from the chatelet concert no no it is too beautiful it hurts me to see it without you that feeling was not new to them they knew that they had to be together to enjoy anything holy but they always loved to hear it said his tender words did antoinette more good than any medicine she smiled now languidly happily and after a good night although it was not very wise to go on so soon she decided that they would get away very early without telling the doctor who would only want to keep them back the pure air and the joy of seeing so much beauty made her stronger so that she did not have to pay for her rashness and without any further misadventure they reached the end of their journey a mountain village high above the lake some distance away from Speets there they spent three or four weeks in a little hotel antoinette did not have any further attack of fever but she never got really well she still felt a heaviness and intolerable weight in her head and she was always unwell olivier often asked her about her health he longed to see her grow less pale but he was intoxicated by the beauty of the country and instinctively avoided all melancholy thoughts when she assured him that she was really quite well he tried to believe that it was true although he knew perfectly well that it was not so and she enjoyed to the full her brother's exuberance and the fine air and the all-pervading peace how good was it to rest at last after those terrible years olivier tried to induce her to go for walks with him she would have been happy to join him but on several occasions when she had bravely set out she had been forced to stop after twenty minutes to regain her breath and rest her heart so he went out alone climbing the safe peaks though they filled her with terror until he came home again or they would go for little walks together she would lean on his arm and walk slowly and they would talk and he would suddenly begin to chatter and laugh and discuss his plans and make quips and jests from the road on the hillside above the valley they would watch the white clouds reflected in the still lake and the boats moving like insects on the surface of a pond they would drink in the warm air and the music of the goat bells borne on the gusty wind and the smell of the new mown hay and the warm resin and they would dream together of the past and the future and the present which seemed to them to be the most unreal and intoxicating of dreams sometimes antoinette would be in with her brother's jolly childlike humour they would chase each other and roll about on the grass and one day he saw her laughing as she used to do when they were children madly carelessly laughter clear and bubbling as a spring such as he had not heard for many years but most often olivier could not resist the pleasure of going for long walks he would be sorry for it at once and later he had bitterly to regret that he had not made enough of those dear days with his sister even in the hotel he would often leave her alone there was a party of young men and girls in the hotel from whom they had at first kept apart then olivier was attracted by them and shyly joined their circle he had been starved of friendship outside his sister he had hardly known any one but his rough schoolfellows and their girls who repelled him it was very sweet to him to be among well-mannered charming merry boys and girls of his own age although he was very shy he was naively curious sentimental and affectionate and easily bewitched by the little burning flickering fires that shine in a woman's eyes and in spite of his shyness women liked him his frank longing to love and be loved gave him unknown to himself a youthful charm and made him find words and gestures and affectionate little attentions the very awkwardness of which made them all the more attractive he had the gift of sympathy although in his isolation his intelligence had taken on an ironical tinge which made him see the vulgarity of people and their defects which he often loathed yet in their presence he saw nothing but their eyes in which he would see the expression of a living being who one day would die a being who had only one life even as he and even as he would lose it all too soon then of that creature he would involuntarily be fond in that moment nothing in the world could make him do anything to her 
hurt whether he liked it or not he had to be kind and amiable he was weak and in being so he was sure to please the world which pardons every vice and even every virtue except one force on which all the rest depend antoinette did not join them her health her tiredness her apparently causeless moral collapse paralyzed her through the long years of anxiety and ceaseless toil exhausting body and soul the positions of the brother and sister had been inverted now it was she who felt far removed from the world far from everything and everybody so far she could not break down the wall between them all their chatter their noise their laughter their little interests bored her wearied her almost hurt her it hurt her to be so she would have loved to go with the other girls to share their interests and laugh with them but she could not her heart ached she seemed to be as one dead in the evening she would shut herself up in her room and often she would not even turn on the light she would sit there in the dark while downstairs olivier would be amusing himself surrendering to the current of one of those romantic little love affairs to which he so easily succumbed she would only shake off her torpor when she heard him coming upstairs laughing and talking to the girls hanging about saying good-night outside their rooms being unable to tear himself away then in the darkness antoinette would smile and get up to turn on the light the sound of her brother's laughter revived her autumn was setting in the sun was dying down nature was aweary under the thick mists and clouds of october the colours were fading fast snow fell on the mountains mists descended upon the plains the visitors went away one by one and then several at a time and it was sad to see even the friends of a little while going away but sadder still to see the passing of the summer the time of peace and happiness which had been an oasis in their lives they went for a last walk together on a cloudy autumn day through the forest on the mountain side they did not speak they mused sadly as they walked along with the collars of their cloaks turned up clinging close together their hands were locked there was silence in the wet woods and in silence the trees wept from the depths there came the sweet plaintive cry of a solitary bird who felt the coming of winter through the mist came the clear tinkling of the goat bells far away so faint they could hardly hear it so faint it was as though it came up from their inmost hearts they returned to paris they were both sad antoinette was no better End of section twenty five Section twenty six of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Cannon. Antoinette, chapter one part nine they had set to work to prepare olivier's wardrobe for the ecole antoinette spent the last of her little store of money and even sold some of her jewels what did it matter he would repay her later on and then she would need so little when he was gone from her she tried not to think of what it would be like when he was gone she worked away at his clothes and put into the work all the tenderness she had for her brother and she had a presentiment that it would be the last thing she would do for him during the last days together they were never apart they were fearful of wasting the tiniest moment on their last evening they sat up very late by the fireside antoinette occupying the only armchair and olivier a stool at her feet and she made a fuss of him like the spoiled child he was he was dreading though he was curious about it too the new life upon which he was to enter antoinette thought only that it was the end of their dear life together and wondered fearfully what would become of her as though he were trying to make the thought even more bitter for her he was more tender than ever he had been with the innocent instinctive coquetry of those who always wait until they are just going to show themselves at their best and most charming he went to the piano and played her their favourite passages from mozart and gluck those visions of tender happiness and serene sorrow with which so much of their past life was bound up when the time came for them to part 
antoinette accompanied olivier as far as the gates of the ecole then she returned once more she was alone but now it was not as when she had gone away to germany a separation which she could bring to an end at will when she could bear it no longer how it was she who remained behind he who went away it was he who had gone away for a long long time perhaps for life and yet her love for him was so maternal that at first she thought less of herself than of him she thought only of how different the first few days would be for him of the strict rules of the ecole and was preoccupied with those harmless little worries which so easily assume alarming proportions in the minds of people who live alone and are always tormenting themselves about those whom they love her anxiety did at least have this advantage that it distracted her thoughts from her own loneliness she had already begun to think of the half-hour when she would be able to see him next day in the visitor's room she arrived a quarter of an hour too soon he was very nice to her but he was altogether taken up with all the new things he had seen and during the following days when she went to see him full of the most tender anxiety the contrast between what those meetings meant for her and what they meant for him was more and more marked for her they were her whole life for olivier no doubt he loved antoinette dearly but it was too much to expect him to think only of her as she thought of him once or twice he came down late to the visitor's room one day when she asked him if he were at all unhappy he said that he was nothing of the kind such little things as that stabbed antoinette to the heart she was angry with herself for being so sensitive and accused herself of selfishness she knew quite well that it would be absurd even wrong and unnatural for him to be unable to do without her and for her to be unable to do without him and to have no other object in life yes she knew all that but what was the good of her knowing it she could not help it if for the past ten years her whole life had been bound up in that one idea her brother now that the one interest of her life had been torn from her she had nothing left she tried bravely to keep herself occupied and to take up her music and read her beloved books but alas how empty were shakespeare and beethoven without olivier yes no doubt they were beautiful but olivier was not there what is the good of beautiful things if the eyes of the beloved are not there to see them what is the use of beauty what is the use even of joy if they cannot be won through the heart of the beloved if she had been stronger she would have tried to build up her life anew and give it another object but she was at the end of her tether now that there was nothing to force her to hold on at all costs the effort of will to which she had subjected herself snapped she collapsed the illness which had been gaining grip on her for over a year during which she had fought it down by force of will was now left to take its course she spent her evenings alone in her room by the spent fire a prey to her thoughts she had neither the courage to light the fire again nor the strength to go to bed she would sit there far into the night dozing dreaming shivering she would live through her life again and summon up the beloved dead and her lost illusions and she would be terribly sad at the thought of her lost youth without love or hope of love a dumb aching sorrow obscure unconfessed a child laughed in the street its little feet pattered up to the floor below its little feet trampled on her heart she would be beset with doubts and evil thoughts her soul in its weakness would be contaminated by the soul of that city of selfish pleasure she would fight down her regrets and burn with shame at certain longings which she thought evil and wicked she could not understand what it was that hurt her so and attributed it to her evil instincts poor little ophelia devoured by a mysterious evil she felt with horror dark and uneasy desires mounting from the depths of her being from the very pit of life she could not work and she had given up most of her pupils she who was so plucky and had always risen so early now lay in bed sometimes until the afternoon she had no more reason for getting up than for going to bed she ate little or nothing only on her brother's holidays thursday afternoons and sundays she would make an effort to be her old self with him 
he saw nothing he was too much taken up with his new life to notice his sister much he was at that period of boyhood when it was difficult for him to be communicative and he always seemed to be indifferent to things outside himself which would only be his concern in later days people of riper years sometimes seem to be more open to impressions and to take a simpler delight in life and nature than young people between twenty and thirty and so it is often said that young people are not so young in heart as they were and have lost all sense of enjoyment that is often a mistaken idea it is not because they have no sense of enjoyment that they seem less sensitive it is because their whole being is often absorbed by passion ambition desires some fixed idea when the body is worn and has no more to expect from life then the emotions become disinterested and fall into their place and then once more the source of childish tears is reopened olivier was preoccupied with a thousand little things the most outstanding of which was an absurd little passion he was always a victim to them which so obsessed him as to make him blind and indifferent to everything else antoinette did not know what was happening to her brother she only saw that he was drawing away from her that was not altogether olivier's fault sometimes when he came he would be glad to see her and start talking he would come in then all of a sudden he would dry up her affectionate anxiety the eagerness with which she clung to him and drank in his words and overwhelmed him with little attentions all her excess of tenderness and querulous devotion would deprive him utterly of any desire to be warm and open with her he might have seen that antoinette was not in a normal condition nothing could be farther from her usual tact and discretion but he never gave a thought to it he would reply to her questions with a curt yes or no he would grow more stiff and surly the more she tried to win him over sometimes even he would hurt her by some brusque reply then she would be crushed and silent their day together would slip by wasted but hardly had he set foot outside the house on his way back to the echo than he would be heartily ashamed of his treatment of her he would torture himself all night as he lay awake thinking of the pain he had caused her sometimes even as soon as he reached the ecole he would write an effusive letter to his sister but next morning when he read it through he would tear it up and antoinette would know nothing at all about it she would go on thinking that he had ceased to love her she had if not one last joy one last flutter of tenderness and youth when her heart beat strongly once more one last awakening of love in her and hope of happiness hope of life it was quite ridiculous so utterly unlike her tranquil nature it could never have been but for her abnormal condition the state of fear and over-excitement which was the precursor of illness she went to a concert at the chatelet with her brother and as he had just been appointed musical critic to a little review they were in better places than those they occupied in old days but the people among whom they sat were much more apathetic they had stalls near the stage christophe kraft was to play neither of them had ever heard of the german musician when she saw him come on the blood rushed to her heart although her tired eyes could only see him through a mist she had no doubt when he appeared he was the unknown young man of her unhappy days in germany she had never mentioned him to her brother and she had hardly even admitted his existence to her thoughts she had been entirely absorbed by the anxieties of her life since then besides she was a reasonable little french woman and refused to admit the existence of an obscure feeling which she could not trace to its source while it seemed to lead nowhere there was in her a whole region of the soul of unsuspected depths wherein there slept many other feelings which she would have been ashamed to behold she knew that they were there but she looked away from them in a sort of religious terror of that being within herself which lies beyond the mind's control when she had recovered a little she borrowed her brother's glasses to look at christophe she saw him in profile at the conductor's stand and she recognized his expression of forceful concentration he was wearing a shabby old coat which fitted him very badly antoinette sat in silent agony through the vagaries of that lamentable concert when christophe joined issue with the unconcealed hostility of his audience who were at the time ill disposed towards german artists and actively bored by his music and when he appeared after a symphony which had seemed unconscionably long to play some piano music he was received with catcalls which left no room for doubt as to their displeasure at having to put up with him again however he began to play in the face of the bored resignation of his audience but the uncomplimentary remarks exchanged in a loud voice by two men in the gallery went on to the great delight of the rest of the audience then he broke off and in a childish fit of temper he played malbrouck 
tant guerre with one finger got up from the piano faced the audience and said that is all you are fit for the audience were for a moment so taken aback that they did not quite take in what the musician meant then there was an outburst of angry protests followed a terrible uproar they hissed and shouted apologize make him apologize they were all red in the face with anger and they blew out their fury tried to persuade themselves that they were really enraged as perhaps they were but the chief thing was that they were delighted to have a chance of making a row and letting themselves go they were like schoolboys after a few hours in school antoinette could not move she was petrified she sat still tugging at one of her gloves ever since the last bars of the symphony she had had a growing presentiment of what would happen she felt the blind hostility of the audience felt it growing she read christophe's thoughts and she was sure he would not go through to the end without an explosion she sat waiting for the explosion while agony grew in her she stretched every nerve to try to prevent it when at last it came it was so exactly what she had foreseen that she was overwhelmed by it as by some fatal catastrophe against which there was nothing to be done and as she gazed at christophe who was staring insolently at the howling audience their eyes met christophe's eyes recognized her greeted her for the space of perhaps a second but he was in such a state of excitement that his mind did not recognize her he had not thought of her for long enough he disappeared while the audience yelled and hissed she longed to cry out to say or do something but she was bound hand and foot and could not stir it was like a nightmare it was some comfort to her to hear her brother at her side and to know that without having any idea what was happening to her he had shared her agony and indignation olivia was a thorough musician and he had an independence of taste which nothing could encroach upon when he liked a thing he would have maintained his liking in the face of the whole world with the very first bars of the symphony he had felt that he was in the presence of something big something the like of which he had never in his life come across he went on muttering to himself with heartfelt enthusiasm that's fine that's beautiful beautiful while his sister instinctively pressed close to him gratefully after the symphony he applauded loudly by way of protest against the ironic indifference of the rest of the audience when he came to the great fiasco he was beside himself he stood up shouted that christophe was right abused the boers and offered to fight them it was impossible to recognize the timid olivier his voice was drowned in the uproar he was told to shut up he was called a snotty little kid and told to go to bed antoinette saw the futility of standing up to them and took his arm and said stop stop i implore you stop he sat down in despair and went on muttering it's shameful shameful the swine she said nothing and bore her suffering in silence he thought she was insensible to the music and said antoinette don't you think it beautiful she nodded she was frozen and could not recover herself but when the orchestra began another piece she suddenly got up and whispered to her brother in a tone of savage hatred come come i can't bear the sight of these people they hurried out they walked along arm in arm and olivia went on talking excitedly antoinette said nothing End of section twenty six Section 27 of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Cannon. Antoinette, Chapter 1, Part 10 all that day and the days following she sat alone in her room and a feeling crept over her which at first she refused to face but then it went on and took possession of her thoughts like the furious throbbing of the blood in her aching temples some time afterwards olivier brought her christophe's collection of songs which he had just found at a publisher's she opened it at random on the first page on which her eyes fell she read in front of a song this dedication in german to my poor dear little victim together with a date she knew the date well she was so upset that she could read no farther she put the book down and asked her brother to play 
and went and shut herself up in her room olivier full of his delight in the new music began to play without remarking his sister's emotion antoinette sat in the adjoining room striving to repress the beating of her heart suddenly she got up and looked through a cupboard for a little account book in which was written the date of her departure from germany and the mysterious date she knew it already yes it was the evening of the performance at the theatre to which she had been with christophe she lay down on her bed and closed her eyes blushing with her hands folded on her breast while she listened to the dear music her heart was overflowing with gratitude ah why did her head hurt her so when olivier saw that his sister had not come back he went into her room after he had done playing and found her lying there he asked her if she were ill she said she was rather tired and got up to keep him company they talked but she did not answer his questions at once her thoughts seemed to be far away she smiled and blushed and said by way of excuse that her headache was making her stupid at last olivier went away she had asked him to leave the book of songs she sat up late reading them at the piano without playing just lightly touching a note here and there for fear of annoying her neighbours but for the most part she did not even read she sat dreaming she was carried away by a feeling of tenderness and gratitude towards the man who had pitied her and had read her mind and soul with the mysterious intuition of true kindness she could not fix her thoughts she was happy and sad sad ah how her head ached she spent the night in sweet and painful dreams a crushing melancholy during the day she tried to go out for a little to shake off her drowsiness although her head was still aching to give herself something to do she went and made a few purchases at a great shop she hardly gave a thought to what she was doing her thoughts were always with christophe though she did not admit it to herself as she came out worried and mortally sad through the crowd of people she saw christophe go by on the other side of the street he saw her too at the same moment at once suddenly and without thinking she held out her hands towards him christophe stopped this time he recognized her he sprang forward to cross the road to antoinette and antoinette tried to go to meet him but the insensate current of the passing throng carried her along like a windle straw while the horse of an omnibus falling on the slippery asphalt made a sort of dyke in front of christophe by which the opposing streams of carriages were dammed so that for a few moments there was an impassable barrier christophe tried to force his way through in spite of everything but he was trapped in the middle of the traffic and could not move either way when at last he did extricate himself and managed to reach the place where he had seen antoinette she was gone she had struggled vainly against the human torrent that carried her along then she yielded to it gave up the struggle she felt that she was dogged by some fatality which forbade the possibility of her ever meeting christophe against fate there was nothing to be done and when she did succeed in escaping from the crowd she made no attempt to go back she was suddenly ashamed what could she dare to say to him what had she done what must he have thought of her she fled away home she did not regain assurance until she reached her room then she sat by the table in the dark and had not even the strength to take off her hat or her gloves she was miserable at having been unable to speak to him and at the same time there glowed a new light in her heart she was unconscious of the darkness and unconscious of the illness that was upon her she went on and on turning over and over every detail of the scene in the street and she changed it about and imagined what would have happened if certain things had turned out differently she saw herself holding out her arms to christophe and christophe's expression of joy as he recognized her and she laughed and blushed she blushed and then in the darkness of her room where there was no one to see her and she could hardly see herself once more she held out her arms to him her need was too strong for her she felt that she was losing ground and instinctively she sought to clutch at the strong vivid life that passed so near her and gazed so kindly at her her heart was full of tenderness and anguish and through the night she cried help me save me all in a fever she got up and lit the lamp and took pen and paper she wrote to christophe her illness was full upon her or she would never even have thought of writing to him so proud she was and timid she did not know what she wrote she was no longer mistress of herself she called to him and told him that she loved him in the middle of her letter she stopped appalled she tried to write it all over again but her impulse was gone her mind was a blank and her head was aching she had a horrible difficulty 
in finding words she was utterly worn out she was ashamed what was the good of it all she knew perfectly well that she was trying to trick herself and that she would never send the letter even if she had wished to do so how could she she did not know christophe's address poor christophe and what could he do for her even if he knew all and were kind to her what could he do it was too late no no it was all in vain the last dying struggle of a bird blindly desperately beating its wings she must be resigned to it so for a long time she sat there by the table lost in thought unable to move hand or foot it was past midnight when she struggled to her feet bravely mechanically she placed the loose sheets of her letter in one of her few books for she had the strength neither to put them in order nor to tear them up then she went to bed shivering and shaking with fever the key to the riddle lay near at hand she felt that the will of god was to be fulfilled and a great peace came upon her on sunday morning when olivier came he found antoinette in bed delirious a doctor was called in he said it was acute consumption antoinette had known how serious her condition was she had discovered the cause of the moral turmoil in herself which had so alarmed her she had been dreadfully ashamed and it was some consolation to her to think that not she herself but her illness was the cause of it she had managed to take a few precautions and to burn her papers and to write a letter to madame nathan she appealed to her kindness to look after her brother during the first few weeks after her death she dared not write the word the doctor could do nothing the disease was too far gone and antoinette's constitution had been wrecked by the years of hardship and unceasing toil antoinette was quite calm since she had known that there was no hope her agony and torment had left her she lay turning over in her mind all the trials and tribulations through which she had passed she saw that her work was done and her dear olivier saved and she was filled with unutterable joy she said to herself i have achieved that and then she turned in shame from her pride and said i could have done nothing alone god has given me his aid and she thanked god that he had granted her life until she had accomplished her task there was a catch at her heart as she thought that now she had to lay down her life but she dared not complain that would have been to feel ingratitude towards god who might have called her away sooner and what would have happened if she had passed away a year sooner she sighed and humbled herself in gratitude in spite of her weakness and oppression she did not complain except when she was sleeping heavily when every now and then she moaned like a little child she watched things and people with a calm smile of resignation it was always a joy to her to see olivier she would move her lips to call him though she made no sound she would want to hold his hand in hers she would bid him lay his head on the pillow near hers and then gazing into his eyes she would go on looking at him in silence at last she would raise herself up and hold his face in her hands and say ah olivier olivier she took the medal that she wore round her neck and hung it on her brother's she commended her beloved olivier to the care of her confessor her doctor everybody it seemed as though she was to live henceforth in him that on the point of death she was taking refuge in his life as upon some island in uncharted seas sometimes she seemed to be uplifted by a mystic exaltation of tenderness and faith and she forgot her illness and sadness changed to joy in her a joy divine indeed that shone upon her lips and in her eyes over and over again she said i am happy her senses grew dim in her last moments of consciousness her lips moved and it seemed that she was repeating something to herself olivia went to her bedside and bent down over her she recognized him once more and smiled feebly up at him her lips went on moving and her eyes were filled with tears they could not make out what she was trying to say but faintly olivier heard her breathe the words of the dear old song they used to love so much the song she was always singing i will come again my sweet and bonny i will come again then she relapsed into unconsciousness so she passed away unconsciously she had aroused a profound sympathy in many people whom she did not even know in the house in which she lived she did not even know the names of the other tenants olivier received expressions of sympathy from people who were strangers to him antoinette was not taken to her grave unattended as her mother had been her body was followed to the cemetery by friends and schoolfellows of her brother and members of the families whose children she had taught and people whom she had met without saying a word of her own life or hearing a word from them though they admired her secretly knowing her devotion and many of the poor and the housekeeper who had helped her and even many of the small tradesmen of the neighbourhood madame nathan had taken olivier under her wing on the day of his sister's death and she had carried him off in spite of himself and done her best to turn his thoughts away from his grief 
if it had come later in his life he could never have borne up against such a catastrophe but now it was impossible for him to succumb absolutely to his despair he had just begun a new life he was living in a community and had to live the common life whatever he might be feeling the full busy life of the ecole the intellectual pressure the examinations the struggle for life all kept him from withdrawing into himself he could not be alone he suffered but it proved his salvation a year earlier or a few years earlier he must have succumbed and yet he did as far as possible retire into isolation in the memory of his sister it was a great sorrow to him that he could not keep the rooms where they had lived together but he had no money he hoped that the people who seemed to be interested in him would understand his distress at not being able to keep the things that had been hers but nobody seemed to understand he borrowed some money and made a little more by private tuition and took an attic in which he stored all that he could preserve of his sister's furniture her bed her table and her armchair he made it the sanctuary of her memory he took refuge there whenever he was depressed his friends thought he was carrying on an intrigue he would stay there for hours dreaming of her with his face buried in his hands unhappily he had no portrait of her except a little photograph taken when she was a child of the two of them together he would talk to her and weep where was she ah if she had been at the other end of the world wherever she might be and however inaccessible the spot with what great joy and invincible ardour he would have rushed forth in search of her though a thousand sufferings lay in wait for him though he had to go barefoot though he had to wander for hundreds of years if only it might be that every step would bring him nearer to her yes even though there were only one chance in a thousand of his ever finding her but there was nothing nowhere to go no way of ever finding her again how utterly lonely he was now now that she was no longer there to love and counsel and console him inexperienced and childish as he was he was flung into the waters of life to sink or swim he who has once had the happiness of perfect intimacy and boundless friendship with another human being has known the divinest of all joys a joy that will make him miserable for the remainder of his life nasun major dolore che ricco darsi del tempo felice nella miseria for a weak and tender soul it is the greatest of misfortunes ever to have known the greatest happiness but though it is sad indeed to lose the beloved at the beginning of life it is even more terrible later on when the springs of life are running dry olivier was young and in spite of his inborn pessimism in spite of his misfortune he had to live his life as often seems to happen after the loss of those dear to us it was as though when antoinette passed away she had breathed part of her soul into her brother's life and he believed it was so though he had not such faith as hers yet he did arrive at a vague conviction that his sister was not dead but lived on in him as she had promised there is a baton superstition that those who die young are not dead but stay and hover over the places where they lived until they have fulfilled the normal span of their existence so antoinette lived out her life in olivier he read through the papers he had found in her room unhappily she had burned most of them besides she was not the sort of woman to keep notes and tallies of her in her life she was too modest to uncloak her in most thoughts in morbid babbling indiscretion she only kept a little notebook which was almost unintelligible to anybody else a bare record in which she had written down without remark certain dates and certain small events in her daily life which had given her joys and emotions which she had no need to write down in detail to keep alive almost all these dates were connected with some event in olivier's life she had kept every letter he had ever written to her without exception alas he had not been so careful he had lost almost all the letters she had written to him what need had he of letters he thought he would have his sister always with him that dear fount of tenderness seemed inexhaustible he thought that he would always be able to quench his thirst of lips and heart at it he had most prodigally squandered the love he had received and now he was eager to gather up the smallest drops what was his emotion when as he skimmed through one of antoinette's books he found these words written in pencil on a scrap of paper olivier my dear olivier he almost swooned he sobbed and kissed the invisible lips that so spoke to him from the grave thereafter he took down all her books and hunted through them page by page to see if she had not left some other words of him he found the fragment of the letter to christophe and discovered the unspoken romance which had sprung to life in her so for the first time he happed upon her emotional life that he had never known in her and never tried to know 
he lived through the last passionate days when deserted by himself she had held out her arms to the unknown friend she had never told him that she had seen christophe before certain words in her letter revealed the fact that they had met in germany he understood that christophe had been kind to antoinette in circumstances the details of which were unknown to him and that antoinette's feeling for the musician dated from that day though she had kept her secret to the end christophe whom he loved already for the beauty of his art now became unutterably dear to him she had loved him it seemed to olivier that it was she whom he loved in christophe he moved heaven and earth to meet him it was not an easy matter to trace him after his rebuff christophe had been lost in the wilderness of paris he had shunned all society and no one gave a thought to him after many months it chanced that olivier met christophe in the street he was pale and sunken from the illness from which he had only just recovered but olivier had not the courage to stop him he followed him home at a distance he wanted to write to him but could not screw himself up to it what was there to say olivier was not alone antoinette was with him her love her modesty had become a part of him the thought that his sister had loved christophe made him as bashful in christophe's presence as though he had been antoinette and yet how he longed to talk to him of her but he could not her secret was a seal upon his lips he tried to meet christophe again he went everywhere where he thought christophe might be he was longing to shake hands with him and when he saw him he tried to hide so that christophe should not see him at last christophe saw him at the house of some mutual friends where they both happened to be one evening olivier stood far away from him and said nothing but he watched him and no doubt the spirit of antoinette was hovering near olivier that night for christophe saw her in olivier's eyes and it was her image so suddenly evoked that made him cross the room and go towards the unknown messenger who like a young hermes brought him the melancholy greeting of the blessed dead End of section twenty seven section twenty nine of jean christophe in paris this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org jean christophe in paris by romain roland translated by gilbert canin the house chapter one part one i have a friend oh that delight of having found a kindred soul to which to cling in the midst of torment a tender and sure refuge in which to breathe again while the fluttering heart beats slower no longer to be alone no longer never to unarm no longer to stay on guard with straining burning eyes until from sheer fatigue he should fall into the hands of his enemies to have a dear companion into whose hands all his life should be delivered the friend whose life was delivered into his at last to taste the sweetness of repose to sleep while the friend watches watch while the friend sleeps to know the joy of protecting a beloved creature who should trust in him like a little child to know the greater joy of absolute surrender to that friend to feel that he is in possession of all secrets and has power over life and death aging worn out weary of the burden of life through so many years to find new birth and fresh youth in the body of the friend through his eyes to see the world renewed through his senses to catch the fleeting loveliness of all things by the way through his heart to enjoy the splendour of living even to suffer in his suffering ah even suffering is joy if it be shared i have a friend away from me near me in me always i have my friend and i am his my friend loves me i am my friend's the friend of my friend of our two souls love has fashioned one christophe's first thought when he awoke the day after the roussins party was for olivier Jeannin. at once he felt an irresistible longing to see him again he got up and went out it was not yet eight o'clock it was a heavy and rather oppressive morning an april day before its time stormy clouds were hovering over paris olivier lived below the hill of st genevieve in a little street near the jardin des plantes the house stood in the narrowest part of the street the staircase led out of a dark yard and was full of diverse unpleasant smells the stairs wound steeply up and sloped down towards the wall which was disfigured with scribblings in pencil on the third floor a woman with grey hair hanging down and in petticoat bodice gaping at the neck opened the door when she heard footsteps on the stairs and slammed it too when she saw christophe 
There were several flats on each landing, and through the ill-fitting doors Christophe could hear children romping and squalling. The place was a swarming heap of dull base creatures, living as it were on shelves, one above the other in that low-storied house, built round a narrow, evil-smelling yard. Christophe was disgusted, and wondered what lusts and covetous desires could have drawn so many creatures to this place, far from the fields where at least there is air enough for all, and what it could profit them in the end to be in the city of Paris, where all their lives they were condemned to live in such a sepulchre. He reached Olivier's landing. A knotted piece of string was his bell-pull. Christophe tugged at it so mightily that at the noise several doors on the staircase were half opened. Olivier came to the door. Christophe was struck by the careful simplicity of his dress, and the neatness of it, which at any other time would have been little to his liking, was in that place an agreeable surprise. In such an atmosphere of foulness there was something charming and healthy about it, and at once he felt just as he had done the night before, when he gazed into Olivier's clear, honest eyes. He held out his hand, but Olivier was overcome with shyness and murmured, "'You! You here?' Christophe was engrossed in catching at the lovable quality of the man as it was revealed to him in that fleeting moment of embarrassment, and he only smiled in answer. He moved forward and forced Olivier backward, and entered the one room in which he both slept and worked. An iron bedstead stood against the wall near the window. Christophe noticed the pillows heaped up on the bolster. There were three chairs, a black painted table, a small piano, bookshelves, and books, and that was all. The room was cramped, low, ill-lighted, and yet there was in it a ray of the pure light that shone in the eyes of its owner. Everything was clean and tidy, as though a woman's hands had dealt with it, and a few roses in a vase brought springtime into the room, the walls of which were decorated with photographs of old Florentine pictures. "'So, you, you have come to see me?' said Olivier warmly. "'Good Lord, I had to,' said Christophe. "'You would never have come to me.' "'You think not?' replied Olivier. Then quickly, "'Yes, you are right.' but it would not be for want of thinking of it. What would have stopped you? Wanting to too much. That's a fine reason. Yes, don't laugh. I was afraid you would not want it as much as I. A lot that's worried me. I wanted to see you, and here I am. If it bores you, I shall know at once. You will have to have good eyes. They smiled at each other. Olivier went on. I was an ass last night. I was afraid I might have offended you. My shyness is absolutely a disease. I can't get a word out. I shouldn't worry about that. There are plenty of talkers in your country. One is only too glad to meet a man who is silent occasionally, even though it be only from shyness and in spite of himself. Christophe laughed and chuckled over his own jibe. Then you've come to see me because I can be silent? Yes, for your silence, the sort of silence that is yours. There are all sorts, and I like yours, and that's all there is to say. But how could you sympathize with me? You hardly saw me. That's my affair. It doesn't take me long to make up my mind. When I see a face that I like in the crowd, I know what to do. I go after it. I simply have to know the owner of it. And don't you ever make mistakes when you go after them? Often. Perhaps you've made a mistake this time. We shall see. Ah! In that case, I'm done. You terrify me. If I think you're watching me, I shall lose what little wits I have. With fond and eager curiosity, Christophe watched the sensitive, mobile face, which blushed and went pale by turns. Emotion showed fleeting across it like the shadows of clouds on a lake. What a nervous youngster it is, he thought. He's like a woman. He touched his knee. Come, come, he said. Do you think I should come to you with weapons concealed about me? I have a horror of people who practice their psychology on their friends. I only ask that we should both be open and sincere and frankly and without shame and without being afraid of committing ourselves finally to anything or any sort of contradiction. Be true to what we feel. I ask only the right to love now and next minute, if needs must, to be out of love. There's loyalty and manliness in that, isn't there? Olivier gazed at him with serious eyes and replied, no doubt, it is the more manly part, and you're strong enough, but I don't think I am. I'm sure you are, said Christophe, but in a different way, and then I've come just to help you to be strong if you want to be so. For what I have just said, 
gives me leave to go on and say with more frankness than I should otherwise have had that without prejudice for tomorrow, I love you. Olivier blushed hotly. He was struck dumb with embarrassment and could not speak. Christophe glanced round the room. It's a poor place you live in. Haven't you another room? Only a lumber room. Ugh, oh, I can't breathe. How do you manage to live here? One does it somehow. I couldn't. Never. Christophe unbuttoned his waistcoat and took a long breath. Olivier went and opened the window wide. You must be very unhappy in a town, Monsieur Kraft, but there's no danger of my suffering from too much fatality. I breathe so little that I can live anywhere, and yet there are nights in summer when even I am hard put to it to get through. I'm terrified when I see them coming. Then I stay sitting up in bed, and I'm almost stifled. Christophe looked at the heap of pillows on the bed, and from them to Olivier's worn face, and he could see him struggling there in the darkness. Leave it, he said. Why do you stay? Olivier shrugged his shoulders and replied carelessly, It doesn't matter where I live. Heavy footsteps padded across the floor above them. In the room below, a shrill argument was toward, and always, without ceasing, the walls were shaken by the rumbling of the buses in the street. And the house, Christophe went on, the house reeking of filth, the hot dirtiness of it all, the shameful poverty, how can you bring yourself to come back to it night after night? Don't you lose heart with it all? I couldn't live in it for a moment. I'd rather sleep under an arch. Yes, I felt all that at first and suffered. I was just as disgusted as you are. When I went for walks as a boy, the mere sight of some of the crowded, dirty streets made me ill. They gave me all sorts of fantastic horrors which I dared not speak of. I used to think, if there were an earthquake now, I should be dead and stay here for ever and ever. And that seemed to me the most appalling thing that could happen. I never thought that one day I should live in one of them of my own free will, and that in all probability I shall die there. And then it became easier to put up with. It had to. It still revolts me, but I try not to think of it. When I climb the stairs, I close my eyes and stop my ears and hold my nose and shut off all my senses and withdraw utterly into myself. And then, over the roof there, I can see the tops of the branches of an acacia. I sit here in this corner so that I don't see anything else, and in the evening, when the wind rustles through them, I fancy that I'm far away from Paris, and the mighty roar of a forest has never seemed so sweet to me as the gentle murmuring of those few frail leaves at certain moments. Yes, said Christophe, I have no doubt that you are always dreaming, but it's all wrong to waste your fancy in such a struggle against the sordid things of life when you might be using it in the creation of other lives. Isn't it the common lot? Don't you yourself waste energy in anger and bitter struggles? That's not the same thing. It's natural to me, what I was born for. Look at my arms and hands. Fighting is the breath of life to me. But you haven't any too much strength. That's obvious. Olivier looked sadly down at his thin wrists and said, Yes, I am weak. I always have been. But what can I do? One must live. How do you make your living? I teach. Teach what? everything. Latin, Greek, history. I coach for degrees, and I lecture on moral philosophy at the municipal school. Lecture on what? Moral philosophy. What in thunder is that? Do they teach morality in French schools? Olivier smiled. Of course. Is there enough in it to keep you talking for ten minutes? I have to lecture for twelve hours a week. Do you teach them to do evil, then? What do you mean? There's no need for so much talk to find out what good is. Or to leave it undiscovered, either. Good gracious, yes, leave it undiscovered. There are worse ways of doing good than knowing nothing about it. Good isn't a matter of knowledge, it's a matter of action. It's only your neurasthenics who go haggling about morality, and the first of all moral laws is not to be neurasthenic. Rotten pedants, they are like cripples teaching people how to walk but they don't do their talking for such as you. You know, but there are so many who do not know. Well, let them crawl like children until they learn how to walk by themselves, but whether they go on two legs or on all fours, the first thing, the only thing you can ask, is that they should walk somehow. He was prowling round and round and up and down the room, though 
Less than four strides took him across it. He stopped in front of the piano, opened it, turned over the pages of some music, touched the keys, and said, Play me something. Olivier started. I, he said, what an idea. Madame Roussin told me you were a good musician. Come, play me something. With you listening? Oh, he said, I should die. The sincerity and simplicity with which he spoke made Christophe laugh. Olivier, too, though rather bashfully. Well, said Christophe, is that a reason for a Frenchman? Olivier still drew back. But why, why do you want me to? I'll tell you presently. Play. What? Anything you like. Olivier sat down at the piano with a sigh, and obedient to the imperious will of the friend who had sought him out, he began to play the beautiful adagio in B minor of Mozart. At first his fingers trembled so that he could hardly make them press down the keys. But he regained courage little by little, and while he thought he was but repeating Mozart's utterance, he unwittingly revealed his inmost heart. Music is an indiscreet confidant. It betrays the most secret thoughts of its lovers to those who love it. Through the godlike scheme of the adagio of Mozart, Christophe could perceive the invisible lines of the character, not of Mozart, but of his new friend sitting there by the piano, the serene melancholy, the timid, tender smile of the boy, so nervous, so pure, so full of love, so ready to blush. But he had hardly reached the end of the air, the topmost point where the melody of sorrowful love ascends and snaps, when a sudden irrepressible feeling of shame and modesty overcame Olivier, so that he could not go on. His fingers would not move, and his voice failed him. His hands fell by his side, and he said, I can't play any more. Christophe was standing behind him, and he stooped and reached over him and finished the broken melody. Then he said, Now I know the music of your soul. He held his hands and stayed for a long time gazing into his face. At last he said, How queer it is. I have seen you before. I know you so well, and I have known you so long. Olivier's lips trembled. He was on the point of speaking, but he said nothing. Christophe went on gazing at him for a moment or two longer. Then he smiled and said no more, and went away. He went down the stairs with his heart filled with joy. He passed two ugly children going up, one with bread, the other with a bottle of oil. He pinched their cheeks jovially. He smiled at the scowling porter. When he reached the street, he walked along humming to himself until he came to the Luxembourg. He laid down on a seat in the shade and closed his eyes. The air was still and heavy. There were only a few passers-by. Very faintly he could hear the irregular trickling of the fountain, and every now and then the scrunching of the gravel as footsteps passed him by. Christophe was overcome with drowsiness, and he lay basking like a lizard in the sun. His face had been out of the shadow of the trees for some time, but he could not bring himself to stir. His thoughts wound about and about. He made no attempt to hold and fix them. They were all steeped in the light of happiness. The Luxembourg clock struck. He did not listen to it. But a moment later he thought it must have been striking twelve. He jumped up to realize that he'd been lounging for a couple of hours, had missed an appointment with Hecht, and wasted the whole morning. He laughed and went home whistling. He composed a rondo in canon on the cry of a peddler. Even sad melodies now took on the charm of the gladness that was in him. As he passed the laundry in his street as usual, he glanced into the shop and saw the little red-haired girl, with her dull complexion flushed with the heat, and she was ironing with her thin arms bare to the shoulder and her bodice open at the neck, and as usual she ogled him brazenly. For the first time he was not irritated by her eyes meeting his. He laughed once more. When he reached his room, he was free of all the obsessions from which he had suffered. He flung his hat, coat, and vest in different directions, and sat down to work with an all-conquering zest. He gathered together all his scattered scraps of music which were lying all over the room, but his mind was not in his work. He only read the script with his eyes, and a few minutes later he fell back into the happy somnolence that had been upon him in the Luxembourg Gardens. His head buzzed, and he could not think. Twice or thrice he became aware of his condition, and tried to shake it off, but in vain. He swore light-heartedly, got up, and dipped his head in a basin of cold water. That sobered him a little. He sat down at the table again, sat in silence, and smiled dreamily. He was wondering, what is the difference between that and love? 
Instinctively he'd begun to think in whispers as though he were ashamed. He shrugged his shoulders. There are not two ways of loving, or rather... Yes, there are two ways. There is the way of those who love with every fibre of their being, and the way of those who only give to love a part of their superfluous energy. God keep me from such cowardice of heart. He stopped in his thought from a sort of shame and dread of following it any further. He sat for a long time smiling at his inward dreams. His heart sang through the silence. Du bist mein, und nun ist das meine, meiner als jemals. Thou art mine, and now I am mine, more mine than I have ever been. He took a sheet of paper and with tranquil ease wrote down the song that was in his heart. They decided to take rooms together. Christophe wanted to take possession at once without worrying about the waste of half a quarter. Olivier was more prudent, though not less ardent in their friendship, and thought it better to wait until their respective tenancies had expired. Christophe could not understand such parsimony. Like many people who have no money, he never worried about losing it. He imagined that Olivier was even worse off than himself. One day, when his friend's poverty had been brought home to him, he left him suddenly and returned a few hours later in triumph with a few francs, which he had squeezed in advance out of Hecht. Olivier blushed and refused. Christophe was put out and made to throw them to an Italian who was playing in the yard. Olivier withheld him. Christophe went away, apparently offended, but really furious with his own clumsiness to which he attributed Olivier's refusal. A letter from his friend brought balm to his wounds. Olivier could write what he could not express by word of mouth. He could tell of his happiness in knowing him and how touched he was by Christophe's offer of assistance. Christophe replied with the crazy wild letter, rather like those which he wrote when he was fifteen to his friend Otto. It was full of gemut and blundering jokes. He made puns in French and German, and even translated them into music. At last they went into their rooms, in the Montparnasse quarter, near the Place d'Enfer, on the fifth floor of an old house they had found a flat of three rooms and a kitchen, all very small, and looking on to a tiny garden enclosed by four high walls. From their windows they looked out over the opposite wall, which was lower than the rest, on to one of those large convent gardens which are still to be found in Paris hidden and unknown. Not a soul was to be seen in the deserted avenues. The old trees, taller and more leafy than those in the Luxembourg gardens, trembled in the sunlight. Troops of birds sang. In the early dawn the blackbirds fluted, and then there came the riotously rhythmic chorus of the sparrows. And in summer in the evening the rapturous cries of the swifts, cleaving the luminous air and skimming through the heavens, and at night under the moon like bubbles of air mounting to the surface of a pond, there came up the pearly notes of the toads. Almost they might have forgotten the surrounding presence of Paris, but that the old house was perpetually shaken by the heavy vehicles rumbling by, as though the earth beneath were shivering in a fever. One of the rooms was larger and finer than the rest, and there was a struggle between the friends as to who should not have it. They had to toss for it, and Christophe, who had made the suggestion, contrived not to win, with the dexterity of which he found it hard to believe himself capable. End of section 28, read by Sandra, near Montreal, 2022. Section 29 of Jean-Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean-Christophe in Paris by Romain Rollin, translated by Gilbert Canin. The House, Chapter 1, Part 2 Then for the two of them there began a period of absolute happiness. Their happiness lay not in any one thing, but in all things at once. Their every thought, their every act, were steeped in it, and it never left them for a moment. During this honeymoon of their friendship, the first days of deep and silent rejoicing known only to him who in all the universe can call one soul his own. Ja, wer auch nur eine Seele sein nennt auf dem Erden rund. They hardly spoke to each other. They dared hardly breathe a word. It was enough for them to feel each other's nearness, to exchange a look, a word in token that their thoughts 
after long periods of silence, still ran in the same channel, without probing or inquiring, without even looking at each other, yet unceasingly they watched each other. Unconsciously the lover takes for a model the soul of the beloved, so great is his desire to give no hurt, to be in all things as the beloved, that with mysterious and sudden intuition he marks the imperceptible movements in the depths of his soul. One friend to another is crystal clear. They exchange entities. Their features are assimilated. Soul imitates soul, until that day comes when deep-moving force, the spirit of the race, bursts his bonds and rends asunder the web of love in which he is held captive. Christophe spoke in low tones, walked softly, tried hard to make no noise in his room, which was next to that of the silent Olivier. He was transfigured by his friendship. He had an expression of happiness, confidence, youth, such as he had never worn before. He adored Olivier. It would have been easy for the boy to abuse his power if he had not been so timorous in feeling that it was a happiness undeserved, for he thought himself much inferior to Christophe, who in his turn was no less humble. This mutual humility, the product of their great love for each other, was an added joy. It was a pure delight, even with the consciousness of unworthiness, for each to feel that he filled so great a room in the heart of his friend. Each to other they were tender and filled with gratitude. Olivier had mixed his books with Christophe's. They made no distinction. When he spoke of them he did not say my book, but our book. He kept back only a few things from the common stock, those which had belonged to his sister or were bound up with her memory. With the quick perception of love, Christophe was not slow to notice this, but he did not know the reason of it. He had never dared to ask Olivier about his family. He only knew that Olivier had lost his parents, and to the somewhat proud reserve of his affection, which forbade his prying into his friend's secrets, there was added a fear of calling to life in him the sorrows of the past. Though he might long to do so, yet he was strangely timid, and never dared to look closely at the photographs on Olivier's desk, portraits of a lady and a gentleman stiffly posed, and a little girl of twelve with a great spaniel at her feet. A few months after they had taken up their quarters, Olivier caught cold and had to stay in bed. Christophe, who had become quite motherly, nursed him with fond anxiety, and the doctor, who on examining Olivier had found a little inflammation at the top of the lungs, told Christophe to smear the invalid's chest with a tincture of iodine. As Christophe was gravely acquitting himself of the task, he saw a confirmation medal hanging from Olivier's neck. He was familiar enough with Olivier to know that he was even more emancipated in matters of religion than himself. He could not refrain from showing his surprise. Olivier coloured and said, "'It is a souvenir. My poor sister Antoinette was wearing it when she died.' Christophe trembled. The name of Antoinette struck him like a flash of lightning. "'Antoinette?' he said. "'My sister,' said Olivier. Christophe repeated, "'Antoinette, Antoinette Jeannin. She was your sister? But, he said as he looked at the photograph on the desk, she was quite a child when you lost her. Olivier smiled sadly. It is a photograph of her as a child, he said. Alas, I have no other. She was twenty-five when she left me. Ah, said Christophe, who was greatly moved, and she was in Germany, was she not? Olivier nodded. Christophe took Olivier's hands in his. I knew her, he said. "'Yes, I know,' replied Olivier, and he flung his arms round Christophe's neck. "'Poor girl! Poor girl!' said Christophe over and over again. They were both in tears. Christophe remembered then that Olivier was ill. He tried to calm him and made him keep his arms inside the bed and tucked the clothes up round his shoulders and dried his eyes for him and then sat down by the bedside and looked long at him. "'You see,' he said, "'that is how I knew you. I recognized you at once that first evening. It were hard to tell whether he was speaking of the present or the absent friend. But, he went on a moment later, you knew? Why didn't you tell me? And through Olivier's eyes, Antoinette replied, I could not tell you. You had to see it for yourself. They said nothing for some time. Then in the silence of the night, Olivier, lying still in bed, in a low voice, told Christophe, who held his hand, poor Antoinette's story. But he did not tell him what he had no right to tell, the secret that she had kept locked, the secret that perhaps Christophe knew already without needing to be told. 
from that time on the soul of antoinette was ever near them when they were together she was with them they had no need to think of her every thought they shared was shared with her too her love was the meeting-place wherein their two hearts were united often olivier would conjure up the image of her scraps of memory and brief anecdotes in their fleeting light they gave a glimpse of her shy gracious gestures her grave young smile the pensive wistful grace that was so natural to her christophe would listen without a word and let the light of the unseen friend pierce to his very soul in obedience to the law of his own nature which everywhere and always drank in life more greedily than any other he would sometimes hear in olivier's words depths of sound which olivier himself could not hear and more than olivier he would assimilate the essence of the girl who was dead instinctively he supplied her place in olivier's life and it was a touching sight to see the awkward german hap unwittingly on certain of the delicate attentions and little mothering ways of antoinette sometimes he could not tell whether it was olivier that he loved in antoinette or antoinette in olivier sometimes on a tender impulse without saying anything he would go and visit antoinette's grave and lay flowers on it it was some time before olivier had any idea of it he did not discover it until one day when he found fresh flowers on the grave but he had some difficulty in proving that it was christophe who had laid them there when he tried bashfully to speak about it christophe cut him short roughly and abruptly he did not want olivier to know and he stuck to it until one day when they met in the cemetery at ivry olivier on his part used to write to christophe's mother without letting him know he gave louisa news of her son and told her how fond he was of him and how he admired him louisa would send olivier awkward humble letters in which she thanked him profusely she used always to write of her son as though he were a little boy after a period of fond semi-silence a delicious time of peace and enjoyment without knowing why their tongues were loosed they spent hours in voyages of discovery each in the other's soul they were very different but they were both pure metal they loved each other because they were so different though so much the same olivier was weak delicate incapable of fighting against difficulties when he came up against an obstacle he drew back not from fear but something from timidity and more from disgust with the brutal and coarse means he would have to employ to overcome it he earned his living by giving classes and writing art books shamefully underpaid as usual and occasionally articles for reviews in which he never had a free hand and had to deal with subjects in which he was not greatly interested there was no demand for the things that did interest him he was never asked for the sort of thing he could do best he was a poet and was asked for criticism he knew something about music and he had to write about painting he knew quite well that he could only say mediocre things which was just what people liked for there he could speak to mediocre minds in a language which they could understand he grew disgusted with it all and refused to write he had no pleasure except in writing for certain obscure periodicals which never paid anything and like so many other young men he devoted his talents to them because they left him a free hand only in their pages could he publish what was worthy of publicity he was gentle well-mannered seemingly patient though he was excessively sensitive a harsh word drew blood injustice overwhelmed him he suffered both on his own account and for others certain crimes committed ages ago still had the power to rend him as though he himself had been their victim he would go pale and shudder and be utterly miserable as he thought how wretched he must have been who suffered them and how many ages cut him off from his sympathy when any unjust deed was done before his eyes he would be wild with indignation and tremble all over and sometimes become quite ill and lose his sleep it was because he knew his weakness that he drew on his mask of calmness for when he was angry he knew that he went beyond all limits and was apt to say unpardonable things people were more resentful with him than with christophe who was always violent because it seemed that in moments of anger olivier much more than christophe expressed exactly what he thought and that was true he judged men and women without christophe's blind exaggeration but lucidly and without his illusions and that is precisely what people do pardon the least readily in such cases he would say nothing and avoid discussion knowing its futility he had suffered from this restraint he had suffered more from his timidity which sometimes led him to betray his thoughts or deprived him of the courage to defend his thoughts conclusively 
and even to apologize for them as had happened in the argument with Lucien Le Vicard about Christophe. He had passed through many crises of despair before he had been able to strike a compromise between himself and the rest of the world. In his youth and budding manhood, when his nerves were not hopelessly out of order, he lived in a perpetual alternation of periods of exaltation and periods of depression, which came and went with horrible suddenness. Just when he was feeling most at his ease and even happy, he was very certain that sorrow was lying in wait for him, and suddenly it would lay him low without giving any warning of its coming, and it was not enough for him to be unhappy. He had to blame himself for his unhappiness and hold an inquisition into his every word and deed and his honesty and take the side of other people against himself. His heart would throb in his bosom, he would struggle miserably, and he would scarcely be able to breathe. Since the death of Antoinette, and perhaps thanks to her, thanks to the peace-giving light that issues from the beloved dead, as the light of dawn brings refreshment to the eyes and soul of those who are sick, Olivier had contrived, if not to break away from these difficulties, at least to be resigned to them and to master them. Very few had any idea of his inward struggles. The humiliating secret was locked up in his breast. All the immoderate excitement of a weak, tormented body, surveyed serenely by a free and keen intelligence which could not master it, though it was never touched by it, the central peace which endures amid the endless agitation of the heart. Christophe marked it. This was what he saw in Olivier's eyes. Olivier had an intuitive perception of the souls of men, and a mind of a wide, subtle curiosity that was open to everything, denied nothing, hated nothing, and contemplated the world and things with generous sympathy. That freshness of outlook, which is a priceless gift, granting the power to taste with a heart that is always new, the eternal renewal and rebirth. In that inward universe, wherein he knew himself to be free, vast, sovereign, he could forget his physical weaknesses and agony. There was even a certain pleasure in watching from a great height, with ironic pity, that poor, suffering body, which always seemed so near the point of death. So there was no danger of his clinging to his life, and only the more passionately did he hug life itself. Olivier translated into the region of love and mind all the forces which in action he had abdicated. He had not enough vital sap to live by his own substance. He was as ivy. It was needful for him to cling. He was never so rich as when he gave himself. His was a womanish soul with its eternal need of loving and being loved. He was born for Christophe, and Christophe for him. Such are the aristocratic and charming friends who are the escorts of the great artists, and seem to have come to flower in the lives of their mighty souls. Beltraffio, the friend of Leonardo, Cavalier of Michelangelo, the gentle Umbrians, the comrades of young Raphael, Ayert van Gelder, who remained faithful to Rembrandt in his poor old age. They have not the greatness of the masters, but it is as though all the purity and nobility of the masters in their friends were raised to a yet higher spiritual power. They are the ideal companions for men of genius. Their friendship was profitable to both of them. Love lends wings to the soul. The presence of the beloved friend gives all its worth to life. A man lives for his friend and for his sake defends his soul's integrity against the wearing force of time. Each enriched the other's nature. Olivier had serenity of mind and a sickly body. Christophe had a mighty strength and a stormy soul. They were in some sort like a blind man and a cripple. Now that they were together they felt sound and strong. Living in the shadow of Christophe, Olivier recovered his joy in the light. Christophe transmitted to him something of his abounding vitality, his physical and moral robustness, which even in sorrow, even in injustice, even in hate, inclined to optimism. He took much more than he gave, in obedience to the law of genius which gives in vain, but in love always takes more than it gives, quia nominar leo, because it is genius, and genius half consists in the instinctive absorption of all that is great in its surroundings and making it greater still. The vulgar saying has it that riches go to the rich, strength goes to the strong. Christophe fed on Olivier's ideas. He impregnated himself with his intellectual calmness and mental detachment, his lofty outlook, 
his silent understanding and mastery of things. But when they were transplanted into him, the richer soil, the virtues of his friend grew with a new and other energy. They both marveled at the things they discovered in each other. There were so many things to share. Each brought vast treasures of which till then he had never been conscious, the moral treasure of his nation. Olivier, the wide culture and the psychological genius of France. Christophe, the innate music of Germany and his intuitive knowledge of nature. Christophe could not understand how Olivier could be a Frenchman. His friend was so little like all the Frenchmen he had met. Before he found Olivier, he had not been far from taking Lucien Lévy-Cœur as a type of the modern French mind. Lévy-Cœur was no more than the caricature of it, and now, through Olivier, he saw that there might be in Paris minds just as free, more free indeed, than that of Lucien Lévy-Cœur, men who remained as pure and stoical as any in Europe. Christophe tried to prove to Olivier that he and his sister could not be altogether French. "'My poor dear fellow,' said Olivier, "'what do you know of France?' Christophe avowed the trouble he had taken to gain some knowledge of the country. He drew up a list of all the Frenchmen he'd met in the circle of the Stevens and the Roussins, Jews, Belgians, Luxembourgers, Americans, Russians, Levantines, and here and there a few authentic Frenchmen. "'Just what I was saying,' replied Olivier. "'You haven't seen a single Frenchman.' a group of debauchees, a few beasts of pleasure who are not even French, men about town, politicians, useless creatures, all the fuss and flummery which passes over and above the life of the nation, without even touching it. You have only seen the swarms of wasps, attracted by a fine autumn, and the rich meadows. You haven't noticed the busy hives, the industrious city, the thirst for knowledge. I beg pardon, said Christophe. I've come across your intellectual elite as well. What? A few dozen men of letters? They're a fine lot. Nowadays, when science and action play so great a part, literature has become superficial, no more than the bed where the thought of the people sleeps. And in literature you have only come across a theatre, the theatre of luxury, an international kitchen where dishes are turned out for the wealthy customers of the cosmopolitan hotels. The theatres of Paris... Do you think a working man even knows what is being done in them? Pasteur did not go to them ten times in all his life. Like all foreigners, you attach an exaggerated importance to our novels, and our boulevard plays, and the intrigues of our politicians. If you like, I will show you women who never read novels, girls in Paris who have never been to the theatre, men who have never bothered their heads about politics. Yes, even among our intellectuals. You have not come across either our men of science or our poets. You have not discovered the solitary artists who languish in silence, nor the burning flame of our revolutionaries. You have not seen a single great believer or a single great skeptic. As for the people, we won't talk of them. Outside the poor woman who looked after you, what do you know of them? Where have you had a chance of seeing them? How many Parisians have you met? who have lived higher than the second or third floor. If you do not know these people, you do not know France. You know nothing of the brave true hearts, the men and women living in poor lodgings in the garrets of Paris, in the dumb provinces, men and women who through a dull drab life think grave thoughts and live in a daily sacrifice, the little church which has always existed in France, small in numbers, great in spirit, almost unknown, having no outward or apparent force of action, though it is the very force of France, that might which endures in silence while the so-called elite rots away and springs to life again unceasingly. You are amazed when you find a Frenchman who lives not for the sake of happiness, happiness at all costs, but to accomplish or to serve his faith? There are thousands of men like myself, men more worthy than myself, more pious, more humble, men who to their dying day live unfailingly to serve an ideal, a God who vouchsafes them no reply. You know nothing of the thrifty, methodical, industrious, tranquil middle class living with a quenchless, dormant flame in their hearts, the people betrayed and sacrificed who in old days defended my country against the selfish arrogance of the great, the blue-eyed, ancient race of Vauban. You do not know the people. You do not know the elite. 
Have you read a single one of the books which are our faithful friends, the companions who support us in our lives? Do you even know of the existence of our young reviews in which such great faith and devotion are expressed? Have you any idea of the men of moral might and worth who are as the sun to us, the sun whose voiceless light strikes terror to the army of the hypocrites? They dare not make a frontal attack. They bow before them, the better to betray them. The hypocrite is a slave, and there is no slave, but he has a master. You know only the slaves. You know nothing of the masters. You have watched our struggles, and they have seemed to you brutish and unmeaning, because you have not understood their aim. You see the shadow, the reflected light of day. You have never seen the inward day, our age-old immemorial spirit. Have you ever tried to perceive it? Have you ever heard of our heroic deeds from the Crusades to the Commune? Have you ever seen and felt the tragedy of the French spirit? Have you ever stood at the brink of the abyss of Pascal? How dare you slander a people who for more than a thousand years have been living in action and creation, a people that has graven the world in its own image through Gothic art and the seventeenth century and the revolution? a people that has twenty times passed through the ordeal of fire and plunged into it again, and twenty times has come to life again, and never yet has perished. You are all the same. All your countrymen who come among us see only the parasites who suck our blood, literary, political, and financial adventurers, with their minions and their hangers-on and their harlots, and they judge France by these wretched creatures who prey on her, not one of you has any idea of the real France living under oppression, or of the reserve of vitality in the French provinces, or of the great mass of the people who go on working heedless of the uproar and pother made by their masters of a day. Yes, it is only natural that you should know nothing of all this. I do not blame you. How could you? Why, France is hardly at all known to the French. The best of us are bound down and held captive to our native soil— no one will ever know all that we've suffered, we who have guarded as a sacred charge the light in our hearts which we've received from the genius of our race, to which we cling with all our might, desperately defending it against the hostile winds that strive blusteringly to snuff it out. We are alone, and in our nostrils stinks the pestilential atmosphere of these harpies who have swarmed about our genius like a thick cloud of flies, whose hideous grubs gnaw at our minds and defile our hearts. We are betrayed by those whose duty it is to defend us, our leaders, our idiotic and cowardly critics who fawn upon the enemy to win pardon for being of our race. We are deserted by the people who give no thought to us and do not even know of our existence. By what means can we make ourselves known to them? We cannot reach them. Ah, that is the hardest thing of all. We know that there are thousands of men in France who all think as we do, we know that we speak in their name, and we cannot gain a hearing. Everything is in the hands of the enemy. Newspapers, reviews, theatres. The press scurries away from ideas or admits them only as an instrument of pleasure or a party weapon. The cliques and cutteries will only suffer us to break through on condition that we degrade ourselves. We are crushed by poverty and overwork. The politicians pursuing nothing but wealth, are only interested in that section of the public which they can buy. The middle class is selfish and indifferent and unmoved, sees us perish. The people know nothing of our existence, even those who are fighting the same fight like us, are cut off by silence and do not know that we exist, and we do not know that they exist. Ill-omened Paris. No doubt good also has come of it, by gathering together all the forces of the French mind and genius, but the evil it has done is at least equal to the good, and in a time like the present the good quickly turns to evil. A pseudo-elite fastens on Paris and blows the loud trumpet of publicity, and the voices of all the rest of France are drowned. More than that, France herself is deceived by it. She's scared and silent, and fearfully locks away her own ideas— there was a time when it hurt me dreadfully, but now, Christophe, I can bear it calmly. I know and understand my own strength and the might of my people. We must wait until the flood dies down. It cannot touch or change the bedrock of France. 
I will make you feel that bedrock under the mud that is borne onward by the flood, and even now, here and there, there are lofty peaks appearing above the waters. Christophe discovered the mighty power of idealism which animated the French poets, musicians, and men of science of his time, while the temporary masters of the country with their coarse sensuality drowned the voice of the French genius, it showed itself too aristocratic to vie with the presumptuous shouts of the rabble, and sang on with burning ardour in its own praise and the praise of its god. It was as though in its desire to escape the revolting uproar of the outer world, it had withdrawn to the farthest refuge in the innermost depths of its castle keep. The poets, that is, those only who were worthy of that splendid name, so bandied by the press and the academies and doled out to diverse windbags, greedy of money and flattery, the poets, despising impudent rhetoric and that slavish realism which nibbles at the surface of things without penetrating to reality, had entrenched themselves in the very centre of the soul, in a mystic vision into which was drawn the universe of form and idea, like a torrent falling into a lake, there to take on the colour of the inward life, the very intensity of this idealism, which withdrew into itself to recreate the universe, made it inaccessible to the mob. Christophe himself did not understand it at first. The transition was too abrupt after the marketplace. It was as though he had passed from a furious Russian scramble in the hot sunlight into silence and the night. His ears buzzed. He could see nothing. At first, with his ardent love of life, he was shocked by the contrast. Outside was the roaring of the rushing streams of passion overturning France and stirring all humanity, and at the first glance there was not a trace of it in this art of theirs. Christophe asked Olivier, "'You have been lifted to the stars and hurled down to the depths of hell by your Dreyfus affair. Where is the poet in whose soul the height and depth of it were felt?' Now, at this very moment, in the souls of your religious men and women, there is the mightiest struggle there has been for centuries between the authority of the Church and the rights of conscience. Where is the poet in whose soul this sacred agony is reflected? The working classes are preparing for war. Nations are dying. Nations are springing to new life. The Armenians are massacred. Asia, awaking from its sleep of a thousand years, hurls down the Muscovite colossus. The keeper of the keys of Europe, Turkey, like Adam, opens its eyes on the light of day. The air is conquered by man. The old earth cracks under our feet and opens. It devours a whole people. All these prodigies accomplished in twenty years, enough to supply material for twenty Iliads. But where are they? Where shall their fiery traces be found in the books of your poets? Are they, of all men, unable to see the poetry of the world? Patience, my friend, patience, replied Olivier. Be silent. Say nothing. Listen. Slowly the creaking of the axle-tree of the world died away, and the rumbling over the stones of the heavy car of action was lost in the distance, and there arose the divine song of silence the hum of bees and the perfume of the limes, the wind with his golden lips kissing the earth of the plains, the soft sound of the rain and the scent of the roses. There rang out the hammer and chisel of the poets carving the sides of a vase with the fine majesty of simple things, solemn, joyous life, with its flutes of gold and flutes of ebony. Religious joy, faith welling up like a fountain of souls, for whom the very darkness is clear, and great sweet sorrow giving comfort and smiling, with her austere face from which there shines a clearness beyond nature, and death serene with her great soft eyes. A symphony of harmonious and pure voices, not one of them had the full sonorousness of such national trumpets as were Corneille and Hugo, but how much deeper and more subtle in expression was their music, the richest music in Europe of today. Olivia said to Christophe, who was silent, Do you understand now? 
Christophe, in his turn, bade him be silent. In spite of himself, and although he preferred more manly music, yet he drank in the murmuring of the woods and fountains of the soul which came whispering to his ears. Amid the passing struggles of the nations they sang the eternal youth of the world, the sweet goodness of beauty, while humanity, screaming with terror and yelping its complaint, marched round and round a barren, gloomy field, while millions of men and women wore themselves out in wrangling for the bloody rags of liberty, the fountains and the woods sang on, Free, free, sanctus, sanctus. And yet they slept not in any dream selfishly serene. In the choir of the poets there were not wanting tragic voices, voices of pride, voices of love, voices of agony. A blind hurricane, mad, intoxicated, with its own rough force or gentleness, profound. Tumultuous forces, the epic of the illusions of those who sing the wild fever of the crowd, the conflicts of human gods, the breathless toilers, faces inky black and golden, peering through darkness and mist, muscular backs stretching or suddenly crouching round mighty furnaces and gigantic anvils, forging the city of the future. In the flickering light and shadow falling on the glaciers of the mind, there was the heroic bitterness of those solitary souls which devour themselves with desperate joy. End of section 29, read by Sandra, near Montreal, 2022. Section 30 of Jean-Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean-Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Canin. The House, Chapter 1, Part 3. Many of the characteristics of these idealists seemed to the German more German than French, but all of them had the love for the fine speech of France, and the sap of the myths of Greece ran through their poetry. Scenes of France and daily life were by some hidden magic transformed in their eyes into visions of Attica. It was as though antique souls had come to life again in these twentieth-century Frenchmen, and longed to fling off their modern garments to appear again in their lovely nakedness. Their poetry as a whole gave out the perfume of a rich civilization that has ripened through the ages, a perfume such as could not be found anywhere else in Europe. It were impossible to forget it once it had been breathed. It attracted foreign artists from every country in the world. They became French poets, almost bigotedly French, and French classical art had no more fervent disciples than these Anglo-Saxons and Flemings and Greeks. Christophe, under Olivier's guidance, was impregnated with the pensive beauty of the muse of France, while in his heart he found the aristocratic lady a little too intellectual for his liking, and preferred a pretty girl of the people, simple, healthy, robust, who thinks and argues less, but is more concerned with love. The same odeur de bellezza arose from all French art, as the scent of ripe strawberries and raspberries ascends from autumn woods warmed by the sun. French music was like one of those little strawberry plants hidden in the grass, the scent of which sweetens all the air of the woods. At first Christophe had passed it by without seeing it, for in his own country he had been used to whole thickets of music, much fuller and bearing more brilliant fruits, but now the delicate perfume made him turn. With Olivier's help among the stones and brambles and dead leaves which usurped the name of music, he discovered the subtle and ingenuous art of a handful of musicians. Amid the marshy fields and the factory chimneys of democracy, in the heart of the Plaine Saint-Denis, in a little magic wood, fawns were dancing blithely. Christophe was amazed to hear the ironic and serene notes of their flutes, which were like nothing he had ever heard. A little reed sufficed for me to make the tall grass quiver and all the meadow the willows sweet and the singing stream also a little reed sufficed for me to make the forest sing 
Beneath the careless grace and the seeming dilettantism of their little piano pieces and songs and French chamber music which German art never deigned to notice, while Christophe himself had hitherto failed to see the poetic accomplishment of it all, he now began to see the fever of renovation and the uneasiness, unknown on the other side of the Rhine, with which French musicians were seeking in the unfulfilled fields of their art the germs from which the future might grow. While German musicians sat stolidly in the encampments of their forebears, and arrogantly claimed to stay the evolution of the world at the barrier of their past victories, the world was moving onwards, and in the van the French plunged onward to discovery. They explored the distant realms of art, dead suns and suns lit up once more, and vanished Greece and the Far East after its age-long slumber, once more opening its slanting eyes, full of vasty dreams upon the light of day. In the music of the West, run off into channels by the genius of order and classic reason, they opened up the sluices of the ancient fashions, into their Versailles pools, they turned all the waters of the universe, popular melodies and rhythms, exotic and antique scales, new or old beats and intervals, just as before them the Impressionist painters had opened up a new world to the eyes, Christopher Columbus's of light, so the musicians were rushing on to the conquest of the world of sound. They pressed on into mysterious recesses of the world of hearing. They discovered new lands in that inward ocean. It was more than probable that they would do nothing with their conquests. As usual, the French were the harbingers of the world. Christophe admired the initiative of their music born of yesterday and already marching in the van of art. What valiance there was in the elegant tiny little creature! He found indulgence for the follies that he had lately seen in her. Only those who attempt nothing never make mistakes. But error, struggling on towards a living truth, is more fruitful and more blessed than dead truth. Whatever the results, the effort was amazing. Olivier showed Christophe the work done in the last thirty-five years, and the amount of energy expended in raising French music from the void in which it had slumbered before 1870. No symphonic school, no profound culture, no traditions, no masters, no public. The whole reduced to poor Bellios, who died of suffocation and weariness. And now Christophe felt a great respect for those who had been the labourers in the national revival. He had no desire now to jeer at their aesthetic narrowness or their lack of genius. They had created something much greater than music, a musical people. Among all the great toilers who had forged the new French music, one man was especially dear to him, César Franck, who died without seeing the victory for which he had paved the way, and yet, like old Schütz, through the darkest years of French art, had preserved intact the treasure of his faith and the genius of his race. It was a moving thing to see, amid pleasure-seeking Paris, the angelic master, the saint of music in a life of poverty and work despised, preserving the unimpeachable serenity of his patient soul, whose smile of resignation lit up his music in which is such great goodness. To Christophe, knowing nothing of the depths of the life of France, this great artist, adhering to his faith in the midst of a country of atheists, was a phenomenon almost a miracle. But Olivier would gently shrug his shoulders and ask if any other country in Europe could show a painter so wholly steeped in the spirit of the Bible as François Millet, a man of science more filled with burning faith and humility than the clear-sighted Pasteur, bowing down before the idea of the infinite, and when that idea possessed his mind, in bitter agony, as he himself has said, praying that his reason might be spared, so near it was to toppling over into the sublime madness of Pascal. Their deep-rooted Catholicism was no more a bar in the way of the heroic realism of the first of these two men than of the passionate reason of the other, who, sure of foot and not deviating by one step, went his way through the circles of elementary nature, the great night of the infinitely little, the ultimate abysses of creation in which life is born. It was among the people of the provinces from which they sprang that they had found this faith, which is for ever brooding on the soil of France, while in vain do windy demagogues struggle to deny it. Olivier knew well that faith. It had lived in his own heart and mind. He revealed to Christophe the magnificent movement towards a Catholic revival. 
which had been going on for the last twenty-five years the mighty effort of the christian idea in france to wed reason liberty and life the splendid priests who had the courage, as one of their number said, to have themselves baptized as men, and were claiming for Catholicism the right to understand everything and to join in every honest idea, for every honest idea, even when it is mistaken, is sacred and divine. The thousands of young Catholics banded by the generous vow to build a Christian republic, free, pure in brotherhood, open to all men of good will, and in spite of the odious attacks, the accusations of heresy, the treachery on all sides, right and left, especially on the right, which these great Christians had to suffer, the intrepid little legion advancing towards the rugged defile which leads to the future, serene of front, resigned to all trials and tribulations, knowing that no enduring edifice can be built except it be welded together with tears and blood. The same breath of living idealism and passionate liberalism brought new life to the other religions in France. The vast, slumbering bodies of Protestantism and Judaism were thrilling with new life. All in generous emulation had set themselves to create the religion of a free humanity, which should sacrifice neither its power for reason nor its power for enthusiasm. This religious exaltation was not the privilege of the religious. It was the very soul of the revolutionary movement. There it assumed a tragic character. Till now Christophe had only seen the lowest form of socialism, that of the politicians who dangled in front of the eyes of their famished constituents the coarse and childish dreams of happiness, or, to be frank, of universal pleasure, which science in the hands of power could, according to them, procure. Against such revolting optimism, Christophe saw the furious mystic reaction of the elite arise to lead the syndicates of the working classes on to battle. It was a summons to war which engenders the sublime, to heroic war, which alone can give the dying worlds a goal, an aim, an ideal. These great revolutionaries, spitting out such bourgeois, peddling, peacemongering English socialism, set up against it a tragic conception of the universe, whose law is antagonism, since it lives by sacrifice, perpetual sacrifice, eternally renewed. If there was reason to doubt that the army, which these leaders urged on to the assault upon the old world, could understand such warlike mysticism which applied both Kant and Nietzsche to violent action, Nevertheless, it was a stirring sight to see the revolutionary aristocracy, whose blind pessimism and furious desire for heroic life and exalted faith in war and sacrifice were like the militant religious ideal of some Teutonic order or the Japanese samurai. And yet they were all Frenchmen. They were of a French stock whose characteristics have endured unchanged for centuries. Seeing with Olivier's eyes, Christophe marked them in the tribunes and proconsuls of the convention, in certain of the thinkers and men of action and French reformers of the Ancien Régime, Calvinists, Jansenists, Jacobins, Syndicalists, in all there was the same spirit of pessimistic idealism, struggling against nature, without illusions and without loss of courage the iron bands which uphold the nation. Christophe drank in the breath of these mystic struggles, and he began to understand the greatness of that fanaticism into which France brought uncompromising faith and honesty, such as were absolutely unknown to other nations more familiar with combinazioni. Like all foreigners, it had pleased him at first to be flippant about the only too obvious contradiction between the despotic temper of the French and the magic formula which their republic wrote up on the walls of their buildings. Now, for the first time, he began to grasp the meaning of the bellicose liberty which they adored as the terrible sword of reason. No, it was not for them, as he had thought, mere sounding rhetoric and vague ideology. Among a people for whom the demands of reason transcend all others, the fight for reason dominated every other. What did it matter whether the fight appeared absurd to nations who called themselves practical? To eyes that see deeply, it is no less vain to fight for empire, or money, or the conquest of the world. In a million years there will be nothing left of any of these things. But if it is the fierceness of the fight that gives its worth to life— and uplifts all the living forces to the point of sacrifice to a superior being, then there are few struggles that do more honor life 
than the eternal battle waged in France for or against reason. And for those who have tasted the bitter savor of it, the much vaunted apathetic tolerance of the Anglo Saxons is dull and unmanly. The Anglo Saxons paid for it by finding elsewhere an outlet for their energy. Their energy is not in their tolerance, which is only great when between factions it becomes heroism. In Europe of today, it is most often indifference, want of faith, want of vitality. The English, adapting a saying of Voltaire, are fain to boast that diversity of belief has produced more tolerance in England than the Revolution has done in France. The reason is that there is more faith in the France of the Revolution than in all the creeds of England. From the circle of brass of militant idealism and the battles of reason, like Virgil leading Dante, Olivier led Christophe by the hand to the summit of the mountain, where, silent and serene, dwelt the small band of the elect of France who really were free. Nowhere in the world are there men more free. They have the serenity of a bird soaring in the still air. On such a height the air was so pure and rarefied that Christophe could hardly breathe. There he met artists who claimed the absolute and limitless liberty of dreams, men of unbridled subjectivity like Flaubert, despising the poor beasts who believe in the reality of things, thinkers who with supple and many-sided minds emulating the endless flow of moving things went on ceaselessly trickling and flowing, staying nowhere, nowhere, coming in contact with stubborn earth or rock, and depicted not the essence of life but the passage, as Montaigne said, the eternal passage, from day to day, from minute to minute. Men of science who knew the emptiness and void of the universe, wherein man has builded his idea, his god, his art, his science, and went on creating the world and its laws, that vivid day's dream. They did not demand of science either rest or happiness or even truth, for they doubted whether it were attainable. They loved it for itself because it was beautiful, because it alone was beautiful, and it alone was real. On the topmost pinnacles of thought, these men of science, passionately pyrrhonistic, indifferent to all suffering, all deceit, almost indifferent to reality, listened with closed eyes to the silent music of souls, the delicate and grand harmony of numbers and forms, these great mathematicians, these free philosophers, the most rigorous and positive minds in the world, had reached the uttermost limit of mystic ecstasy. They created a void about themselves. They hung over the abyss, they were drunk with its dizzy depths. Into the boundless night, with joy sublime, they flashed the lightnings of thought. Christophe leaned forward and tried to look over as they did, and his head swam. He who thought himself free because he'd broken away from all laws save those of his own conscience now became fearfully conscious of how little he was free compared with these Frenchmen, who were emancipated from every absolute law of mind, from every categorical imperative, from every reason for living. Why, then, did they live? For the joy of being free, replied Olivier. But Christophe, who was unsteadied by such liberty, thought regretfully of the mighty spirit of discipline and German authoritarianism, and he said, Your joy is a snare, the dream of an opium smoker. You make yourselves drunk with liberty and forget life. Absolute liberty means madness to the mind, anarchy to the state. Liberty. What man is free in this world? What man in your republic is free? Only the knaves. You, the best of the nation, are stilled. You can do nothing but dream. Soon you will not be able even to dream. No matter, said Olivier. My poor dear Christophe, you cannot know the delight of being free. It is worth while paying for it with so much danger and suffering, and even death, to be free, to feel that every mind about you, yes, even the knaves, is free, is a delicious pleasure, which it is impossible to express. It is as though your soul were soaring through the infinite air. It could not live otherwise. What should I do with the security you offer me, and your order, and your impeccable discipline, locked up in the four walls of your imperial barracks? I should die of suffocation. Air. Give me air. More and more of it. Liberty. More and more of that. There must be law in the world, replied Christophe. Sooner or later the master cometh. 
But Olivier laughed and reminded Christophe of the saying of old Pierre de L'Estoile. It is as little in the power of all the dominions of the earth to curb the French liberty of speech as to bury the sun in the earth or to shut it up inside a hole. End of section 30, read by Sandra, near Montreal, 2022. Section 31 of Jean-Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean-Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Canin. The House, Chapter 1, Part 4. Gradually, Christophe grew accustomed to the air of boundless liberty, from the lofty heights of French thought, where those minds dream that are all light, he looked down upon the slopes of the mountain at his feet, where the heroic elect, fighting for a living faith, whatever faith it might be, struggle eternally to reach the summit. Those who wage the holy war against ignorance, disease and poverty, the fever of invention, the mental delirium of the modern Prometheus and Icarus, conquering the light and marking out roads in the air the titanic struggle between science and nature being tamed, lower down, the little silent band, the men and women of good faith, those brave and humble hearts, who after a thousand efforts have climbed halfway, and can climb no farther, being held bound in a dull and difficult existence, while in secret they burn away in obscure devotion, lower still at the foot of the mountain, in a narrow gorge between rocky crags, the endless battle, the fanatics of abstract ideas and blind instincts, fiercely wrestling with never a suspicion that there may be something beyond, above the wall of rocks which hems them in, still lower, swamps and brutish beasts wallowing in the mire, and everywhere, scattered about the sides of the mountain, the fresh flowers of art, the scented strawberry plants of music, the song of the streams and the poet birds. And Christophe asked Olivier, where are your people? I see only the elect, all sorts, good and bad. Olivier replied, The people? They're tending their gardens. They never bother about us. Every group and faction among the elect strives to engage their attention. They pay no heed to anyone. There was a time when it amused them to listen to the humbug of the political mountebanks, but now they never worry about it. There are several millions who do not even make use of their rights as electors. The parties may break each other's heads as much as they like, and the people don't care one way or another, so long as they don't trample the crops in their wrangling. If that happens, then they lose their tempers and smash the parties indiscriminately. They do not act, they react in one way or another against all the exaggerations which disturb their work and their rest. Kings, emperors, republics, priests, Freemasons, socialists— Whatever their leaders may be, all that they ask of them is to be protected against the great common dangers, war, riots, epidemics, and for the rest to be allowed to go on tending their gardens. When all is said and done, they think, why won't these people leave us in peace? But the politicians are so stupid that they worry the people and won't leave off until they're pitched out with a fork, as will happen some day to our members of Parliament. There was a time when the people were embarked upon great enterprises. Perhaps that will happen again, although they sowed their wild oats long ago. In any case, their embarkations are never for long. Very soon they return to their age-old companion, the earth. It is the soil which binds the French to France, much more than the French. There are so many different races who for centuries have been tilling that brave soil side by side, that it is the soil which unites them, the soil which is their love. Through good times and bad they cultivate it unceasingly, and it is all good to them, even the smallest scrap of ground. Christophe looked down, as far as he could see along the road, around the swamps, on the slopes of rocky hills, over the battlefields and ruins of action, over the mountains and plains of France, all was cultivated and richly bearing. It was the great garden of European civilization. Its incomparable charm lay no less in the good fruitful soil than in the blind labours of an indefatigable people, who for centuries had never ceased to till and sow, and make the land ever more beautiful. A strange people, 
They are always called inconstant, but nothing in them changes. Olivier, looking backward, saw in Gothic statuary all the types of the provinces of today, and so in the drawings of a Cloet and a Du Moustier, the weary ironical faces of worldly men and intellectuals, or in the work of a Lanin, the clear eyes of the laborers and peasants of Ile de France or Picardy, and the thoughts of the men of old days lived in the minds of the present day. The mind of Pascal was alive not only in the elect of reason and religion, but in the brains of obscure citizens or revolutionary syndicalists. The art of Corneille and Racine was living for the people even more than for the elect, for they were less attainted by foreign influences. A humble clerk in Paris would feel more sympathy with the tragedy of the time of Louis XIV than with a novel of Tolstoy or a drama of Ibsen. The chants of the Middle Ages, the old French Tristan, would be more akin to the modern French than the Tristan of Wagner. The flowers of thought, which since the twelfth century have never ceased to blossom in French soil, however different they may be, were yet kin to one another, though utterly different from all the flowers about them. Christophe knew too little of France to be able to grasp how these characteristics had endured. What struck him most of all, in all the wide expanse of country, was the extremely small divisions of the earth. As Olivier had said, every man had his garden, and each garden, each plot of land, was separated from the rest by walls and quick-set hedges and enclosures of all sorts. At most there were only a few woods and fields in common, and sometimes the dwellers on one side of a river were forced to live nearer to each other than to the dwellers on the other. Every man shut himself up in his own house, and it seemed that this jealous individualism, instead of growing weaker after centuries of neighborhood, was stronger than ever. Christophe thought, how lonely they all are. In that sense, nothing could have been more characteristic than the house in which Christophe and Olivier lodged. It was a world in miniature, a little France, honest and industrious, without any bond which could unite its diverse elements. A five-storied house, a shaky house leaning over to one side with creaking floors and crumbling ceilings. The rain came through into the rooms under the roof in which Christophe and Olivier lived. They had had to have the workmen in to botch up the roof as best they could. Christophe could hear them working and talking overhead. There was one man in particular who amused and exasperated him. He never stopped talking to himself, and laughing and singing— and babbling nonsense and whistling inane tunes and holding long conversations with himself all the time he was working he was incapable of doing anything without proclaiming exactly what it was i'm going to put in another nail where's my hammer i'm putting in a nail two nails one more blow with the hammer there old lady that's it when christophe was playing he would stop for a moment and listen and then go on whistling louder than ever during a stirring passage he would beat time with his hammer on the roof. At last Christophe was so exasperated that he climbed on a chair and poked his head through the skylight of the attic to rate the man, but when he saw him sitting astride the roof with his jolly face and his cheeks stuffed out with nails, he burst out laughing and the man joined in, and not until they'd done laughing did he remember why he'd come to the window. "'By the way,' he said, "'I wanted to ask you. My playing doesn't interfere with your work?' The man said it did not, but he asked Christophe to play something faster, because as he worked in time to the music, slow tunes kept him back. They parted very good friends. In a quarter of an hour they had exchanged more words than in six months Christophe had spoken to the other inhabitants of the house. There were two flats on each floor, one of three rooms, the other of only two. There were no servants' rooms. Each household did its own housework, except for the tenants of the ground floor and the first floor, who occupied the two flats thrown into one. On the fifth floor, Christophe and Olivier's next-door neighbor was the Abbé Cornet, a priest of some forty years old, a learned man, an independent thinker, broad-minded, formerly a professor of exegesis in a great seminary, who had recently been censured by Rome for his modernist tendency. He had accepted the censure without submitting to it, in silence. He made no attempt to dispute it, and refused every opportunity offered to him of publishing his doctrine. He shrank from a noisy publicity, and would rather put up with the ruin of his ideas than figure in a scandal. Christophe could not understand that sort of revolt in resignation. 
he had tried to talk to the priest who however was coldly polite and would not speak of the things which most interested him and seemed to prefer as a matter of dignity to remain buried alive on the floor below in the flat corresponding to that of the two friends there lived a family of the name of elie elsberger an engineer his wife and their two little girls seven and ten years old superior and sympathetic people who kept themselves very much to themselves chiefly from a sort of false shame of their straitened means the young woman who kept her house most pluckily was humiliated by it she would have put up with twice the amount of worry and exhaustion if she could have prevented anybody knowing their condition and that too was a feeling which christophe could not understand they belonged to a protestant family and came from the east of france both man and wife a few years before had been bowled over by the storm of the dreyfus affair both of them had taken the affair passionately to heart and like thousands of french people they had suffered from the frenzy brought on by the turbulent wind of that exalted fit of hysteria which lasted for seven years they had sacrificed everything to it rest position relations they had broken off many dear friendships through it they had almost ruined their health for months at a time they did not sleep or act but went on bringing forward the same arguments over and over again with the monotonous insistence of the insane they screwed each other up to a pitch of excitement in spite of their timidity and their dread of ridicule they had taken part in demonstrations and spoken at meetings from which they returned with minds bewildered and aching hearts and they would weep together through the night in the struggle they had expended so much enthusiasm and passion that when at last victory was theirs they had not enough of either to rejoice it left them dry of energy and broken for life their hopes had been so high their eagerness for sacrifice had been so pure the triumph when it came had seemed a mockery compared to with what they had dreamed to such single-minded creatures for whom there could exist but one truth the bargaining of politics the compromises of their heroes had been bitter disappointment they had seen their comrades in arms men whom they had thought inspired with the same single passion for justice once the enemy was overcome swarming about the loot catching at power carrying off honours and positions and in their turn trampling justice underfoot only a mere handful of men held steadfast to their faith and in poverty and isolation rejected by every party rejecting every party they remained in obscurity cut off one from the other a prey to sorrow and neurasthenia left hopeless and disgusted with men and utterly weary of life the engineer and his wife were among these wretched victims they made no noise in the house they were morbidly afraid of disturbing their neighbours the more so as they suffered from their neighbours noises and they were too proud to complain christophe was sorry for the two little girls whose outbursts of merriment and natural need of shouting jumping about and laughing were continually being suppressed he adored children and he made friendly advances to his little neighbours when he met them on the stairs the little girls were shy at first but were soon on good terms with christophe who always had some funny story to tell them or sweetmeats in his pockets they told their parents about him and though at first they had been inclined to look askance at his advances they were won over by the frank open manners of their noisy neighbour whose piano playing and terrific disturbance overhead had often made them curse for christophe used to feel stifled in his room and take up pacing up and down like a caged bear they did not find it easy to talk to him christophe's rather boorish and abrupt manners sometimes made elie elsberger shudder but it was all in vain for the engineer to try to keep up the wall of reserve behind which he had taken shelter between himself and the german it was impossible to resist the impetuous good humour of the man whose eyes were so honest and affectionate and so free from any ulterior motive every now and then christophe managed to squeeze a little confidence out of his neighbour elsberger was a queer man full of courage yet apathetic sorrowful and yet resigned he had energy enough to bear a life of difficulty with dignity but not enough to change it it was as though he took a delight in justifying his own pessimism just at that time he had been offered a post in brazil as manager of an undertaking but he had refused as he was afraid of the climate and fearful of the health of his wife and children well leave them said christophe go alone and make their fortune leave them cried the engineer it's easy to see that you have no children 
I assure you that if I had, I should be of the same opinion. Never, never leave the country. No, I would rather suffer here. To Christophe it seemed an odd way of loving one's country and one's wife and children, to sit down and vegetate with them. Olivier understood. Just think, he said, of the risk of dying out there in a strange unknown country, far away from those you love. Anything is better than the horror of that. Besides, it isn't worth while taking so much trouble for the few remaining years of life. As though one always had to be thinking of death, said Christophe with a shrug. And even if that does happen, isn't it better to die fighting for the happiness of those one loves than to flicker out in apathy? End of section 31 Read by Sandra near Montreal, 2022. Section 32 of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canin. The House. Chapter 1. Part 5. On the same landing, in the smaller flat on the fourth floor, lived a journeyman electrician named Aubert. If he lived entirely apart from the other inhabitants of the house, it was not altogether his fault. He had risen from the lower class and had a passionate desire not to sink back into it. He was small and weakly looking. He had a harsh face and his forehead bulged over his eyes, which were keen and sharp and bored into you like a gimlet. He had a fair moustache, a satirical mouth, a sibilant way of speaking, a husky voice, a scarf round his neck, and he always had something the matter with his throat, in which irritation was set up by his perpetual habit of smoking. He was always feverishly active and had the consumptive temperament. He was a mixture of conceit, irony, and bitterness, cloaking a mind that was enthusiastic, bombastic, and naive, while it was always being taken in by life. He was the bastard of some burgess whom he had never known, and was brought up by a mother whom it was impossible to respect, so that in his childhood he had seen much that was sad and degrading. He had plied all sorts of trades, and had travelled much in France. He had an admirable desire for education, and had taught himself with frightful toil and labour. He read everything—history, philosophy, decadent poets. He was up to date in everything—theatres, exhibitions, concerts— he had a touching veneration for art, literature, and middle-class ideas. They fascinated him. He had imbibed the vague and ardent ideology which intoxicated the middle classes in the first days of the revolution. He had a definite belief in the infallibility of reason, in boundless progress, quo non ascendum, in the near advent of happiness on earth, in the omnipotence of science, in divine humanity, and in France the eldest daughter of humanity. He had an enthusiastic and credulous sort of anti-clericalism which made him lump together religion, especially Catholicism, and obscurantism, and see in priests the natural foe of light. Socialism, individualism, chauvinism jostled each other in his brain. He was a humanitarian in mind, despotic in temperament, and an anarchist in fact. He was proud and knew the gaps in his education, and in conversation he was very cautious. He turned to account everything that was said in his presence, but he would never ask advice. That humiliated him. Now, though he had intelligence and cleverness, these things could not altogether supply the defects of his education. He had taken it into his head to write. Like so many men in France who have not been taught, he had the gift of style and a clear vision, but he was a confused thinker. He had shown a few pages of his productions to a successful journalist in whom he believed, and the man made fun of him. He was profoundly humiliated, and from that time on never told a soul what he was doing. But he went on writing. It fed his need of expansion and gave him pride and delight. In his heart he was immensely pleased with his eloquent passages and philosophic ideas, which were not worth a brass farthing. And he set no store by his observation of real life, which was excellent. It was his crank to fancy himself as a philosopher, and he wished to write sociological plays and novels of ideas. He had no difficulty in solving all sorts of insoluble questions, and at every turn he discovered America. When in due course he found that America was already discovered, he was disappointed, humiliated, and rather bitter. 
He was never far from scenting injustice and intrigue. He was consumed by a thirst for fame and a burning capacity for devotion, which suffered from finding no means or direction of employment. He would have loved to be a great man of letters, a member of that literary elite who, in his eyes, were adorned with a supernatural prestige. In spite of his longing to deceive himself, he had too much good sense, and was too ironical not to know that there was no chance of its coming to pass. But he would at least have liked to live in that atmosphere of art and middle-class ideas which at a distance seemed to him so brilliant and pure and chastened of mediocrity. This innocent longing had the unfortunate result of making the society of the people with whom his condition in life forced him to live intolerable to him, and as the middle-class society which he wished to enter closed its doors to him, the result was that he never saw anybody. And so Christophe had no difficulty in making his acquaintance. On the contrary, he had very soon to bolt and bar against him, otherwise Aubert would have more often been in Christophe's rooms than Christophe in his— he was only too happy to find an artist to whom he could talk about music, plays, etc., but as one would imagine, Christophe did not find them so interesting. He would rather have discussed the people with a man who was of the people, but that was just what Aubert would not and could not discuss. In proportion as he went lower in the house, relations between Christophe and the other tenants became naturally more distant. Besides, some secret magic, some open sesame would have been necessary for him to reach the inhabitants of the third floor. In the one flat there lived two ladies who were under the self-hypnotism of grief for a loss that was already some years old. Madame Germain, a woman of thirty-five who had lost her husband and daughter, and lived in seclusion with her aged and devout mother-in-law. On the other side of the landing there dwelt a mysterious character of uncertain age, anything between fifty and sixty, with a little girl of ten. He was bald, with a handsome, well-trimmed beard, a soft way of speaking, distinguished manners, and aristocratic hands. He was called Monsieur Watelet. He was said to be an anarchist, a revolutionary, a foreigner from what country was not known, Russia, or Belgium. As a matter of fact, he was a northern Frenchman, and was hardly at all revolutionary, but he was living on his past reputation. He had been mixed up with the Commune of seventy-one, and condemned to death. He had escaped, how he did not know, and for ten years he had lived for a short time in every country in Europe. He had seen so many ill deeds during the upheaval in Paris, and afterwards, and also in exile, and also, since his return, ill deeds done by his former comrades now that they were in power, and also by men in every rank of the revolutionary parties, that he had broken with them peacefully keeping his convictions to himself useless and untarnished. He read much, wrote a few mildly incendiary books, pulled, so it was said, the wires of anarchist movements in distant places, in India or the Far East, busied himself with the universal revolution, and at the same time, with researches no less universal, but of a more genial aspect, namely, with the universal language, a new method of popular instruction in music. He never came in contact with anybody in the house. When he met any of its inmates, he did no more than bow to them with exaggerated politeness. However, he condescended to tell Christophe a little about his musical method. Christophe was not the least interested in it. The symbols of his ideas mattered very little to him. In any language, he would have managed somehow to express them. But Vatelet was not to be put off, and went on explaining his system gently but firmly. Christophe could not find out anything about the rest of his life, and so he gave up stopping when he met him on the stairs and only looked at the little girl who was always with him. She was fair, pale, anemic. She had blue eyes, rather a sharp profile, a thin little figure. She was always very neatly dressed, and she looked sickly, and her face was not very expressive. Like everybody else, he thought she was Vatelet's daughter. She was an orphan, the daughter of poor parents whom Vatelet had adopted when she was four or five, after the death of her father and mother in an epidemic. He had an almost boundless love for the poor, especially for poor children. It was a sort of mystic tenderness with him, as with Vincent de Paul. He distrusted official charity and knew exactly what philanthropic institutions were worth, and therefore he set about doing charity alone. He did it by stealth, and took a secret joy in it. He had learned medicine so as to be of some use in the world. 
One day, when he went to the house of a working man in the district and found sickness there, he turned to and nursed the invalids. He had some medical knowledge and turned it to account. He could not bear to see a child suffer. It broke his heart. But on the other hand, what a joy it was when he had succeeded in tearing one of these poor little creatures from the clutches of sickness, and the first pale smile appeared on the little pinched face. Then Vatala's heart would melt. Those were his moments of paradise. They made him forget the trouble he often had with his protégés, for they very rarely showed him much gratitude, and the housekeeper was furious at seeing so many people with dirty boots going up her stairs, and she would complain bitterly, and the proprietor would watch uneasily these meetings of anarchists and make remarks. Vatelet would contemplate leaving his flat, but that hurt him. He had his little whimsies. He was gentle and obstinate, and he put up with the proprietor's observations. Christophe won his confidence, up to a certain point, by the love he showed for children. That was their common bond. Christophe never met the little girl without a catch at his heart, for though he did not know why, by one of those mysterious similarities in outline which the instinct perceives immediately and subconsciously, the child reminded him of Sabine's little girl. Sabine, his first love, now so far away, the silent grace of whose fleeting shadow had never faded from his heart, and so he took an interest in the pale-faced little girl, whom he never saw romping or running, whose voice he hardly ever heard, who had no little friend of her own age, who was always alone, mum, quietly amusing herself with lifeless toys, a doll or a block of wood, while her lips moved as she whispered some story to herself. She was affectionate and a little off-handed in manner. There was a foreign and uneasy quality in her, but her adopted father never saw it. He loved her too much. Alas, does not that foreign and uneasy quality exist even in the children of our own flesh and blood? Christophe tried to make the solitary little girl friends with the engineer's children, but with both Elsberger and Vatelet he met with a polite but categorical refusal. These people seemed to make it a point of honour to bury themselves alive, each in his own mausoleum. If it came to a point, each would have been ready to help the other, but each was afraid of it being thought that he himself was in need of help, and as they were both equally proud and vain, and the means of both were equally precarious, there was no hope of either of them being the first to hold out his hand to the other. The larger flat on the second floor was almost always empty. The proprietor of the house reserved it for his own use, and he was never there. He was a retired merchant who had closed down his business as soon as he had made a certain fortune, the figure of which he had fixed for himself. He spent the greater part of the year in some hotel on the Riviera, and the summer at some watering-place in Normandy, living as a gentleman with private means who enjoys the illusion of luxury cheaply by watching the luxury of others, and, like them, leading a useless existence. The smaller flat was let to a childless couple, Monsieur and Madame Arnaud. The husband, a man of between forty and forty-five, was a master at school. He was so overworked with lectures and correcting exercises and giving classes that he had never been able to find time to write his thesis, and at last he had given it up altogether. The wife was ten years younger, pretty and very shy. They were both intelligent, well-read, in love with each other. They knew nobody and never went out. The husband had no time for it. The wife had too much time, but she was a brave little creature who fought down her fits of depression when they came over her, and hid them by occupying herself as best she could, trying to learn, taking notes for her husband, copying out her husband's notes, mending her husband's clothes, making frocks and hats for herself. She would have liked to go to the theatre from time to time, but Arnaud did not care about it. He was too tired in the evening, and she resigned herself to it. Their great joy was music. They both adored it. He could not play, and she dared not, although she could. When she played before anybody, even before her husband, it was like a child strumming. However, that was good enough for them, and Gluck, Mozart, Beethoven, whom they stammered out, were as friends to them. They knew their lives in detail, and their sufferings filled them with love and pity. Books, too, beautiful fine books, which they read together, gave them happiness. But there are few such books in the literature of today. Authors do not worry about those people who can bring them neither reputation nor pleasure nor money. Such humble readers who are never seen in society and do not write in any journal can only love and say nothing. The Silent Light of Art 
which in their upright and religious hearts assumed almost a supernatural character and their mutual affection were enough to make them live in peace happy enough though a little sad there's no gain saying that very lonely a little bruised in spirit they were both much superior to their position in life m arnaud was full of ideas but he had neither the time nor enough courage left to write them down it meant such a lot of trouble to get articles and books published it was not worth it futile vanity anything he could do was so small in comparison with the thinkers he loved he had too true a love for the great works of art to want to produce art himself it would have seemed to him pretentious impertinent and ridiculous it seemed to be his lot to spread their influence he gave his pupils the benefit of his ideas they would turn them into books later on without mentioning his name of course nobody spent more money than he in subscribing to various publications the poor are always the most generous they do buy their books the rich would take it as a slur upon themselves if they did not somehow manage to get them for nothing arnaud ruined himself in buying books it was his weakness his vice he was ashamed of it and concealed it from his wife but she did not blame him for it she would have spent just as much and with it all they were always making fine plans for saving with a view to going to italy some day though as they knew quite well they never would go and they were the first to laugh at their incapacity for keeping money arnaud would console himself his dear wife was enough for him and his life of work and inward joys was it not also enough for her she said it was she dared not say how dear it would have been to her if her husband could have some reputation which would in some sort be reflected upon herself and brighten her life and give her ease and comfort inward joys are beautiful but a little ray of light from without shining in from time to time is sweet and does so much good but she never said anything because she was timid and besides she knew that even if he wished to make a reputation it was by no means certain that he would succeed it was too late their greatest sorrow was that they had no children each hid that sorrow from the other and they were only the more tender with each other it was as though the poor creatures were striving to win one another's forgiveness madame arnaud was kind and affectionate she would gladly have been friends with madame elsberger but she dared not she was never approached as for christophe husband and wife would have asked nothing better than to know him they were fascinated by the music that they could hear faintly when he was playing but nothing in the world would have induced them to make the first move they would have thought it indiscreet the whole of the first floor was occupied by monsieur and madame felix Weil. they were rich jews and had no children and they spent six months of the year in the country near paris although they had lived in the house for twenty years they stayed there as a matter of habit although they could easily have found a flat more in keeping with their fortune they were always like passing strangers they had never spoken a word to any of their neighbours and no one knew any more about them than the day of their arrival but that was no reason why the other tenants should not pass judgment on them on the contrary they were not liked and no doubt they did nothing to win popularity and yet they were worthy of more acquaintance they were both excellent people and remarkably intelligent the husband a man of sixty was an assyriologist well known through his famous excavations in central asia like most of his race he was open-minded and curious and did not confine himself to his special studies he was interested in an infinite number of things the arts social questions every manifestation of contemporary thought but these were not enough to occupy his mind for they all amused him and none of them roused passionate interest he was very intelligent too intelligent too much emancipated from all ties always ready to destroy with one hand what he had constructed with the other for he was constructive always producing books and theories he was a great worker as a matter of habit and spiritual health he was always patiently ploughing his deep furrow in the field of knowledge without having any belief in the utility of what he was doing he had always had the misfortune to be rich so that he had never had the interest of the struggle for life and since his explorations in the east of which he had grown tired after a few years he had not accepted any official position outside his own personal work however he busied himself with clairvoyance contemporary problems social reforms of a practical and pressing nature the reorganization of public education in france he flung out ideas and created lines of thought 
he would set great intellectual machines working and would immediately grow disgusted with them. More than once he had scandalized people who had been converted to a cause by his arguments by producing the most incisive and discouraging criticisms of the cause itself. He did not do it deliberately. It was a natural necessity for him. He was very nervous and ironical in temper, and found it hard to bear with the foibles of things and people which he saw with the most disconcerting clarity. And as there is no good cause, nor any good man, who, seen at a certain angle or with a certain distortion, does not present a ridiculous aspect, there was nothing that, with his ironic disposition, he could go on respecting for long. All this was not calculated to make him friends, and yet he was always well disposed toward people and inclined to do good. He did much good. But no one was ever grateful to him, even those whom he had helped could not in their hearts forgive him because they had seen that they were ridiculous in his eyes. It was necessary for him not to see too much of men if he were to love them, not that he was a misanthrope. He was not sure enough of himself to be that. Face to face with the world at which he mocked, he was timid and bashful. At heart he was not at all sure that the world was not right and himself wrong. He endeavoured not to appear too different from other people, and strove to base his manners and apparent opinions on theirs— but he strove in vain, he could not help judging them. He was keenly sensible of any sort of exaggeration and anything that was not simple, and he could never conceal his irritation. He was especially sensible of the foibles of the Jews, because he knew them best, and as, in spite of his intellectual freedom which did not admit of barriers between races, he was often brought up sharp against those barriers which men of other races raised against him. As, in spite of himself, he was out of his element among Christian ideas, he retired with dignity into his ironic labours and the profound affection he had for his wife. Worst of all, his wife was not secure against his irony. She was a kindly busy woman, anxious to be useful and always taken up with various charitable works. Her nature was much less complex than that of her husband, and she was cramped by her moral benevolence and the rather rigidly intellectual, though lofty idea of duty that she had begotten. Her whole life, which was sad enough, without children, and with no great joy nor great love, was based on this moral belief of hers, which was more than anything else the will to believe. Her husband's irony had, of course, seized on the element of voluntary self-deception in her faith, and, if it was too strong for him, he had made much fun at her expense. He was a mass of contradictions. He had a feeling for duty no less lofty than his wife's and at the same time a merciless desire to analyze, to criticize, and to avoid deception, which made him dismember and take to pieces his moral imperative. He could not see that he was digging away the ground from under his wife's feet. He used cruelly to discourage her. When he realized that he had done so, he suffered even more than she, but the harm was done. It did not keep them from loving each other faithfully and working and doing good, but the cold dignity of the wife was not more kindly judged than the irony of the husband, and as they were too proud to publish abroad the good they did, or their desire to do good, their reserve was regarded as indifference, and their isolation as selfishness. And the more conscious they became of the opinion that was held of them, the more careful they were to do nothing to dispute it. Reacting against the coarse indiscretion of so many of their race, they were the victims of an excessive reserve which covered a vast deal of pride. As for the ground floor, which was a few steps higher than the little garden, it was occupied by Commandant Chabrin, a retired officer of the colonial artillery. He was still young, a man of great vigour who had fought brilliantly in the Sudan and Madagascar. Then suddenly he had thrown the whole thing up and buried himself there. He did not even want to hear the army mentioned and spent his time in digging his flower-beds and practising the flute, without making any progress, and growling about politics and scolding his daughter whom he adored. She was a young woman of thirty, not very pretty but quite charming, who devoted herself to him and had not married so as not to leave him. Christophe used often to see them leaning out of the window, and naturally he paid more attention to the daughter than the father. She used to spend part of the afternoon in the garden, sewing, dreaming, digging, always in high good humour with her grumbling old father. Christophe could hear her soft, clear voice laughingly replying to the growling tones of the commandant, whose footsteps ground and scrunched on the gravel paths, 
Then he would go in, and she would stay sitting on a seat in the garden, and so, for hours together, never stirring, never speaking, smiling vaguely while inside the house the bored old soldier played flourishes on his shrill flute, or by way of a change made a broken-winded old harmonium squeal and groan, much to Christophe's amusement or exasperation, which depended on the day and his mood. All these people went on living side by side in that house with its walled-in garden, sheltered from all the buffets of the world, hermetically sealed even against each other. Only Christophe, with his need of expansion and his great fullness of life, unknown to them, wrapped them about with his vast sympathy, blind yet all-seeing. He could not understand them. He had no means of understanding them. He lacked Olivier's psychological insight and quickness. But he loved them. Instinctively, he put himself in their place. Slowly, mysteriously, there crept through him a dim consciousness of these lives so near him and yet so far removed, the stupefying sorrow of the mourning woman, the stoic silence of all their proud thoughts, the priest, the Jew, the engineer, the revolutionary, the pale and gentle flame of tenderness and faith which burned in silence in the hearts of the two Arnauds, the naive aspirations towards the light of the man of the people, the suppressed revolt and fertile activity which were stifled in the bosom of the old soldier, and the calm resignation of the girl dreaming in the shade of the lilac. But only Christophe could perceive and hear the silent music of their souls. They heard it not. They were all absorbed in their sorrow and their dreams. They all worked hard, the sceptical old scientist, the pessimistic engineer, the priest, the anarchist, and all these proud or dispirited creatures and on the roof the mason sang. End of section 32, read by Sandra, near Montreal, 2022. Section 33 of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean-Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland Translated by Gilbert Canin The House Chapter 1, Part 6 In the district round the house, among the best of people, Christophe found the same moral solitude, even when the people were banded together. Olivier had brought him in touch with a little review for which he wrote. It was called Aesop, and had taken for its motto this quotation from Montaigne. Aesop was put up for sale with two other slaves. The purchaser inquired of the first what he could do, and he, to put a price upon himself, described all sorts of marvels. The second said as much for himself or more. When it came to Aesop's turn, and he was asked what he could do, nothing, he said, for these two have taken everything, they can do everything. End quote. Their attitude was that of pure reaction against the impudence, as Montaigne says, of those who profess knowledge and their overweening presumption. The self-styled skeptics of the Aesop Review were at heart men of the firmest faith, but their mask of irony and haughty ignorance, naturally enough, had small attraction for the public. Rather, it repelled. The people are only with a writer when he brings them words of simple, clear, vigorous, and assured life. They prefer a sturdy lie to an anemic truth. Skepticism is only to their liking when it is the covering of lusty naturalism or Christian idolatry. The scornful Pyrrhonism in which the Aesop clothed itself could only be acceptable to a few minds, Aemi Stignosi, who knew the solid worth behind it. It was force absolutely lost upon action and life. There was no help for it. The more democratic France became, the more aristocratic did her ideas, her art, her science, seem to grow. Science securely lodged behind its special languages, in the depths of its sanctuary wrapped about with a triple veil which only the initiate had the power to draw, was less accessible than at the time of Buffon and the encyclopedists. Art, that art at least which had some respect for itself and the worship of beauty, was no less hermetically sealed. It despised the people, even among writers who cared less for beauty than for action, among those who gave moral ideas precedence over aesthetic ideas. There was often a strange dominance of the aristocratic spirit. 
they seemed to be more intent upon preserving the purity of their inward flame than to communicate its warmth to others it was as though they desired not to make their ideas prevail but only to affirm them and yet among these writers there were some who applied themselves to popular art among the most sincere some hurled into their writings destructive anarchical ideas truths of the distant future which might be beneficent in a century or so but for the time being corroded and scorched the soul others wrote bitter or ironical plays robbed of all illusion sad to the last degree christophe was left in a state of collapse hamstrung for a day or two after he read them and you give that sort of thing to the people he would ask feeling sorry for the poor audiences who had come to forget their troubles for a few hours only to be presented with these lugubrious entertainments it's enough to make them all go and drown themselves you may be quite easy on that score said olivier laughing the people don't go and a jolly good thing too you're mad are you trying to rob them of every scrap of courage to live why isn't it right to teach them to see the sadness of things as we do and yet to go on and do their duty without flinching without flinching i doubt that but it's very certain that they'll do it without pleasure and you don't go very far when you've destroyed a man's pleasure in living what else can one do one has no right to falsify the truth nor have you any right to tell the whole truth to everybody you say that you who are always shouting the truth aloud you who pretend to love truth more than anything in the world yes truth for myself and those whose backs are strong enough to bear it but it is cruel and stupid to tell it to the rest yes i see that now at home that would never have occurred to me in germany people are not so morbid about the truth as they are here they are too much taken up with living very wisely they see only what they wish to see i love you for not being like that you are honest and go straight ahead but you are inhuman when you think you have unearthed a truth you let it loose upon the world without stopping to think whether like the foxes in the bible with their burning tails it will not set fire to the world i think it is fine of you to prefer truth to your happiness but when it comes to the happiness of other people then i say stop you are taking too much upon yourselves thou shalt love truth more than thyself but thy neighbour more than truth is one to lie to one's neighbour christophe replied with the words of goethe quote, we should only express those of the highest truths which will be to the good of the world the rest we must keep to ourselves like the soft rays of a hidden sun they will shed their light upon all our actions End quote. but they were not moved by these scruples they never stopped to think whether the bow in their hands shot ideas or death or both together they were too intellectual they lacked love when a frenchman has ideas he tries to impose them on others he tries to do the same thing when he has none and when he sees that he cannot do it he loses interest in other people he loses interest in action that was the chief reason why this particular group took so little interest in politics save to moan and groan each of them was shut up in his faith or want of faith many attempts had been made to break down their individualism and to form groups of these men but the majority of these groups had immediately resolved themselves into literary clubs or split up into absurd factions the best of them were mutually destructive there were among them some first-rate men of force and faith men well fitted to rally and guide those of weaker will but each man had his following and would not consent to merging it with that of other men so they were split up into a number of reviews unions associations which had all the moral virtues save one self-denial for not one of them would give way to the others and while they wrangled over the crumbs that fell from an honest and well-meaning public small in numbers and poor in purse they vegetated for a short time starved and languished and at last collapsed never to rise again not under the assault of the enemy but most pitiful under the weight of their own quarrels the various professions men of letters dramatic authors poets prose writers professors members of the institute journalists 
were divided up into a number of little casts which they themselves split up again into smaller casts each one of which closed its doors against the rest there was no sort of mutual interchange there was no unanimity on any subject in france except at those very rare moments when unanimity assumed an epidemic character and as a rule was in the wrong for it was morbid a crazy individualism predominated in every kind of french activity in scientific research as well as in commerce in which it prevented businessmen from combining and organizing working agreements this individualism was not that of a rich and bustling vitality but that of obstinacy and self-repression to be alone to owe nothing to others not to mix with others for fear of feeling their inferiority in their company not to disturb the tranquillity of their haughty isolation these were the secret thoughts of almost all men who found it outside reviews outside theatres outside groups reviews theatres groups all most often had no other reason for existing than the desire not to be with the general herd and an incapacity for joining with other people in a common idea or course of action distrust of other people or at the very worst party hostility setting one against the other the very men who were most fitted to understand each other even when men who thought highly of each other were united in some common task like olivier and his colleagues on the aesop review they always seemed to be on their guard with each other they had nothing of that open-handed geniality so common in germany where it is apt to become a nuisance among these young men there was one especially who attracted christophe because he divined him to be a man of exceptional force he was a writer of inflexible logic and will with a passion for moral ideas in the service of which he was absolutely uncompromising and ready in their cause to sacrifice the whole world and himself he had founded and conducted almost unaided a review in which to uphold them he had sworn to impose on europe and on france the idea of a pure heroic and free france he firmly believed that the world would one day recognize that he was responsible for one of the boldest pages in the history of french thought and he was not mistaken christophe would have been only too glad to know him better and to be his friend but there was no way of bringing it about although olivia had a good deal to do with him they saw very little of each other except on business they never discussed any intimate matter and never got any farther than the exchange of a few abstract ideas or rather for to be exact there was no exchange and each adhered to his own ideas they soliloquized in each other's company in turn however they were comrades in arms and knew their worth there were innumerable reasons for this reservedness reasons difficult to discern even for their own eyes the first reason was a too great critical faculty which saw too clearly the unalterable differences between one mind and another backed by an excessive intellectualism which attached too much importance to those differences they lacked that prescient and naive sympathy whose vital need is of love the need of giving out its overflowing love then too perhaps overwork the struggle for existence the fever of thought which so taxes strength that by the evening there is none left for friendly intercourse had a great deal to do with it and there was that terrible feeling which every frenchman is afraid to admit though too often it is stirring in his heart the feeling of not being of one race the feeling that the nation consists of different races established at different epochs on the soil of france who though all bound together have few ideas in common and therefore ought not in the common interest to ponder them too much but above all the reason was to seek in the intoxicating and dangerous passion for liberty to which when a man has once tasted it there is nothing that he will not sacrifice such solitary freedom is all the more precious for having been bought by years of tribulation the select few have taken refuge in it to escape the slavishness of the mediocre it is a reaction against the tyranny of the political and religious masses the terrific crushing weight which overbears the individual in france the family public opinion the state secret societies parties coteries schools imagine a prisoner who to escape has to scale twenty great walls hemming him in if he manages to clear them all without breaking his neck and above all without losing heart he must be strong indeed a rough schooling for free will 
but those who have gone through it bear the marks of it all their life in the mania for independence and the impossibility of their ever living in the lives of others side by side with this loneliness of pride there was the loneliness of renunciation there were many many good men in france whose goodness and pride and affection came to nothing in withdrawal from life a thousand reasons good and bad stood in the way of action for them with some it was obedience timidity force of habit with others human respect fear of ridicule fear of being conspicuous of being a mark for the comments of the gallery of meddling with things that did not concern them of having their disinterested actions attributed to motives of interest there were men who would not take part in any political or social struggle women who declined to undertake any philanthropic work because there were too many people engaged in these things who lacked conscience and even common sense and because they were afraid of the taint of these charlatans and fools in almost all such people there are disgust weariness dread of action suffering ugliness stupidity risks responsibilities the terrible what's the use which destroys the good will of so many of the french of to-day they are too intelligent their intelligence has no wide sweep of the wings they are too intent upon reasons for and against they lack force they lack vitality when a man's life beats strongly he never wonders why he goes on living he lives for the sake of living because it is a splendid thing to be alive in fine the best of them were a mixture of sympathetic and average qualities a modicum of philosophy moderate desires fond attachment to the family the earth moral custom discretion dread of intruding of being a nuisance to other people modesty of feeling unbending reserve all these amiable and charming qualities could in certain cases be brought into line with serenity courage and inward joy but at bottom there was a certain connection between them and poverty in the blood the progressive ebb of french fatality the pretty garden beneath the house in which christophe and olivier lived tucked away between the four walls was symbolical of that part of the life of france it was a little patch of green earth shut off from the outer world only now and then did the mighty wind of the outer air whirling down bring to the girl dreaming there the breath of the distant fields and the vast earth now that christophe was beginning to perceive the hidden resources of france he was furious that she should suffer the oppression of the rabble the half-light in which the select and silent few were huddled away stifled him stoicism is a fine thing for those whose teeth are gone but he needed the open air the great public the sunshine of glory the love of thousands of men and women he needed to hold close to him those whom he loved to pulverize his enemies to fight and to conquer you can said olivier you're strong you were born to conquer through your faults forgive me as well as through your qualities you're lucky enough not to belong to a race and a nation which are too aristocratic action does not repel you if need be you could even become a politician besides you have the inestimable good fortune to write music nobody understands you and so you can say anything and everything if people had any idea of the contempt for themselves which you put into your music and your faith in what they deny and your perpetual hymn in praise of what they are always trying to kill they would never forgive you and you would be so fettered and persecuted and harassed that you would waste most of your strength in fighting them when you had beaten them back you would have no breath left for going on with your work your life would be finished the great men who triumph have the good luck to be misunderstood they are admired for the very opposite of what they are poof said christophe you don't understand how cowardly your masters are at first i thought you were alone and i used to find excuses for your inaction but as a matter of fact there's a whole army of you all of the same mind you are a hundred times stronger than your oppressors you are a thousand times more worthy and you let them impose on you with their effrontery i don't understand you you live in a most beautiful country you're gifted with the finest intelligence and the most human quality of mind and with it all you do nothing you allow yourselves to be overborne and outraged and trampled underfoot by a parcel of fools good lord be yourselves don't wait for heaven or a napoleon to come to your aid 
Arise, band yourselves together, get to work, all of you, sweep out your house. But Olivier shrugged his shoulders and said wearily and ironically, Grapple with them? No, that is not our game. We have better things to do. Violence disgusts me. I know only too well what would happen. All the old embittered failures, the young royalist idiots, the odious apostles of brutality and hatred, would seize on anything I did and bring it to dishonor. Do you want me to adopt the old device of hate? Fuari barbari, or France for the French? Why not? asked Christophe. No, such a device is not for the French. Any attempt to propagate it among our people under cover of patriotism must fail. It is good enough for barbarian countries, but our country has no use for hatred. Our genius never yet asserted itself by denying or destroying the genius of other countries, but by absorbing them. Let the troublous north and the loquacious south come to us. And the poisonous east? And the poisonous east. We will absorb it with the rest. We have absorbed many others. I just laugh at the air of triumph, they assume, and the pusillanimity of some of my fellow countrymen. They think they have conquered us. They strut about our boulevards and in our newspapers and reviews, and in our theatres and in the political arena. Idiots! It is they who are conquered. They will be assimilated after having fed us. Gaul has a strong stomach. In these twenty centuries she's digested more than one civilization. We are proof against poison. It is meet that you Germans should be afraid. You must be pure or impure. But with us it is not a matter of purity, but of universality. You have an emperor. Great Britain calls herself an empire. But in fact it is our Latin genius that is imperial. We are the citizens of the city of the universe. Orbis, orbis. That is all very well, said Christophe, as long as the nation is healthy and in the flower of its manhood. But there will come a day when its energy declines, and then there is a danger of its being submerged by the influx of foreigners. Between ourselves, does it not seem as though that day had arrived? People have been saying that for ages. Again and again our history has given the lie to such fears. We've passed through many different trials since the days of the Maid of Orléans, when Paris was deserted and bands of wolves prowled through the streets. Neither in the prevalent immorality, nor the pursuit of pleasure, nor the laxness, nor the anarchy of the present day, do I see any cause for fear. Patience. Those who wish to live must endure in patience. I am sure that presently there will be a moral reaction, which will not be much better, and will probably lead to an equal degree of folly. Those who are now living on the corruptness of public life will not be the least clamorous in the reaction. But what does that matter to us? All these movements do not touch the real people of France. Rotten fruit does not corrupt the tree. It falls. Besides, all these people are such a small part of the nation. What does it matter to us whether they live or die? Why should I bother to organize leagues and revolutions against them? The existing evil is not the work of any form of government. It is the leprosy of luxury, a contagion spread by the parasites of intellectual and material wealth. Such parasites will perish. After they've sapped your vitality. It is impossible to despair of such a race. There is in it such hidden virtue, such a power of light and practical idealism, that they creep into the veins even of those who are exploiting and ruining the nation. Even the grasping, self-seeking politicians succumb to its fascination. Even the most mediocre of men, when they're in power, are gripped by the greatness of its destiny. It lifts them out of themselves. The torch is passed on from hand to hand among them. One after another they resume the holy war against darkness. They are drawn onward by the genius of the people, willy-nilly. They fulfill the law of the God whom they deny. Gesta Dei per Francos. O oh, my beloved country, I will never lose my faith in thee. And though in thy trials thou didst perish, yet should I find in that only a reason the more for my proud belief, even to the bitter end in our mission in the world. I will not have my beloved France fearfully shutting herself up in a sick room and closing every inlet to the outer air. I have no mind to prolong a sickly existence. When a nation has been so great as we have been, 
then it were far better to die rather than to sink from greatness. Therefore let the ideas of the world rush into the channels of our minds. I am not afraid. The floor will go down of its own accord after it has enriched the soil of France with its ooze. My poor dear fellow, said Christophe, but it's a grim prospect in the meanwhile. Where will you be when your France emerges from the Nile? Don't you think it would be better to fight against it? You wouldn't risk anything except defeat, and you seem inclined to impose that on yourself as long as you like. I should be risking much more than defeat, said Olivier. I should be running the risk of losing my peace of mind, which I prize far more than victory. I will not be a party to hatred. I will be just to all my enemies. In the midst of passion, I wish to preserve the clarity of my vision, to understand and love everything. But Christophe, to whom this love of life, detached from life, seemed to be very little different from resignation and acceptance of death, felt in his heart, as in Empedocles of old, the stirring of a hymn to hatred and to love, the brother of hate, fruitful love, tilling and sowing good seed in the earth. He did not share Olivier's calm fatalism. He had no such confidence in the continuance of a race which did not defend itself, and his desire was to appeal to all the healthy forces of the nation, to call forth and band together all the honest men in the whole of France. Just as it is possible to learn more of a human being in one minute of love than in months of observation, so Christophe had learned more about France in a week of intimacy with Olivier, hardly ever leaving the house, than during a whole year of blind wandering through Paris, and standing at attention at various intellectual and political gatherings, amid the universal anarchy in which he had been floundering, a soul like that of his friend seemed to him veritably to be the Ile de France, the island of reason and serenity in the midst of the ocean. The inward peace which was in Olivier was all the more striking, inasmuch as it had no intellectual support, as it existed amid unhappy circumstances, in poverty and solitude, while the country of its birth was decadent, and as its body was weak, sickly, and nerve-ridden. That serenity was apparently not the fruit of any effort of will striving to realize it. Olivier had little will. It came from the depths of his being and his race. In many of the men of Olivier's acquaintance, Christophe perceived the distant light of that Greek, Sophrosane, the silent calm of the motionless sea, and he, who knew none better the stormy, troublous depths of his own soul, and how he had to stretch his willpower to the utmost to maintain the balance in his lusty nature, marvelled at its veiled harmony. What he had seen of the inner France had upset all his preconceived ideas about the character of the French. Instead of a gay, sociable, careless, brilliant people, he saw men of a headstrong and close temper, living in isolation, wrapped about with a seeming optimism like a gleaming mist, while they were in fact steeped in a deep-rooted and serene pessimism, possessed by fixed ideas, intellectual passions, indomitable souls, which it would have been easier to destroy than to alter. No doubt these men were only the select few among the French, but Christophe wondered where they could have come by their stoicism and their faith. Olivier told him, In defeat. It is you, my dear Christophe, who have forged us anew. Ah, but we suffered for it, too. You can have no idea of the darkness in which we grew up in a France humiliated and sore, which had come face to face with death and still felt the heavy weight of the murderous menace of force. Our life, our genius, our French civilization, the greatness of a thousand years. We were conscious that France was in the hands of a brutal conqueror who did not understand her and hated her in his heart, and at any moment might crush the life out of her forever, and we had to live for that and no other destiny. Have you ever thought of the French children born in houses of death in the shadow of defeat, fed with ideas of discouragement, trained to strike for a bloody, fatal, and perhaps futile revenge? For even as babies the first thing they learned was that there was no justice. There was no justice in the world. Might prevailed against right. For a child to open its eyes upon such things is for its soul to be degraded or uplifted forever. Many succumbed, they said. Since it is so, why struggle against it? Why do anything? Everything is nothing. We will not think of it. Let us enjoy ourselves. 
but those who stood out against it are proof against fire no disillusion can touch their faith for from their earliest childhood they have known that their road could never lead them near the road to happiness and that they had no choice but to follow it else they would suffocate such assurance is not come by all at once it is not to be expected of boys of fifteen there is bitter agony before it is attained and many tears are shed but it is well that it should be so it must be so o oh, faith virgin of steel dig deep with thy lance into the downtrodden hearts of the peoples peoples in silence christophe pressed olivier's hand dear christophe said olivier your germany has made us suffer indeed and Christophe begged for forgiveness almost as though he'd been responsible for it. There's nothing for you to worry about, said Olivier, smiling. The good it has unintentionally done us far outweighs the ill. You have rekindled our idealism. You have revived in us the keen desire for knowledge and faith. You have filled our France with schools. You've raised to the highest pitch the creative powers of a pastor whose discoveries are alone worth more than your indemnity of two hundred million. You have given new life to our poetry, our painting, our music. To you we owe the new awakening of the consciousness of our race. We have reward enough for the effort needed to learn to set our faith before our happiness, for in doing so we have come by a feeling of such moral force that amid the apathy of the world we have no doubt even of victory in the end. Though we are few in number, my dear Christophe, though we seem so weak, a drop of water in the ocean of German power, we believe that the drop of water will, in the end, color the whole ocean. The Macedonian phalanx will destroy the mighty armies of the plebs of Europe. Christophe looked down at the puny Olivier, in whose eyes there shone the light of faith, and he said, Poor weakly little Frenchman, you are stronger than we are. Oh, beneficent defeat, Olivia went on. Blessed be that disaster. We will no more deny it. We are its children. End of section 33. Read by Sandra, Montreal, 2022. Section 34 of Jean-Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean-Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Canot. The House, Chapter 2, Part 1 Defeat, new forges the chosen among men. It sorts out the people. It winnows out those who are purest and strongest and makes them purer and stronger but it hastens the downfall of the rest, or cuts short their flight. In that way it separates the mass of the people who slumber or fall by the way from the chosen few who go marching on. The chosen few know it and suffer. Even in the most valiant there is a secret melancholy, a feeling of their own impotence and isolation. Worst of all, cut off from the great mass of their people, they are also cut off from each other. Each must fight for his own hand. The strong among them think only of self-preservation. O oh, man, help thyself. They never dream that the sturdy saying means, O oh, men, help yourselves. In all there is a want of confidence. They lack free-flowing sympathy and do not feel the need of common action which makes a race victorious, the feeling of overflowing strength, of reaching upward to the zenith. Christophe and Olivier knew something of all this, in Paris full of men and women who could have understood them, in the house, peopled with unknown friends, they were as solitary as in a desert of Asia. They were very poor, their resources were almost nil. Christophe had only the copying and transcriptions of music given him by Hecht. Olivier had very unwisely thrown up his post at the university during the period of depression following on his sister's death, which had been accentuated by an unhappy love affair with a young lady he'd met at Madame Nathan's. He had never mentioned it to Christophe, for he was modest about his troubles. Part of his charm lay in the little air of mystery which he always preserved about his private affairs, even with his friend, from whom, however, he made no attempt to conceal anything. 
In his depressed condition, when he had longed for silence, his work as a lecturer became intolerable to him. He never cared for the profession, which necessitates a certain amount of showing off and thinking aloud while it gives a man no time to himself. If teaching in a school is to be at all a noble thing, it must be a matter of a sort of apostolic vocation, and that Olivier did not possess in the slightest degree and lecturing for any of the faculties means being perpetually in contact with the public which is a grim fate for a man like olivier with a desire for solitude on several occasions he had to speak in public it gave him a singular feeling of humiliation at first he loathed being exhibited on a platform he saw the audience felt it as with antennae and knew that for the most part it was composed of idle people who were there only for the sake of having something to do and the role of official entertainer was not at all to his liking. Worst of all, speaking from a platform is almost bound to distort ideas. If the speaker does not take care, there is a danger of his passing gradually from a certain theatricality in gesture, diction, attitude, and the form in which he presents his ideas, to mental trickery. A lecture is a thing hovering in the balance between tiresome comedy and polite pedantry. For an artist who is rather bashful and proud, a lecture which is a monologue shouted in the presence of a few hundred unknown silent people, a ready-made garment warranted to fit all sizes, though it actually fits no one, is a thing intolerably false. Olivier, being more and more under the necessity of withdrawing into himself and saying nothing which was not wholly the expression of his thought, gave up the profession of teaching which he had had so much difficulty in entering, and as he no longer had his sister to check him in his tendency to dream, he began to write. He was naive enough to believe that his undoubted worth as an artist could not fail to be recognized without his doing anything to procure recognition. He was quickly undeceived. He found it impossible to get anything published. He had a jealous love of liberty which gave him a horror of everything that might impinge on it and made him live apart like a poor, starved plant among the solid masses of the political churches whose baleful associations divided the country and the press between them. He was just as much cut off from all the literary coteries and rejected by them. He had not, nor could he have, a single friend among them. He was repelled by the hardness, the dryness, the egoism of the intellectuals, except for the very few who were following a real vocation, or were absorbed by a passionate enthusiasm for scientific research. That man is a sorry creature who has let his heart atrophy for the sake of his mind, when his mind is small. In such a man there is no kindness, only a brain like a dagger in a sheath. There is no knowing, but it will one day cut your throat. Against such a man it is necessary to be always armed." Friendship is only possible with honest men who love fine things for their own sake and not for what they can make out of them, those who live outside their art. The majority of men cannot breathe the atmosphere of art. Only the very great can live in it, without loss of love, which is the source of life. Olivier could only count on himself, and that was a very precarious support. Any fresh step was a matter of extreme difficulty to him. He was not disposed to accept humiliation for the sake of his work. He went hot with shame at the base and obsequious homage which young authors forced themselves to pay to a well-known theatre manager who took advantage of their cowardice and treated them as he would never dare to treat his servants. Olivier could never have done that to save his life. He just sent his manuscripts by post, or left them at the offices of the theatres or the reviews where they lay for months unread. However, one day— by chance, he met one of his old schoolfellows, an amiable loafer, who had still a sort of grateful admiration for him for the ease and readiness with which Olivier had done his exercises. He knew nothing at all about literature, but he knew several literary men, which was much better. He was rich and in society, something of a snob, and so he let them discreetly exploit him. He put in a word for Olivier with the editor of an important review in which he was a shareholder— and at once one of his forgotten manuscripts was disinterred and read, and after much temporization, for if the article seemed to be worth something, the author's name being unknown was valueless, they decided to accept it. When he heard the good news, Olivier thought his troubles were over. They were only just beginning. 
It's comparatively easy to have an article accepted in Paris, but getting it published is quite a different matter. The unhappy writer has to wait and wait for months, if need be for life, if he has not acquired the trick of flattering people or bullying them and showing himself from time to time at receptions of these petty monarchs and reminding them of his existence and making it clear that he means to go on being a nuisance to them as long as they make it necessary. Olivier just stayed at home and wore himself out with waiting. At best, he would write a letter or two which were never answered. He would lose heart and be unable to work. It was quite absurd, but there was nothing to be done. He would wait for post after post, sitting at his desk with his mind blanketed by all sorts of vague injuries. Then he would get up and go downstairs to the porter's room and look hopefully in his letter-box, only to meet with disappointment. He would walk blindly about, with no thought in his head but to go back and look again, and when the last post had gone, when the silence of his room was broken only by the heavy footsteps of the people in the room above, he would feel strangled by the cruel indifference of it all. Only a word of reply. Only a word. Could that be refused him, if only in charity? And yet those who refused him that had no idea of the hurt they were dealing him. Every man sees the world in his own image. Those who have no life in their hearts see the universe as withered and dry, and they never dream of the anguish of expectation, hope, and suffering which rends the hearts of the young, or if they give it a thought they judge them coldly, with the weary, ponderous irony of those who are surfeited and beyond the freshness of life. At last the article appeared. Olivier had waited so long that it gave him no pleasure. The thing was dead for him, and yet he hoped desperately that it would be a living thing for others. There were flashes of poetry and intelligence in it which could not pass unnoticed. It fell upon absolute silence. He made two or three more attempts. Being attached to no clique, he met with silence or hostility everywhere. He could not understand it. He had thought simply that everybody must be naturally well disposed towards the work of a new man, even if it was not very good. It always represents such an amount of work, and surely people would be grateful to a man who's tried to give others a little beauty, a little force, a little joy. But he only met with indifference or disparagement, and yet he knew that he could not be alone in feeling what he'd written, and that it must be in the minds of other good men. He did not know that such good men did not read him, and had nothing to do with literary opinion, or with anything, or with anything. If here and there there were a few men whom his words had reached, men who sympathized with him, they would never tell him so. They remained immured in their unnatural silence, just as they refrained from voting, so they took no share in art. They did not read books, which shocked them. They did not go to the theatre, which disgusted them. But they let their enemies vote, elect their enemies, engineer a scandalous success and a vulgar celebrity for books and plays and ideas, which only represented an impudent minority of the people of France. Since Olivier could not count on those who were mentally akin to himself as they did not read, he was delivered up to the hosts of the enemy, to the mercy of men of letters, who were for the most part hostile to his ideas, and the critics who were at their beck and call. His first bouts with them left him bleeding. He was as sensitive to criticism as old Bruchner, who could not bear to have his work performed because he'd suffered so much from the malevolence of the press. He did not even win the support of his former colleagues at the university, who, thanks to their profession, did preserve a certain sense of the intellectual traditions of France and might have understood him. But for the most part, these excellent young men, cramped by discipline, absorbed in their work, often rather embittered by their thankless duties, could not forgive Olivier for trying to break away and do something else. Like good little officials, many of them were inclined only to admit the superiority of talent when it was consonant with hierarchic superiority. In such a position, three courses were open to him, to break down resistance by force, to submit to humiliating compromises, or to make up his mind to write only for himself. Olivier was incapable of the two first. He surrendered to the third. To make a living he went through the drudgery of teaching and went on writing, 
and as there was no possibility of his work attaining full growth in publicity, it became more and more involved, chimerical and unreal. Christophe dropped like a thunderbolt into the midst of his dim crepuscular life. He was furious at the wickedness of people and Olivier's patience. "'Have you no blood in your veins?' he would say. "'How can you stand such a life? "'You know your own superiority to these swine, "'and yet you let them squeeze the life out of you without a murmur.' "'What can I do?' Olivier would say. "'I can't defend myself. "'It revolts me to fight with people I despise. "'I know that they can use every weapon against me, and I can't.' Not only should I loathe to stoop to use the means they employ, but I would be afraid of hurting them. When I was a boy, I used to let my schoolfellows beat me as much as they liked. They used to think me a coward, and that I was afraid of being hit. I was more afraid of hitting than of being hit. I remember someone saying to me one day, when one of my tormentors was bullying me, Why don't you stop it once and for all, and give him a kick in the stomach? That filled me with horror. I would much rather be thrashed. There's no blood in your veins, said Christophe, and on top of that, all sorts of Christian ideas. Your religious education in France is reduced to the catechism, the immaculate gospel, the tame, boneless New Testament, humanitarian claptrap, always tearful, and the revolution, Jean-Jacques, Robespierre, quarante-huit, and on top of that, the Jews. Take a dose of the full-blooded Old Testament every morning. Olivier protested. He had a natural antipathy for the Old Testament, a feeling which dated back to his childhood when he used secretly to pore over an illustrated Bible which had been in the library at home, where it was never read, and the children were even forbidden to open it. The prohibition was useless. Olivier could never keep the book open for long. He used quickly to grow irritated and saddened by it, and then he would close it, and he would find consolation in plunging into the Iliad, or the Odyssey, or the Arabian Nights. The gods of the Iliad are men, beautiful, mighty, vicious. I can understand them, said Olivier. I like them or dislike them. Even when I dislike them, I still love them. I'm in love with them. More than once with Patroclus, I have kissed the lovely feet of Achilles as he lay bleeding. But the God of the Bible is an old Jew, a manic, a monomaniac, a raging madman who spends his time in growling and hurling threats and howling like an angry wolf, raving to himself in the confinement of that cloud of his. I don't understand him. I don't love him. His perpetual curses make my head ache, and his savagery fills me with horror. The burden of Moab, the burden of Damascus, the burden of Babylon, the burden of Egypt, the burden of the desert of the sea, the burden of the valley of vision. He's a lunatic who thinks himself judge, public prosecutor, and executioner rolled into one, and even in the courtyard of his prison he pronounces sentence of death on the flowers and the pebbles. One is stupefied by the tenacity of his hatred, which fills the book with bloody cries. Quote, the cry of destruction, the cry is gone round the borders of Moab, the howling thereof unto Eglaim, and the howling thereof unto Be'erelim. Every now and then he takes a rest and looks round on his massacres and the little children done to death, and the women outraged and butchered, and he laughs like one of the captains of Joshua, feasting after the sack of a town. Quote, and the Lord of hosts shall make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wine on the lees well refined. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. End quote. But worst of all is the perfidy with which this God sends his prophet to make men blind, so that in due course he may have a reason for making them suffer. Quote, make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Lord, 
how long, until the cities be wasted without inhabitants and the houses without men and the land be utterly desolate. End quote. Oh, I have never found a man so evil as that. I am not so foolish as to deny the force of the language, but I cannot separate thought and form, and if I do occasionally admire this Hebrew god, it is with the same sort of admiration that I feel for a viper, or a, I'm trying in vain to find a Shakespearean monster as an example, I can't find one, even Shakespeare never begat such a hero of hatred, saintly and virtuous hatred. Such a book is a terrible thing. Madness is always contagious, and that particular madness is all the more dangerous inasmuch as it sets up its own murderous pride as an instrument of purification. England makes me shudder when I think that her people have for centuries been nourished on no other fare. I'm glad to think that there is the dyke of the channel between them and me. I shall never believe that a nation is altogether civilized as long as the Bible is its staple food. In that case, said Christophe, you will have to be just as much afraid of me, for I get drunk on it. It is the very marrow of a race of lions. Stout hearts are those which feed on it. Without the antidote of the Old Testament, the gospel is tasteless and unwholesome fare. The Bible is the bone and sinew of nations with the will to live. A man must fight, and he must hate. I hate hatred, said Olivier. I only wish you did, retorted Christophe. You're right. I am too weak even for that. What would you? I can't help seeing the arguments in favour of my enemies, and I say to myself over and over again, like Chardin, gentleness, gentleness. What a silly sheep you are, said Christophe. But whether you like it or not, I'm going to make you leap the ditch you're shying at, and I'm going to drag you on and beat the big drum for you. In the upshot, he took Olivier's affairs in hand and set out to do battle for him. His first efforts were not very successful. He lost his temper at the very outset and did his friend much harm by pleading his cause. He recognized what he had done very quickly and was in despair at his own clumsiness. Olivier did not stand idly by. He went and fought for Christophe. In spite of his fear and dislike of fighting, in spite of his lucid and ironical mind, which scorned any sort of exaggeration in word and deed, when it came to defending Christophe he was far more violent than anybody else, and even than Christophe himself. He lost his head. Love makes a man irrational, and Olivier was no exception to the rule. However, he was cleverer than Christophe. Though he was uncompromising and clumsy in handling his own affairs, when it came to promoting Christophe's success he was politic and even tricky. He displayed an energy and ingenuity well calculated to win support. He succeeded in interesting various musical critics and maecenases in Christophe, though he would have been utterly ashamed to approach them with his own work. In spite of everything they found it very difficult to better their lot. Their love for each other made them do many stupid things. Christophe got into debt over getting a volume of Olivier's poems published secretly, and not a single copy was sold. Olivier induced Christophe to give a concert, and hardly anybody came to it. Faced with the empty hall, Christophe consoled himself bravely with Handel's quip. Splendid! My music will sound all the better. But these bold attempts did not repay the money they cost and they would go back to their rooms full of indignation at the indifference of the world. End of section 34, read by Sandra, Montreal, 2022. Section 35 of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Canon. The House, Chapter Two, Part Two. In their difficulties, the only man who came to their aid was a Jew, a man of forty named Tadé Mout. He kept an art photograph shop, but although he was interested in his trade and brought much taste and skill to bear on it, he was interested in so many things outside it that he was apt to neglect his business for them. When he did attend to his business, he was chiefly engaged in perfecting technical devices, and he would lose his head over new reproduction processes, 
which in spite of their ingenuity hardly ever succeeded and always cost him a great deal of money. He was a voracious reader and was always hard on the heels of every new idea in philosophy, art, science, and politics. He had an amazing knack of finding out men of originality and independence of character. It was as though he answered to their magnetism. He was a sort of connecting link between Olivier's friends, who were all as isolated as himself, and all working in their several directions. He used to go from one to the other, and through him there was established between them a complete circuit of ideas, though neither he nor they had any notion of it. When Olivier first proposed to introduce him to Christophe, Christophe refused. He was sick of his experiences with the tribe of Israel. Olivier laughed and insisted on it, saying that he knew no more of the Jews than he did of France. At last Christophe consented, but when he saw Tade Mouch, he made a face. In appearance, Mouch was extraordinarily Jewish. He was the Jew as he's drawn by those who dislike the race, short, bald, badly built, with a greasy nose, and heavy eyes goggling behind large spectacles. His face was hidden by a rough, black, scrubby beard. He had hairy hands, long arms, and short, bandy legs, a little Syrian ball but he had such a kindly expression that Christophe was touched by it. Above all, he was very simple and never talked too much. He never paid exaggerated compliments, but just dropped the right word, pat. He was very eager to be of service, and before any kindness was asked of him, it would be done. He often came, too often, and he almost always brought good news, work for one or other of them, a commission for an article or a lecture for Olivier or music lessons for Christophe. He never stayed long. It was a sort of affectation with him, never to intrude. Perhaps he saw Christophe's irritation, for his first impulse was always towards an ejaculation of impatience when he saw the bearded face of the Carthaginian idol. He used to call him Moloch, a peer round the door, but the next moment it would be gone, and he would feel nothing but gratitude for his perfect kindness. Kindness is not a rare quality with the Jews. Of all the virtues, it is the most readily admitted among them, even when they do not practice it. Indeed, in most of them, it remains negative or neutral. Indulgence, indifference, dislike for hurting anybody, ironic tolerance. With Moot, it was an active passion. He was always ready to devote himself to some cause or person, to his poor co-religionists, to the Russian refugees, to the oppressed of every nation, to unfortunate artists to the alleviation of every kind of misfortune, to every generous cause. His purse was always open, and however thinly lined it might be, he could always manage to squeeze a mite out of it. When it was empty, he would squeeze the mite out of someone else's purse. If he could do anyone a service, no pains were too great for him to take, no distance was too far for him to go. He did it simply with exaggerated simplicity. He was a little apt to talk too much about his simplicity and sincerity, but the great thing was that he was both simple and sincere. Christophe was torn between irritation and sympathy with Moot, and one day he said an innocently cruel thing, though he said it with the air of a spoiled child. Moot's kindness had touched him, and he took his hands affectionately and said, What a pity! What a pity it is that you are a Jew! Olivier started and blushed as though the shaft had been levelled at himself. He was most unhappy and tried to heal the wound his friend had dealt. Mooch smiled with sad irony and replied calmly, It is an even greater misfortune to be a man. To Christophe the remark was nothing but the whim of a moment, but its pessimism cut deeper than he imagined, and Olivier, with his subtle perception, felt it intuitively. Beneath the mooch of their acquaintance there was another, different mooch, who was in many ways exactly the opposite. His apparent nature was the result of a long struggle with his real nature. Though he was apparently so simple, he had a distorted mind. When he gave way to it, he was forced to complicate simple things and to endow his most genuine feelings with a deliberately ironical character. Though he was apparently modest, and if anything too humble, at heart he was proud and knew it and strove desperately to whip it out of himself. His smiling optimism, his incessant activity, his perpetual business in helping others were the mask of a profound nihilism, a deadly despondency which dared not see itself face to face. Mooch made a show of immense faith in all sorts of things, 
in the progress of humanity, in the future of the pure Jewish spirit, in the destiny of France, the soldier of the new spirit, he was apt to identify the three causes. Olivier was not taken in by it, and used to say to Christophe, at heart he believes in nothing. With all his ironical common sense and calmness, Mouch was a neurasthenic, who dared not look upon the void within himself. He had terrible moments when he felt his nothingness. Sometimes he would wake suddenly in the middle of the night, screaming with terror, and he would cast about for things to do, like a drowning man clinging to a life-boy. It is a costly privilege to be a member of a race which is exceedingly old. It means the bearing of a frightful burden of the past, trials and tribulations, weary experience, disillusion of mind and heart, all the ferment of immemorial life, at the bottom of which is a bitter deposit of irony and boredom. Boredom, the immense boredom of the Semites, which has nothing in common with our Aryan boredom, though that too makes us suffer, while it is at least traceable to definite causes and vanishes when those causes cease to exist. For in most cases it is only the result of regret that we cannot have what we want, but in some of the Jews the very source of joy and life is tainted with a deadly poison. They have no desire, no interest in anything, no ambition, no love, no pleasure. Only one thing continues to exist, not intact, but morbid and fine-drawn in these men, uprooted from the East, worn out by the amount of energy they have had to give out for centuries, longing for quietude without having the power to attain it, thought, endless analysis which forbids the possibility of enjoyment and leaves them no courage for action. The most energetic among them set themselves parts to play, and play them, rather than act on their own account. It is a strange thing that in many of them, and not in the least intelligent or least seriously minded, this lack of interest in life prompts the impulse or the unavowed desire to act a part, to play at life, the only means they know of living. Mooch was an actor after his fashion. He rushed about to try to deaden his senses. But whereas most people only bestir themselves for selfish reasons, he was restlessly active in procuring the happiness of others. His devotion to Christophe was both touching and a bore. Christophe would snub him and then immediately be sorry for it. But Mooch never bore him any ill will. Nothing abashed him. Not that he had any ardent affection for Christophe. It was devotion that he loved rather than the men to whom he devoted himself. They were only an excuse for doing good, for living. He laboured to such effect that he managed to induce Hecht to publish Christophe's David and some other compositions. Hecht appreciated Christophe's talent, but he was in no hurry to reveal it to the world. It was not until he saw that Mouch was on the point of arranging the publication at his own expense with another firm that he took the initiative out of vanity. And on another occasion, when things were very serious and Olivier was ill and they had no money, Mouch thought of going to Felix Weil, the rich archaeologist who lived in the same house. Mouch and Weil were acquainted, but had little sympathy with one another. They were too different. Mooch's restlessness and mysticism and revolutionary ideas and vulgar manners, which perhaps he exaggerated, were an incentive to the irony of Felix Weil, with his calm, mocking temper, his distinguished manners and conservative mind. They had only one thing in common. They were both equally lacking in any profound interest in action, and if they did indulge in action, it was not from faith, but from their tenacious and mechanical vitality. But neither was prepared to admit it. They preferred to give their minds to the parts they were playing, and their different parts had very little in common, and so Mooch was quite coldly received by Weil when he tried to interest him in the artistic projects of Olivier and Christophe. He was brought up sharp against a mocking scepticism. Mooch's perpetual embarkations for one utopia or another were a standing joke in Jewish society, where he was regarded as a dangerous visionary. But on this occasion, as on so many others, he was not put out and he went on speaking about the friendship of Christophe and Olivier until he roused Weil's interest. He saw that and went on. He had touched a responsive chord. The friendless, solitary old man worshipped friendship. The one great love of his life had been a friendship which he had left behind him. It was his inward treasure. When he thought of it, he felt a better man. 
He had founded institutions in his friend's name, and had dedicated his books to his memory. He was touched by what Much told him of the mutual tenderness of Christophe and Olivier. His own story had been something like it. His lost friend had been a sort of elder brother to him, a comrade of youth, a guide whom he had idolized. That friend had been one of those young Jews, burning with intelligence and generous ardor, who suffer from the hardness of their surroundings and set themselves to uplift their race, and through their race the world, and burn hotly into flame and, like a torch of rosin, flare for a few hours and then die. The flame of his life had kindled the apathy of young Val. He had raised him from the earth. While his friend was alive, Val had marched by his side in the shining light of his stoical faith, faith in science, in the power of the spirit, in a future happiness, the rays of which were shed upon everything with which that messianic soul came in contact. When he was left alone, in his weakness and irony, Val fell from the heights of that idealism into the sands of that book of Ecclesiastes which exists in the mind of every Jew and saps his spiritual vitality. But he had never forgotten the hours spent in the light with his friend. Jealously he guarded its clarity, now almost entirely faded. He had never spoken of him to a soul, not even to his wife whom he loved. It was a sacred thing, and the old man who was considered prosaic and dry of heart and nearing the end of his life used to say to himself the bitter and tender words of a Brahmin of ancient India, quote, The poisoned tree of the world puts forth two fruits sweeter than the waters of the fountain of life. One is poetry, the other friendship. End quote. From that time on he took an interest in Christophe and Olivier. He knew how proud they were, and got Mooch without saying anything, to send him Olivier's volume of poems, which had just been published, and without the two friends having anything to do with it, without their having even the smallest idea of what he was up to, he managed to get the Academy to award the book a prize, which came in the nick of time to help them in their difficulty. When Christophe discovered that such unlooked-for assistance came from a man of whom he was inclined to think ill, he regretted all the unkind things he'd said or thought of him. He gulped down his dislike of calling and went and thanked him. His good intentions met with no reward. Old Val's irony was excited by Christophe's young enthusiasm, although he tried hard to conceal it from him, and they did not get on at all well. That very day, when Christophe returned irritated, though still grateful, to his attic, after his interview with Val, he found Mooch there, doing Olivier some fresh act of service, and also a review containing a disparaging article on his music by Lucien Lévicard. It was not written in a vein of frank criticism, but took the insultingly kindly line of chafing him and banteringly considering him alongside certain third-rate and fourth-rate musicians whom he loathed. You see, said Christophe to Olivier, after Mooch had gone, we always have to deal with Jews, nothing but Jews. Perhaps we're Jews ourselves. Do tell me that we're not. We seem to attract them. We're always knocking up against them, both friends and foes. The reason is, said Olivier, that they are more intelligent than the rest. The Jews are almost the only people in France to whom a free man can talk of new and vital things. The rest are stuck fast in the past among dead things. Unfortunately, the past does not exist for the Jews, or at least it is not the same for them as for us. With them we can only talk about the things of today. With their fellow countrymen, we can only discuss the things of yesterday. Look at the activity of the Jews in every kind of way. Commerce, industry, education, science, philanthropy, art. Don't let's talk about art, said Christophe. I don't say that I'm always in sympathy with what they do. Very often I detest it. But at least they are alive and can understand men who are alive. It's all very well for us to criticize and make fun of the Jews and speak ill of them. We can't do without them. Don't exaggerate, said Christophe jokingly. I could do without them perfectly. You might go on living, perhaps, but what good would that be to you if your life and your work remained unknown as they probably would without the Jews? Would the members of your own religion come to your assistance? The Catholic Church lets the best of its members perish without raising a hand to help them. Men who are religious from the very bottom of their hearts, men who give their lives in the defense of God, 
if they have dared to break away from catholic dominion and shake off the authority of rome at once find the unworthy mob who call themselves catholic not only indifferent but hostile they condemn them to silence and abandon them to the mercy of the common enemy if a man of independent spirit be he never so great and christian at heart is not a christian as a matter of obedience it is nothing to the catholics that in him is incarnate all that is most pure and most truly divine in their faith he is not of the pack the blind and deaf sect which refuses to think for itself he is cast out and the rest rejoice to see him suffering alone torn to pieces by the enemy and crying for help to those who are his brothers for whose faith he is done to death in the Catholicism of today there is a horrible death-dealing power of inertia. It would find it far easier to forgive its enemies than those who wish to wake it and restore it to life. My dear Christophe, where should we be and what should we do, we who are Catholics by birth, we who have shaken free without the little band of free Protestants and Jews? The Jews in Europe of today are the most active and living agents of good and evil, they carry hither and thither the pollen of thought. Have not your worst enemies and your friends from the very beginning been Jews? That's true, said Christophe. They have given me encouragement and help, and said things to me which have given me new life for the struggle, by showing me that I was understood. No doubt very few of my friends have remained faithful to me. Their friendship was but a fire of straw. No matter. That fleeting light is a great thing in darkness. You're right. We mustn't be ungrateful. We must not be stupid, either, replied Olivier. We must not mutilate our already diseased civilization by lopping off some of its most living branches. If we were so unfortunate as to have the Jews driven from Europe, we should be left so poor in intelligence and power for action that we should be in danger of utter bankruptcy. In France, especially in the present condition of French vitality, their expulsion would mean a more deadly drain on the blood of the nation than the expulsion of the Protestants in the 17th century. No doubt, for the time being, they do occupy a position out of all proportion to their true merit. They do take advantage of the present moral and political anarchy, which in no small degree they help to aggravate because it suits them, and because it's natural to them to do so. The best of them, like our friend Mooch, make the mistake in all sincerity of identifying the destiny of France with their Jewish dreams, which are often more dangerous than useful. But you can't blame them for wanting to build France in their own image. It means that they love the country. If their love becomes a public danger, all we have to do is to defend ourselves and keep them in their place, which in France is the second. Not that I think their race inferior to ours— all these questions of the supremacy of races are idiotic and disgusting, but we cannot admit that a foreign race which has not yet been fused into our own can possibly know better than we do what suits us. The Jews are well off in France, I'm glad of it. They must not think of turning France into Judea. An intelligent and strong government which was able to keep the Jews in their place would make them one of the most useful instruments for the building of the greatness of France— and it would be doing both them and us a great service. These hyper-nervous, restless, and unsettled creatures need the restraint of law and the firm hand of a just master, in whom there is no weakness, to curb them. The Jews are like women, admirable when they are reined in. But with the Jews, as with women, their use of mastery is an abomination, and those who submit to it present a pitiful and absurd spectacle. In spite of their love for each other and the intuitive knowledge that came with it, there were many things which Christophe and Olivier could not understand in each other, things, too, which shocked them. In the beginning of their friendship, when each tried instinctively only to suffer the existence of those qualities in himself which were most like the qualities of his friend, they never remarked them. It was only gradually that the different aspects of their two nationalities appeared on the surface again, more sharply defined than before for being in contrast, each showed the other up. There were moments of difficulty, moments when they clashed, which with all their fond indulgence they could not altogether avoid. Sometimes they misunderstood each other. Olivier's mind was a mixture of faith, liberty, passion, irony, and universal doubt, for which Christophe could not find any working formula. Olivier, on his part, was distressed by Christophe's lack of psychology, being of an old intellectual stock and therefore aristocratic, 
he was moved to smile at the awkwardness of such a vigorous though lumbering and single mind which had no power of self-analysis and was always being taken in by others and by itself christophe's sentimentality his noisy outbursts his facile emotions used sometimes to exasperate olivier to whom they seemed absurd not to speak of a certain worship of force the german conviction of the excellence of fist morality faustrecht to which olivier and his countrymen had good reason for not subscribing and christophe could not bear olivier's irony which used sometimes to make him furious with exasperation he could not bear his mania for arguing his perpetual analysis and the curious intellectual immorality which was surprising in a man who set so much store by moral purity as olivier and arose from the very breadth of his mind to which every kind of negation was detestable so that he took a delight in the contemplation of ideas the opposite of his own olivier's outlook on things was in some sort historical and panoramic it was so necessary for him to understand everything that he always saw reasons both for and against and supported each in turn according as the opposite thesis was put forward and so amid such contradictions he lost his way he would leave christophe hopelessly perplexed it was not that he had any desire to contradict or any taste for paradox it was an imperious need in him for justice and common sense he was exasperated by the stupidity of any assumption and he had to react against it the prudeness with which christophe judged immoral men and actions by seeing everything as much coarser and more brutal than it really was distressed olivier who was just as moral but was not of the same unbending steel he allowed himself to be tempted coloured and moulded by outside influences he would protest against Christos' exaggerations and fly off into exaggeration in the opposite direction. Almost every day this perverseness of mind would make him take up the cudgels for his adversaries against his friends. Christophe would lose his temper. He would cry out upon Olivier's sophistry and his indulgence of hateful things and people. Olivier would smile. He knew the utter absence of illusion that lay behind his indulgence he knew that christophe believed in many more things than he did and had a greater power of acceptance but christophe would look neither to the right hand nor the left but went straight ahead he was especially angry with parisian kindness their great argument of which they are so proud in favour of pardoning rascals is he would say that all rascals are sufficiently unhappy in their wickedness or that they are irresponsible or diseased in the first place it's not true that those who do evil are unhappy that's a moral idea in action a silly melodramatic idea stupid empty optimism such as you find in scribe and capus scribe and capus your parisian great men artists of whom your pleasure-seeking vulgar society is worthy childish hypocrites too cowardly to face their own ugliness it is quite possible for a rascal to be a happy man he has every chance of being so and as for his irresponsibility that's an idiotic idea do have the courage to face the fact that nature does not care a rap about good and evil and is so far malevolent that a man may easily be a criminal and yet perfectly sound in mind and body virtue is not a natural thing it's the work of man it is his duty to defend it human society has been built up by a few men who were stronger and greater than the rest it is their duty to see that the work of so many ages of frightful struggles is not spoiled by the cowardly rabble at bottom there was no great difference between these ideas and olivier's but by a secret instinct for balance and proportion he was never so dilettante as when he heard provocative words thrown out don't get so excited my friend he would say to christophe let the world hug its vices like the friends in the decameron let us breathe in peace the balmy air of the gardens of thought while under the cypress hill and the tall shady pines twined about with roses florence is devastated by the black plague he would amuse himself for days together by pulling to pieces art science philosophy to find their hidden wheels so he came by a sort of pyrrhonism in which everything that was became only a figment of the mind a castle in the air which had not even the excuse of the geometric symbols of being necessary to the mind christophe would rage against his pulling the machine to pieces it was going quite well you'll probably break it 
Then how will you be better off? What are you trying to prove? That nothing is nothing? Good Lord, I know that. It is because nothingness creeps in upon us from every side that we fight. Nothing exists. I exist. There's no reason for doing anything. I'm doing what I can. If people like death, let them die. For my part, I'm alive, and I'm going to live. My life is in one scale of the balance, my mind and thought in the other. To hell with thought. He would fly off with his usual violence, and in their argument he would say things that hurt. Hardly had he said them, than he was sorry. He would long to withdraw them, but the harm was done. Olivier was very sensitive. His skin was easily barked. A harsh word, especially if it came from someone he loved, hurt him terribly. He was too proud to say anything and would retire into himself, and he would see in his friend those sudden flashes of unconscious egoism which appear in every great artist. Sometimes he would feel that his life was no great thing to Christophe compared with a beautiful piece of music. Christophe hardly troubled to disguise the fact. He would understand and see that Christophe was right, but it made him sad. And then there were in Christophe's nature all sorts of disordered elements which eluded Olivier and made him uneasy. He used to have sudden fits of a freakish and terrible humour. For days together he would not speak, or he would break out in diabolically malicious moods and try deliberately to hurt. Sometimes he would disappear altogether and be seen no more for the rest of the day and part of the night. Once he stayed away for two whole days. God knows what he was up to. He was not very clear about it himself. The truth was that his powerful nature shut up in that narrow life and those small rooms, as in a hen coop, every now and then reached bursting point. His friend's calmness maddened him, and he would long to hurt him, to hurt someone. He would have to rush away and wear himself out. He would go striding through the streets of Paris and the outskirts in the vague quest of adventure which sometimes he found, and he would not have been sorry to meet with some rough encounter which would have given him the opportunity of expending some of his superfluous energy in a brawl. It was hard for Olivier, with his poor health and weakness of body, to understand. Christophe was not much nearer understanding it. He would wake up from his aberrations as from an exhausting dream, a little uneasy and ashamed of what he'd been doing and might yet do, but when the fit of madness was over he would feel like a great sky washed by the storm, purged of every taint, serene and sovereign of his soul. He would be more tender than ever with Olivier, and bitterly sorry for having hurt him. He would give up trying to account for their little quarrels, the wrong was not always on his side, but he would take all the blame upon himself and put it down to his unjust passion for being right, and he would think it better to be wrong with his friend than to be right if right were not on his side. Their misunderstandings were especially grievous when they occurred in the evening, so that the two friends had to spend the night in disunion, which meant that both of them were morally upset. Christophe would get up and scribble a note and slip it under Olivier's door, and next day, as soon as he woke up, he would beg his pardon. Sometimes, even, he would knock at his door in the middle of the night. He could not bear to wait for the day to come before he humbled himself. As a rule, Olivier would be just as unable to sleep. He knew that Christophe loved him and had not wished to hurt him, but he wanted to hear him say so. Christophe would say so, and then the whole thing would be forgotten. Then they would be pacified. Delightful state. How well they would sleep for the rest of the night. Ah, Olivier would sigh, how difficult it is to understand each other. But is it necessary always to understand each other? Christophe would ask. I give it up. We only need love each other. All these petty quarrels, which with anxious tenderness they would at once find ways of mending, made them almost dearer to each other than before. When they were hotly arguing, Antoinette would appear in Olivier's eyes. The two friends would pay each other womanish attentions. Christophe never let Olivier's birthday go by without celebrating it, by dedicating a composition to him, or by the gift of flowers, or a cake, or a little present, bought heaven knows how, for they often had no money in the house. Olivier would tire his eyes out with copying out Christophe's scores at night and by stealth. Misunderstandings between friends are never very serious, so long as a third party does not come between them, but that was bound to happen. There are too many people in this world ready to meddle in the affairs of others and make mischief between them. End of section 35 
Read by Sandra near Montreal, 2022. Section 36 of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canon. The House, Chapter 2, Part 3 Olivier knew the Stevens, whom Christophe rarely visited, and he too had been attracted by Colette. The reason why Christophe had not met him in the girl's little court was that just at that time Olivier was suffering from his sister's death and had shut himself up with his grief and saw no one. Colette, on her part, did not go out of her way to see him. She liked Olivier, but she did not like unhappy people— she used to declare that she was so sensitive that she could not bear the sight of sorrow. She waited until Olivier's sorrow was over before she remembered his existence. When she heard that he seemed to be himself again, and that there was no danger of infection, she made bold to beckon him to her. Olivier did not need much inducement to go. He was shy, but he liked society, and he was easily led, and he had a weakness for Colette. When he told Christophe of his intention of going back to her, Christophe, who had too much respect for his friend's liberty to express any adverse opinion, just shrugged his shoulders and said jokingly, "'Go, dear boy, if it amuses you.' But nothing would have induced him to follow his example. He had made up his mind to have nothing more to do with a coquette like Colette, or the world she lived in. Not that he was a misogynist, far from it. He had a very tender feeling for all the young women who worked for their living, the factory hands and typists and government clerks— who are to be seen every morning half awake, always a little late, hurrying to their workshops and offices. It seemed to him that a woman was only in possession of all her senses when she was working and struggling for her own individual existence by earning her daily bread and her independence. And it seemed to him that only then did she possess all her charm, her alert suppleness of movement, the awakening of all her senses, her integrity of life and will. He detested the idle, pleasure-seeking woman who seemed to him to be only an overfed animal, perpetually in the act of digestion, bored, browsing over unwholesome dreams. Olivier, on the contrary, adored the farniente of women, their charm like the charm of flowers living only to be beautiful and to perfume the air about them. He was more of an artist. Christophe was more human. Unlike Colette, Christophe loved other people in proportion as they shared in the suffering of the world, so between him and them there was a bond of brotherly compassion. Colette was particularly anxious to see Olivier again, after she heard of his friendship with Christophe, for she was curious to hear the details. She was rather angry with Christophe for the disdainful manner in which he seemed to have forgotten her, and though she had no desire for revenge— was not worth the trouble, and revenge does mean a certain amount of trouble. She would have been very glad to pay him out. She was like a cat that bites the hand that strokes it. She had an ingratiating way with her, and she had no difficulty in getting Olivier to talk. Nobody could be more clear-sighted than he, or less easily taken in by people when he was away from them. But nobody could be more naively confiding than he when he was with a woman whose eyes smiled kindly at him. Colette displayed so genuine an interest in his friendship with Christophe that he went so far as to tell her the whole story, and even about certain of their amicable misunderstandings, which at a distance seemed amusing, and he took the whole blame for them on himself. He also confided to Colette Christophe's artistic projects, and also some of his opinions which were not altogether flattering concerning France and the French. Nothing that he told her was of any great importance in itself, but Colette repeated it all at once, and adapted it partly to make the story more spicy, and partly to satisfy her secret feeling of malice against Christophe. And as the first person to receive her confidence was naturally her inseparable Lucien Lévicard, who had no reason for keeping it secret, the story went the rounds, and was embellished by the way. A note of ironic pity for Olivier, who was represented as a victim, was introduced, and he cut rather a sorry figure. It seemed unlikely that the story could be very interesting to anybody, since the heroes of it were very little known, but a Parisian takes an interest in everything that does not concern him. 
so much so that one day Christophe heard the story from the lips of Madame Roussa. She met him one day at a concert, and asked him if it were true that he had quarrelled with that poor Olivier Jeannin, and she asked about his work and alluded to things which he believed were known only to himself and Olivier. And when he asked her how she'd come by her information, she said she had had it from Lucien Le Vicard, who had had it direct from Olivier. The blow overwhelmed Christophe. Violent and uncritical as he was, it never occurred to him to think how utterly fantastic the story was. He only saw one thing. His secrets, which he had confided to Olivier, had been betrayed. Betrayed to Lucien Le Vicard. He could not stay to the end of the concert. He left the hall at once. Around him all was blank and dark. In the street he narrowly escaped being run over. He said to himself over and over again, My friend has betrayed me. Olivier was with Colette. Christophe locked the door of his room, so that when Olivier came in he could not have his usual talk with him. He heard him come in a few moments later and try to open the door and whisper good night through the keyhole. He did not stir. He was sitting on his bed in the dark, holding his head in his hands and saying, over and over again, My friend has betrayed me. And he stayed like that, half through the night. Then he felt how dearly he loved Olivier, for he was not angry with him for having betrayed him. He only suffered. Those whom we love have absolute rights over us, even the right to cease loving us. We cannot bear them any ill will. We can only be angry with ourselves for being so unworthy of love that it must desert us. There is mortal anguish in such a state of mind, anguish which destroys the will to live. Next morning, when he saw Olivier, he did not tell him anything. He so detested the idea of reproaching him, reproaching him for having abused his confidence and flung his secrets into the enemy's maw, that he could not find a single word to say to him. But his face said what he could not speak. His expression was icy and hostile. Olivier was struck dumb. He could not understand it. He tried timidly to discover what Christophe had against him. Christophe turned away from him brutally and made no reply. Olivier was hurt in his turn and said no more, and gulped down his distress in silence. They did not see each other again that day. Even if Olivier had made him suffer a thousand times more, Christophe would never have done anything to avenge himself, and he would have done hardly anything to defend himself. Olivier was sacred to him. But it was necessary that the indignation he felt should be expended upon someone, and since that someone could not be Olivier, it was Lucien Levicard. With his usual passionate injustice, he put upon him the responsibility for the ill-doing which he attributed to Olivier and he suffered intolerable pangs of jealousy in the thought that such a man as that could have robbed him of his friend's affection, just as he had previously ousted him from his friendship with Colette Stevens. To bring this exasperation to a head, that very day he happened to see an article by Lucien Le Vicard on a performance of Fidelio. In it he spoke of Beethoven in a bantering way and poked fun at his heroine. Christophe was as alive as anybody to the absurdities of the opera, and even to certain mistakes in the music. He had not always displayed an exaggerated respect for the acknowledged master himself, but he set no store by always agreeing with his own opinions, nor had he any desire to be Frenchily logical. He was one of those men who are quite ready to admit the faults of their friends, but cannot bear anybody else to do so. And besides, it was one thing to criticize a great artist, however bitterly, from a passionate faith in art, and even, one may say, from an uncompromising love for his fame and intolerance of anything mediocre in his work, and another thing, as Lucien Le Vicard did, only to use such criticism to flatter the baseness of the public, and to make the gallery laugh by an exhibition of wit at the expense of a great man. Again, free though Christophe was in his judgments, there had always been a certain sort of music which he had tacitly left alone and shielded, music which was not to be tampered with that music which was higher and better than music, the music of an absolutely pure soul, a great health-giving soul to which a man could turn for consolation, strength, and hope. Beethoven's music was in the category. To see a puppy like Le Vicard insulting Beethoven made him blind with anger. It was no longer a question of art, but a question of honour. 
everything that makes life rare, love, heroism, passionate virtue, the good human longing for self-sacrifice, was at stake. The Godhead itself was imperiled. There was no room for argument. It is as impossible to suffer that to be besmirched as to hear the woman you respect and love insulted. There is but one thing to do, to hate and kill. What is there to say when the insulting blackguard was of all men, the one whom Christophe most despised? And, as luck would have it, that very evening the two men came face to face. To avoid being left alone with Olivier, contrary to his habit, Christophe went to an at-home at the Roussins. He was asked to play. He consented unwillingly. However, after a moment or two he became absorbed in the music he was playing, until glancing up he saw Lucien Lévicard standing in a little group, watching him with an ironical stare. He stopped short in the middle of a bar. He got up and turned away from the piano. There was an awkward silence. Madame Roussin came up to Christophe in her surprise and smiled forcedly and very cautiously, for she was not sure whether the piece was finished or not. She asked him, "'Won't you go on, Monsieur Kraft?' "'I've finished,' he replied curtly. He had hardly said it, then he became conscious of his rudeness, but instead of making him more restrained it only excited him the more. He paid no heed to the amused attention of his auditors, but went and sat in a corner of the room from which he could follow Lucien Lévicard's movements. His neighbour, an old general with a pinkish, sleepy face, light blue eyes and a childish expression, thought it incumbent on him to compliment on the originality of his music. Christophe bowed irritably and growled out a few inarticulate sounds. The general went on talking with effusive politeness and a gentle, meaningless smile, and he wanted Christophe to explain how he could play such a long piece of music from memory. Christophe fidgeted impatiently and thought wildly of knocking the old gentleman off the sofa. He wanted to hear what Lucien Lévicard was saying. He was waiting for an excuse for attacking him. For some moments past he'd been conscious that he was going to make a fool of himself, but no power on earth could have kept him from it. Lucien Lévicard, in his high falsetto voice, was explaining the aims and secret thoughts of great artists to a circle of ladies. During a moment of silence Christophe heard him talking about the friendship of Wagner and King Ludwig, with all sorts of nasty innuendos. Stop, he shouted, bringing his fist down on the table by his side. Everybody turned in amazement. Lucien Lévicard met Christophe's eyes and paled a little and said, Were you speaking to me? You hound. Yes, said Christophe. He sprang to his feet. You soil and sully everything that is great in the world, he went on furiously. There's the door. Get out, you cur, or I'll fling you through the window. He moved towards him. The ladies moved aside, screaming. There was a moment of general confusion. Christophe was surrounded at once. Lucien Lévicard had half risen to his feet, then he resumed his careless attitude in his chair. He called a servant who was passing and gave him a card, and he went on with his remarks as though nothing had happened. But his eyelids were twitching nervously, and his eyes blinked as he looked this way and that to see how people had taken it. Poussin had taken his stand in front of Christophe, and he took him by the lapel of his coat and urged him in the direction of the door. Christophe hung his head in his anger and shame, and his eyes saw nothing but the wide expanse of shirt front, and kept on counting the diamond studs, and he could feel the big man's breath on his cheek. "'Come, come, my dear fellow,' said Roussin. "'What's the matter with you? Where are your manners? Control yourself. Do you know where you are? Come. "'Come, are you mad?' "'I'm damned if I ever set foot in your house again,' said Christophe, breaking free, and he reached the door. The people prudently made way for him. In the cloakroom a servant held out a salver. It contained Lucien Lévicard's card. He took it without understanding what it meant and read it aloud. Then, suddenly, snorting with rage, he fumbled in his pockets. Mixed up with a varied assortment of things, he pulled out three or four crumpled, dirty cards. There, there, he said, flinging them on the salver so violently that one of them fell to the ground. He left the house. End of section 36. Read by Sandra.
Section 37 of Jean Christophe in Paris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jean Christophe in Paris by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canon. The House. Chapter 2. Part 4. Olivier knew nothing about it. Christophe chose as his witnesses the first men of his acquaintance who turned up, the musical critic Théophile Goujard, and a German, Dr. Barth, an honorary lecturer in a Swiss university, whom he had met one night in a café. He had made friends with him, though they had little in common, but they could talk to each other about Germany. After conferring with Lucien Lévicard's witnesses, pistols were chosen. Christophe was absolutely ignorant about the use of arms, and Goujard told him it would not be a bad thing for him to go and have a few lessons. But Christophe refused, and while he was waiting for the day to come, went on with his work. But his mind was distracted. He had a fixed idea, of which he was dimly conscious, while it kept buzzing in his head like a bad dream. It was unpleasant, yes, very unpleasant. What was unpleasant? Oh the duel tomorrow. Just a joke. Nobody's ever hurt. But it was possible. Well, then, afterwards? Afterwards. That was it. Afterwards. A cock of the finger by that swine who hates me may wipe out my life. So be it. Yes, tomorrow, in a day or two, I may be lying in the loathsome soil of Paris. Bah! here or anywhere, what does it matter? Oh, Lord, I'm not going to play the coward. No, but it would be monstrous to waste the mighty world of ideas that I feel springing to life in me for a moment's folly. What rot it is, these modern duels in which they try to equalize the chances of the two opponents. That's a fine sort of equality that sets the same value on the life of a mountebank as on mine. Why don't they let us go for each other with fists and cudgels? There'd be some pleasure in that. But this cold-blooded shooting? And of course he knows how to shoot, and I've never had a pistol in my hand. They're right. I must learn. He'll try to kill me. I'll kill him. He went out. There was a range a few yards away from the house. Christophe asked for a pistol and had it explained how he ought to hold it. With his first shot he almost killed his instructor. He went on with a second and a third, and fared no better. He lost patience and went from bad to worse. A few young men were standing by and watching and laughing. He paid no heed to them. With his German persistency he went on trying, and was so indifferent to their laughter and so determined to succeed, that as always happens his blundering patience roused interest, and one of the spectators gave him advice. In spite of his usual violence, he listened to everything with childlike docility. He managed to control his nerves, which were making his hand tremble. He stiffened himself and knit his brows. The sweat was pouring down his cheeks. He said not a word, but every now and then he would give way to a gust of anger and then go on shooting. He stayed there for a couple of hours. At the end of that time, he hit the bull's-eye. Few things could have been more absorbing than the sight of such a power of will mastering an awkward and rebellious body. It inspired respect. Some of those who had scoffed at the outset had gone, and the others were silenced one by one and had not been able to tear themselves away. They took off their hats to Christophe when he went away. When he reached home, Christophe found his friend Mooch waiting anxiously. Mooch had learned of the quarrel and had come at once. He wanted to know how it had originated. In spite of Christophe's reticence and desire not to attach any blame to Olivier, he guessed the reason. He was very cool-headed and knew both the friends, and had no doubt of Olivier's innocence of the treachery ascribed to him. He looked into the matter and had no difficulty in finding out that the whole trouble arose from the scandal-mongering of Colette and Lucien Lévicard. He rushed back with his evidence to Christophe, thinking that he could in that way prevent the duel— but the result was exactly the opposite of what he had expected. Christophe was only the more rancorous against Levicar when he learned that it was through him that he had come to doubt his friend. To get rid of Mooch, who kept on imploring him not to fight, he promised him everything he asked. 
but he had made up his mind. He was quite happy now. He was going to fight for Olivier, not for himself. A remark, made by one of the seconds as the carriage was going along a road through the woods, suddenly caught Christophe's attention. He tried to find out what they were thinking and saw how little they really cared about him. Professor Bart was wondering when the affair would be over and whether he would be back in time to finish a piece of work he'd begun on the manuscripts in the Bibliothèque Nationale. Of Christophe's three companions, he was the most interested in the result of the encounter as a matter of German national pride. Goujard paid no attention either to Christophe or the other German, but discussed certain scabrous subjects in connection with the coarser branches of physiology with Dr. Julien, a young physician from Toulouse, who had recently come to live next door to Christophe, and occasionally borrowed his spirit lamp, or his umbrella, or his coffee cups, which he invariably returned broken. In return he gave him free consultations, tried medicine on him, and laughed at his simplicity. Under his impassive manner, that would have well become a Castilian hidalgo, there was a perpetual love of teasing. He was highly delighted with the adventure of the duel, which struck him as sheer burlesque, and he was amusing himself with fancying the mess that Christophe would make of it. He thought it a great joke to be driving through the woods at the expense of good old craft. That, clearly, was what was in the minds of the trio. They regarded it as a jolly excursion which cost them nothing. Not one of them attached the least importance to the duel. But on the other hand, they were just as calmly prepared for anything that might come of it. They reached the appointed spot before the others. It was a little inn in the heart of the forest. It was a pleasure resort, more or less unclean, to which Parisians used to resort to cleanse their honour when the dirt on it became too apparent. The hedges were bright with the pure flowers of the eglantine. In the shade of the bronze-leaved oak trees there were rows of little tables. At one of these tables were seated three bicyclists, a painted woman in knickerbockers with black socks, and two men in flannels who were stupefied by the heat, and every now and then gave out growls and grunts, as though they'd forgotten how to speak. The arrival of the carriage produced a little buzz of excitement in the inn. Goujard, who knew the house and the people of old, declared that he would look after everything. Bart dragged Christophe into an arbour and ordered beer. The air was deliciously warm and soft and resounding with the buzzing of bees. Christophe forgot why he had come. Bart emptied the bottle and said, after a short silence, "'I know what I'll do.' He drank and went on. "'I shall have plenty of time. I'll go to Versailles when it's all over.' Goujard was heard haggling with the landlady over the price of the dueling ground. Julien had not been wasting his time. As he passed near the bicyclists, he broke into noisy and ecstatic comment on the woman's bare legs— and there was exchanged a perfect deluge of filthy epithets in which Julien did not come off worst. Bart said in a whisper, The French are a low-minded lot. Brother, I drink to your victory. He clinked his glass against Christophe's. Christophe was dreaming. Scraps of music were floating in his mind, mingled with the harmonious humming of insects. He was very sleepy. The wheels of another carriage crunched over the gravel of the drive. Christophe saw Lucien Lévicard's pale face with its inevitable smile, and his anger leaped up in him. He got up, and Bart followed him. Lévicard, with his neck swathed in a high stock, was dressed with a scrupulous care which was strikingly in contrast with his adversary's untidiness. He was followed by Count Bloch, a sportsman well known for his mistresses, his collection of old pixes, and his ultra-royalist opinions. Léon Mouy, another man of fashion who had reached his position as deputy through literature, and was a writer from political ambition. He was young, bald, clean-shaven, with a lean, bilious face. He had a long nose, round eyes, and a head like a bird's. And Dr. Emmanuel, a fine type of Semite, well-meaning and cold, a member of the Academy of Medicine, a chief surgeon in a hospital famous for a number of scientific books, and a medical scepticism which made him listen with ironic pity to the plaints of his patients without making the least attempt to cure them. The newcomers saluted the other three courteously. 
Christophe barely responded, but was annoyed by the eagerness and the exaggerated politeness with which they treated Levicard's seconds. Julien knew Emmanuel, and Goujard knew Mouy, and they approached them obsequiously, smiling. Mouy greeted them with cold politeness, and Emmanuel jocularly and without ceremony. As for Count Bloch, he stayed by Levicard, and with a rapid glance he took in the condition of the clothes and linen of the three men of the opposing camp and hardly opening his lips passed abrupt humorous comment on them with his friend and both of them stood calm and correct lucien levicard stood at his ease waiting for count blois who had the ordering of the duel to give the signal he regarded the affair as a mere formality he was an excellent shot and was fully aware of his adversary's want of skill he would not be foolish enough to make use of his advantage and hit him always supposing, as was not very probable, that the seconds did not take good care that no harm came of the encounter, for he knew that nothing is so stupid as to let an enemy appear to be a victim, when a much surer and better method is to wipe him out of existence without any fuss being made. But Christophe stood waiting, stripped to his shirt which was open to reveal his thick neck while his sleeves were rolled up to show his strong wrists head down with his eyes glaring at Levicard. He stood taut with murder written implacably on every feature, and Count Blois, who watched him carefully, thought what a good thing it was that civilization had as far as possible suppressed the risks of fighting. After both men had fired, of course without result, the seconds hurried forward and congratulated the adversaries. Honor was satisfied. Not so Christophe. He stayed there, pistol in hand, unable to believe that it was all over. He was quite ready to repeat his performance at the range the evening before, and go on shooting until one or other of them had hit the target. Then he heard Goujard proposing that he should shake hands with his adversary, who advanced chivalrously toward him with his perpetual smile. He was exasperated by the pretense of the whole thing. Angrily he hurled his pistol away, pushed Goujard aside and flung himself upon Lucien Levicard. They were hard put to keep him from going on with the fight with his fists. The seconds intervened while Levicard escaped. Christophe broke away from them, and without listening to their laughing expostulation, he strode along in the direction of the forest, talking loudly and gesticulating wildly. He did not even notice that he left his hat and coat on the dueling ground. He plunged into the woods, he heard his seconds laughing and calling him. Then they tired of it and did not worry about him any more. Very soon he heard the wheels of the carriages rumbling away and away, and knew that they had gone. He was left alone among the silent trees. His fury had subsided. He flung himself down on the ground and sprawled on the grass. Shortly afterwards Moot arrived at the inn. He had been pursuing Christophe since the early morning. He was told that his friend was in the woods and went to look for him. He beat all the thickets and woke all the echoes and was going away in despair when he heard him singing. He found his way by the voice and at last came upon him in a little clearing with his arms and legs in the air, rolling about like a young calf. When Christophe saw him he shouted merrily, called him dear old Moloch, and told him how he had shot his adversary full of holes until he was like a sieve. He made him tuck in his tuppany and then join him in a game of leapfrog, and when he jumped over him he gave him a terrific thump. Mooch was not very good at it, but he enjoyed the game almost as much as Christophe. They returned to the inn arm in arm, and caught the train back to Paris at the nearest station. Olivier knew nothing of what had happened. He was surprised at Christophe's tenderness. He could not understand his sudden change. It was not until the next day when he saw the newspapers that he knew that Christophe had fought a duel. It made him almost ill to think of the danger that Christophe had run. He wanted to know why the duel had been fought. Christophe refused to tell him anything. When he was pressed, he said with a laugh, It was for you. Olivier could not get a word more out of him. Mooch told him all about it. Olivier was horrified, quarrelled with Colette, and begged Christophe to forgive his imprudence. Christophe was incorrigible and quoted for his benefit an old French saying which he adapted so as to infuriate poor Moot, who was present to share in the happiness of the friends. My dear boy, let this teach you to be careful. 
from an idle, chattering girl, from a wheedling, hypocritical Jew, from a painted friend, from a familiar foe, and from flat wine, libera nos, domine. Their friendship was re-established. The danger of losing it which had come so near made it only the more dear. Their small misunderstandings had vanished. The very differences between them made them more attractive to each other. In his own soul, Christophe embraced the souls of the two countries harmoniously united. He felt that his heart was rich and full, and as usual with him, his abundant happiness expressed itself in a flow of music. Olivier marveled at it. Being too critical in mind, he was never far from believing that music which he adored had said its last word. He was haunted by the morbid idea that decadence must inevitably succeed a certain degree of progress, and he trembled lest the lovely art which made him love life should stop short and dry up and disappear into the ground. Christophe would scoff at such pusillanimous ideas. In a spirit of contradiction, he would pretend that nothing had been done before he appeared on the scene, and that everything remained to be done. Olivier would instance French music, which seemed to have reached a point of perfection and ultimate civilization, beyond which there could not possibly be anything. Christophe would shrug his shoulders. French music? There has never been any. And yet you have such fine things to do in the world— you can't really be musicians, or you would have discovered that. Ah, if only I were a Frenchman. And he would set out all the things that a Frenchman might turn into music. You involve yourselves in forms which do not suit you, and you do nothing at all with those which are admirably fitted for your use. You are a people of elegance, polite poetry, beautiful gestures, beautiful walking movements, beautiful attitudes, fashion, clothes— and you never write ballets nowadays, though you ought to be able to create an inimitable art of poetic dancing. You are a people of laughter and comedy, and you never write comic operas, or else you leave it to minor musicians, the confectioners of music. Ah, if I were a Frenchman, I would set Rabelais to music. I would write comic epics. You are a people of storytellers, and you never write novels in music for I don't count the feuilletons of Gustave Charpentier. You make no use of your gift of psychological analysis, your insight into character. Ah, if I were a Frenchman, I would give you portraits in music. Would you like me to sketch the girl sitting in the garden under the lilac? I would write you Stendhal for a string quartet. You are the greatest democracy in Europe, and you have no theatre for the people, no music for the people. Ah, if I were a Frenchman, I would set your revolution to music. The 14th July, the 10th August, Valmy, the Federation, I would express the people in music, not in the false form of Wagnerian declamation. I want symphonies, choruses, dances, not speeches. I'm sick of them. There's no reason why people should always be talking in a music drama. Bother the words. Paint in bold strokes, in vast symphonies with choruses, Immense landscapes in music, Homeric and biblical epics, fire, earth, water, and sky, all bright and shining, the fever which makes hearts burn, the stirring of the instincts and destinies of a race, the triumph of rhythm, the emperor of the world, who enslaves thousands of men and hurls armies down to death. Music everywhere, music in everything. If you were musicians, you would have music for every one of your public holidays, for your official ceremonies, for the trades unions, for the student associations, for your family festivals. But above all, above all, if you were musicians, you would make pure music, music which has no definite meaning, music which has no definite use, save only to give warmth and air and life. Make sunlight for yourselves. Satpata. What is that in Latin? There has been rain enough. Your music gives me a cold. One can't see in it. Light your lanterns. You complain of the Italian porcherie who invade your theatres and conquer the public and turn you out of your own house. It's your own fault. The public are sick of your crepuscular art, your harmonized neurasthenia, your contrapuntal pedantry. The public goes where it can find life however coarse and gross. Why do you run away from life? 
Your Debussy is a bad man. However great he may be as an artist, he aids and abets you in your torpor. You want roughly waking up. What about Strauss? No better. Strauss would finish you off. You need the digestion of my fellow countrymen to be able to bear such immoderate drinking, and even they cannot bear it. Strauss's Salome, a masterpiece. I should not like to have written it. I think of my old grandfather and Uncle Gottfried, and with what respect and loving tenderness they used to talk to me about the lovely art of sound. But to have the handling of such divine powers and to turn them to such uses? A flaming, consuming meteor, an Isolde, who was a Jewish prostitute, bestial, and mournful lust. The frenzy of murder, pillage, incest, and untrammeled instincts which is stirring in the depths of German decadence, and on the other hand, the spasm of a voluptuous and melancholy suicide, the death rattle which sounds through your French decadence. On the one hand, the beast, on the other, the prey. Where is man? Your Debussy is the genius of good taste. Strauss is the genius of bad taste. Debussy is rather insipid, but Strauss is very unpleasant. One is a silvery thread of stagnant water losing itself in the reeds and giving off an unhealthy aroma. The other is a mighty muddy flood. Ugh! The musty base Italianism and neo Meyerbeerism, the filthy masses of sentiment which are borne on by the torrent. An odious masterpiece, Salome, the daughter of Isolde, and whose mother will Salome be in her turn? Yes, said Olivier, I wish we could jump fifty years. This headlong gallop towards the precipice must end one way or another. Either the horse must stop or fall. Then we shall breathe again. Thank heaven the earth will not cease to flower, nor the sky to give light, with or without music. What have we to do with an art so inhuman? The West is burning away. Soon, very soon, I see other stars arising in the furthest depths of the East. Bother the East, said Christophe. The West has not said its last word yet. Do you think I'm going to abdicate? I have enough to say to keep you going for centuries. Hurrah for life! Hurrah for joy! Hurrah for the courage which drives us on to struggle with our destiny! Hurrah for love! which maketh the heart big. Hurrah for friendship, which rekindles our faith. Friendship, a sweeter thing than love. Hurrah for the day. Hurrah for the night. Glory be to the sun. Laus Deo, the god of joy, the god of dreams and actions, the god who created music. Hosanna! With that he sat down at his desk and wrote down everything that was in his head, without another thought for what he had been saying. At that time, Christophe was in a condition in which all the elements of his life were perfectly balanced. He did not bother his head with aesthetic discussions as to the value of this or that musical form, nor with reasoned attempts to create a new form. He did not even have to cast about for subjects for translation into music. One thing was as good as another. A flood of music welled forth without Christophe knowing exactly what feeling he was expressing. He was happy. That was all. Happy in expanding, happy in having expanded, happy in feeling within himself the pulse of universal life. His fullness of joy was communicated to those about him. The house with its closed garden was too small for him. He had the view out over the garden of the neighboring convent with the solitude of its great avenues and century old trees but it was too good to last. In front of Christophe's windows they were building a six-story house, which shut out the view and completely hemmed him in. In addition, he had the pleasure of hearing the creaking of pulleys, the chipping of stones, the hammering of nails all day long from morning to night. Among the workmen he found his old friend, the slater, whose acquaintance he had made on the roof. They made signs to each other, and once, when he met him in the street, he took the man to a wine-shop, and they drank together— much to the surprise of Olivier, who was a little scandalized. He found the man's drollery and unfailing good humor very entertaining, but did not curse him any the less, with his troop of workmen and stupid idiots who were raising a barricade in front of the house and robbing him of air and light. Olivier did not complain much. He could quite easily adapt himself to a limited horizon. He was like the stove of Descartes from which the suppressed ideas darted upward to the free sky— but Christophe needed more air. 
Shut up in that confined space, he avenged himself by expanding into the lives of those about him. He drank in their inmost life and turned it into music. Olivier used to tell him that he looked like a lover. If I were in love, Christophe would reply, I should see nothing, love nothing, be interested in nothing outside my love. What's the matter with you, then? I'm very well. I'm hungry. Lucky Christophe, Olivier would sigh. I wish you could hand a little of your appetite over to us. Health, like sickness, is contagious. The first to feel the benefit of Christophe's vitality was naturally Olivier. Vitality was what he most lacked. He retired from the world because its vulgarity revolted him. Brilliantly clever though he was, and in spite of his exceptional artistic gifts, he was too delicate to be a great artist. Great artists do not feel disgust. The first law for every healthy being is to live, and that law is even more imperative for a man of genius. For such a man lives more. Olivier fled from life. He drifted along in a world of poetic fictions that had no body, no flesh and blood, no relation to reality. He was one of those literary men who, in quest of beauty, have to go outside time, into the days that are no more, or the days that have never been, as though the wine of life were not as intoxicating, and its vintages as rich nowadays as ever they were. But men who are weary in soul recoil from direct contact with life. They can only bear to see it through the veil of visions spun by the backward movement of time, and hear it in the echo which sends back and distorts the dead words of those who were once alive. Christophe's friendship gradually dragged Olivier out of his limbo of art. The sun's rays pierced through to the innermost recesses of his soul in which he was languishing. Elsberger, the engineer, succumbed to Christophe's contagious optimism. It was not shown in any change in his habits. They were too inveterate, and it was too much to expect him to become enterprising enough to leave France and go and seek his fortune elsewhere. But he was shaken out of his apathy. He recovered his taste for research and reading, and the scientific work which he had long neglected. He would have been much astonished had he been told that Christophe had something to do with his new interest in his work, and certainly no one would have been more surprised than Christophe. But of all the inhabitants of the house, Christophe was the soonest intimate with the little couple on the second floor. More than once as he passed their door, he had stopped to listen to the sound of the piano which Madame Arnaud used to play quite well when she was alone. Then he gave them tickets for his concert, for which they thanked him effusively, and after that he used to go and sit with them occasionally in the evening. He'd never heard Madame Arnaud playing again. She was too shy to play in company, and even when she was alone, now that she knew she could be heard on the stairs, she kept the soft pedal down. But Christophe used to play to them, and they would talk about it for hours together. The Arnauds used to speak of music with such eagerness and freshness of feeling that he was enchanted with them. He had not thought it possible for French people to care so much for music. That, Olivia would say, is because you have only come across musicians. I'm perfectly aware, Christophe would reply, that professed musicians are the very people who care least for music. But you can't make me believe that there are many people like you in France. A few thousands, at any rate. I suppose it's an epidemic, the latest fashion. It's not a matter of fashion, said Arnaud. He who does not rejoice to hear a sweet accord of instruments or the sweetness of the natural voice and is not moved by it, and does not tremble from head to foot with its sweet ravishment, and is not taken completely out of himself, does thereby show himself to have a twisted, vicious, and depraved soul, and of such an one we should beware as of a man ill-born. I know that, said Christophe, it's my friend Shakespeare. No, said Arnaud gently. It's a Frenchman who lived before him, Ronsard. That will show you that if it is the fashion in France to care for music, it is no new thing. But what astonished Christophe was not so much that people in France should care for music, as that almost without exception they cared for the same music as the people in Germany. In the world of Parisian snobs and artists in which he had moved at first, it had been the mode to treat the German masters as distinguished foreigners, by all means to be admired, but to be kept at a distance. They were always ready to poke fun at the dullness of a Gluck and the barbarity of a Wagner. Against them they set up the subtlety of the French composers, 
and in the end christophe had begun to wonder whether a frenchman could have the least understanding of german music to judge by the way it was rendered in france only a short time before he'd come away perfectly scandalized from a performance of an opera of gluck's the ingenious parisians had taken it into their head to deck the old fellow up and cover him with ribbons and pad out his rhythms and bedizen his music with impressionistic settings and charming little dancing girls forward and wanton poor gluck there was nothing left of his eloquent and sublime feeling his moral purity his naked sorrow was it that the french could not understand these things and now christophe could see how deeply and tenderly his new friends loved the very inmost quality of the germanic spirit and the old german lieder and the german classics and he asked them if it was not the fact that the great germans were as foreigners to them and that a frenchman could only really love the artists of his own nationality not at all they protested it's only the critics who take upon themselves to speak for us they always follow the fashion and they want us to follow it too but we don't worry about them any more than they worry about us they're funny little people trying to teach us what is and is not french us who are french of the old stock of france they come and tell us that our france is in rameau or racine and nowhere else as though we did not know and thousands like us in the provinces and in paris how often beethoven mozart and gluck have sat with us by the fireside and watched with us by the bedside of those we love and shared our troubles and revived our hopes and been one of ourselves if we dared say exactly what we thought it's much more likely that the french artists who are set up on a pedestal by our parisian critics are strangers among us the truth is said olivier that if there are frontiers in art they are not so much barriers between races as barriers between classes i am not so sure that there is a french art or a german art but there is certainly one art for the rich and another for the poor gluck was a great man of the middle classes he belongs to our class a certain french artist whose name i won't mention is not of our class though he was of the middle class by birth he's ashamed of us and denies us and we deny him what olivier said was true the better christophe got to know the french the more he was struck by the resemblance between the honest men of france and the honest men of germany the annos reminded him of dear old schultz with his pure disinterested love of art his forgetfulness of self his devotion to beauty and he loved them in memory of schultz end of section thirty seven read by sandra near montreal twenty twenty two